Round four of the European Le Mans series brings us to a fantastic part of the world, northeastern Spain to Catalonia, to this long established Grand Prix circuit that we visited actually at the start of last year when it was a lot, lot cooler. Late August in Catalonia is going to prove pretty testing for the drivers, the teams, and indeed the equipment involved, not least the tyres. My name's Johnny Palmer, uh, looking after proceedings in terms of a play-by-play uh, -play commentary point commentary point view but offering some analysis along the way by all means it's a uh, graham goodwin of dailysportscar.com we are managing to keep cool in an air-conditioned commentary box but it is sweltering outside and set to remain so for the full four hours graham it most certainly is it's been uh, sweltering for the whole week 30 degrees plus uh, everywhere and the well 38 cars on the grid plus one car on pit lane for this four hour encounter we'll talk about that uh, missing car from the grid a little bit later but uh, as you can see there, uh, they're funning themselves just to keep cool. Uh, Shield de Kane there on the left, and Kenji Jenglas from DKR on the right. That is our special guest. We'll be talking about uh, Nani Roma a little later when he waves the green flag, but a Dakar racing legend winner on both two and four wheels. It's a packed grid, great turnout as well for the... There you go, <laughs> James <laughs> Dyson. Uh, great turnout as well for the autograph session. And as we just get deeper and deeper into this post lockdown era, Johnny, it does seem that people are coming out in bigger and bigger numbers for motorsport. And why wouldn't you, by the way, at the European Le Mans series? Because it's free to get in. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so yeah, you get to the gate and they basically said, yep, yeah, this way to the grandstand and yes. come and witness a four hour race for absolutely nothing. Absolutely. And uh, take note of that. Because, of course, there are still races to come this season at Spa, Frankenstein. Uh, by the way, that means free general access to the whole of the spectator areas. It means free access to the paddock. It means a race morning autograph session with all of the drivers, uh, all for the princely sum of absolutely nothing whatsoever. There's a great view from our drone hovering above the circuit to Barcelona, Catalonia, then 4.6 kilometres of it, or 2.9 miles if you prefer that measurement. Thankfully, the start finish straight, or at least some of it, is in the shade right now, provided by that massive grandstand immediately opposite the garages and the pit lane. Dorian Pan zipping up the race suit on the back of the Iron Dames entry, the Iron Lynx machine as it is in this championship. Sarah Bovi actually to start that car, but Dorian Pan brought in um, and that is the plan actually we think to keep it till the end of the season because uh, Rahel Fry with racing in other disciplines going to concentrate on those outside of the European Le Mans series and fantastic to have the uh, the 18 year old in that car Graham. Absolutely it's another part of this uh, fabulous staircase of talent that the Iron Dames are providing. Rahel Fry steps aside, Dorian Pan, who is dominating in Ferrari Challenge this year, as indeed Michel Gatting did last year, um, will be now part of the LMS uh, setup, I believe, for the remainder of the year. There's our pole setter from GTE yesterday, as we're about to get the Spanish national anthem in a very different way, I think, uh, here. That's, uh, that's going to be good to see. The number 69 car looking spectacular, as always. They'll, they'll take that fall bit off. That gets in the way when you start to do about two it's slightly yeah. easy to know where you're going, doesn't yes. it, generally, without the uh, reflective sheet that keeps the cockpit nice and cool. So the flag of Spain, the flag of Catalonia, which is not the slippery surface flag, although no. we'll see a few of those through the course of the race, potentially. Let's pause then for the national anthem of Spain. Well, that certainly gets the juices flowing, doesn't it? Uh, the string quartet, and there's a bit more to follow, in fact.
to finish the national anthem of Catalonia itself. That is a string quintet, in fact, rather than a quartet. I do struggle to count to five at the best of times, <laughs> uh, but that was a fabulous way to kickstart our event here at uh, Circuit to Barcelona, Catalonia for uh, another visit of the European Le Mans series much later on in the season. Actually feels like now we're late August, we should be about uh, five races into the championship. We're actually only at half distance right now, so therefore, you know, 75 race points still on oh, yeah. offer. Not a lot can be decided this weekend, but certainly the direction of the championships uh, will be you know, guided towards when we've got Spa and Portimao still to come next month and then in October. Yeah, what we're going to be getting to by the end of this race is starting to count out teams from the title of the point, yeah. Uh, rather than, but there's an awful lot of shape that can still be put around this. This is Dekar Engineering team. They're fifth in LMP3 and the only Duquesne on the grid in LMP3. Missing one very regular car indeed for this race. The number seven Nielsen racing car will not be on on the starting grid, that's because uh, unavailability of a very long-time member of this LMS family. Tony Wells unable to travel uh, this weekend. Tony, I hope you're watching, and we look forward to seeing you back at Spa. I believe, one of my colleagues in the press room told me, first race in the LMS that Tony has missed since 2016. Wow. That that's doesn't mean just after quarter past eight, by the way. Indeed, that's, no, that's it's year. more like six years. Uh, let's focus on what happened in LMP3 yesterday. A reminder, if you weren't with us for qualifying yesterday afternoon, three doses of it, 10 minutes each, and we've touched upon the GTEs. It's another poll for the 69 Oman Racing with TF Sport, Aston Martin. The time was done by Ahmed al Harti. He managed a 145.692, which was pretty much three-tenths of a second clear of everybody else, although Sarah Bovey's car had been fitted with new tyres late on in the session as she pushed hard, but actually bailed out of the lap. LMP3, already seen then the cool racing car number 27 that will start from fourth position, and that will have in it Jean-Ludovic Foubert to start. Josh Cagill will begin the race in the number two United Autosports car, and every credit to Bailey Voisan, who left it oh, yeah. very, very late, didn't he, to pop up there in third position on the grid, Graham? Yeah, as always, those uh, quick-fire uh, qualified sessions really did uh, provide the entertainment. Uh, GTE, uh, Ahmed al Harty quick again in uh, LMP3. Milty Jakobsen basically making it a race for who's going to be second alongside him on the grid. Uh, and then in LMP2, we're going to get to that pretty soon as we see the number two, so number 13 car, second in uh, on the grid for into Europe all competition, thanks to the efforts of Nico Pino, uh, the uh, driver that got closest to a storming Melty Jakobsen. But uh, LMP2 provided the drama right until the very last moments of the session. Still, the excitement is building on the grid, and, uh, well, very shortly, the information, the uh, guidance will be offered to those guests to make their way towards the grandstand. Let's uh, focus on Malta Jakobsen for a second. There's only ever been one driver taking pole position all season in LMP3, and it is the young Danish driver, just 18 years old. Yeah, it is, though, going to be uh, Elamess Santa, Moksmith, that uh, starts the race. And be looking to keep this neat and tidy so they can convert that pace. It'd be good to see Melty Jakobsen get a crack at this one. Sonny's aboard as Mo Smith climbs aboard the number 17 car. And the uh, the mood from the drumming band really does build up. They've been they've been smacking those snare drums for a best part of an hour now because they were involved as well during the autograph session. So this was a little bit earlier on today with fans welcomed uh, back into the pit lane to seek out their favourite drivers. Michael Fassbender there in the foreground. I'm sure the queue towards his table was virtually the length of the pit lane. Usually because there's a massive fan following from Richard Leitz, by the way. Cool. That's, uh, that, that's the way I've seen it all the way through. But Michael in good form and a good chat with him about his adventures and misadventures at Monza, taking it, um, basically taking the blame for that. I, and I thought he was being a little hard on himself. There's Jimmy Bruni, uh, but uh, no, he's... Uh, analysed his own part in that incident that took out the number 93 car uh, from Monza and has decided he could have, should have done better. I'll bow to his better experience. 
So many people through the years have run wide coming out of the Ascari chicane out onto the kerbs and then it's a question of whether you go right or left. Unfortunately, he went left and went across the bows of a couple of other cars. Prema Racing lead the championship. Louis Delatraz, Lorenzo Colombo and Ferdinand Habsburg on 60 points. They do only have this 13-point lead, though, because they were given a 10-second penalty in Monza, which put them down to fifth position. You only get 10 points for fifth. It could have been a lot, lot better because they finished higher up than that on the road but a post-race penalty means that they, their championship lead has been clipped a little bit. Philippe Cimedomo will yep. be starting the 31 TDS Racing by Vaillant car. Yeah, but it's nice Besh not quite managing to convert another pole position. He's done it twice already this season, but 31 car will start down amongst the pack. Uh, there will be it's two rows behind a um, empty space as we look at the Ferry Chrome number 88 car. This is the AF Corsa machine, of course, and that car will be started by Francois Pirodo, the boss. Five minutes to the start of the formation lap. Off goes the Nissan GTR safety car. The start of this race, by the way, you'll be used to it generally being on the hour or less frequently, the half hour. We've actually gone for 11.45 today, so it's an 11.45 start, 3.45 finish, and therefore, uh, obviously, timetable schedules have had to be reworked a little bit because of that. And uh, whether it was because of that or another reason, uh, you were leading there, Graham, towards the fact that one of the cars didn't make it out of the pits before oh, the pit lane closed. The good error by uh, the Algopro Racing team, the number 19 car with Ben Fiscal, he shares with Sophia Flersch. Ben Fiscal, due to start the race, will be starting from pit lane and a lap down, did not make it out uh, in time before the pit lane closed. And I gather team management are absolutely livid. I'm sure drivers aren't that be best thrilled either. Third on the grid in LMP3, it'd be Sally Jolic to start the Racing Team Turkey car. It was qualified by, by Jack Aitken. Looks as if Jack might grab pole um, after the Edex Sports outfit with Paul Lipschatz and uh, were in provisional pole position. Bailed out that Johnny in the final um, uh, asking but uh, whether or not they were just looking after tires we might see very late in this race but, uh it exports and racing team turkey it is on row two for the lmp2 class and that means that racing team turkey on the pole sitting car in the pro and class you'll see there johnny our front row yeah cool racing who uh, their car will be started by nicholas cruton the young talent from germany as we get another update Three from minutes. the race Three director to the start of the formation lap Fayez, Ramsey Fayez, who will be looking after proceedings along with his team for the four hours of Barcelona. Um, I will mention, actually, the Pro-Am Championship leaders are also racing Team Turkey, so they start as the best of those six cars in the sub-LMP2 category, and they have a lead of... Uh, 16 points, in fact, because there's been a couple of class victories and also a second place last time out at Monza. But leaving it so late, I think it, this car was virtually the last car to be <laughs> circulating in qualifying yesterday. Nico Jama, almost the most surprised of all, but the road opened up to him and he had the pace to snatch pole at the death of the session. Great stuff. Uh, saw Nico before the qualifying session uh, just relaxing in a paddling pool with... Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the other pro driver in this car, Job van Utrecht. It's going to be Julian Canal to start the car, but 65 in the hands of Panis Racing. And another team, Johnny, together with Edex Sport, we mentioned a little earlier, that just seem to be hitting a rich vein of form. The gaps, though, at the front are phenomenal. Let's run through the grid, actually, because Julian Canal will start the Panis Racing car. Their time, 134.8. 97 thousandths of a second back is the cool racing car. The second row will be Sally Jolic to start the Pro-Am pole sitter for Racing Team Turkey and then Edex Sports uh, car that won last time out. Third row, Francois Perodo for AF Corsa alongside Philippe Cimidomo. Uh, they have been pole sitters on two previous occasions, TDS Racing by Vaillant. Then it's the Prima Racing car championship leader alongside into Europol competition. One of these cars won't be there in 10th position, the Bent Viscal Algarve Pro car, that's starting a lap down from the pit lane, but alongside it, 22 United Autosports. Then in behind, it is Algarve Pro Racing and Mulner Motorsport uh, alongside the BHK offering. Rob Hodes in the team Virage 51 alongside Memo Rojas for Duquesne team. Cool Racing for pole position in One LMP3, started One by Mo Smith alongside CR Cruz, and it's Josh Cagill and Jean-Ludovic Fubert 
to come next for Cool Racing. Tom Van Rompuy for DKR, the only Duquesne on the grid, alongside Jim Maguire for United. 360 Racing and RLR come next. A little further down, Freddie Hunt making his ELMS debut. Oman Racing with TF Sport take another pole position. Ahmed Al Harty to start the Aston Martin car alongside the Iron Lynx Ferrari. Christian Reed, who leads the championship with the 77 Porsche, will start from third position in the category alongside Pierre Eret. There's the Giacomo Petrobelli for JMW the Motorsport. The They've had a driver tweak in that they welcome Miguel Molina, the man from Barcelona, into their team. And at the back of the field, the sister Oman Racing with TF Sport Aston Martin car started by John Hartzorn. This this is our guest for the weekend, Nani Roma. For uh, he's a two-time Dakar Rally winner, and he will be waving the green flag. Uh, he will indeed. Five, Local boy made four, good, as they say. Three, two, one. Start the formation lap. Nani Roma, the winner on two wheels for KTM the Dakar Rally in 2004. And four wheels as part of the mini. Uh, Rally raid set up in 2014, finished second again, by the way, for Mini in 2019, fifth in 2021, an absolute off-road racing legend uh, and a very local boy here. Away they go, Johnny. Yeah, Nani took fifth place in the car category at the Dakar Rally last year. I wonder whether he fancies doing some stuff on hard standing like this in the future. Close gaps, close I, notice, gaps, uh, I notice he's north of a significant age, so that would uh, knock him down a rating as well. That could be fun. Could Might be it? welcomed into a team in LMP3, you never know. Here's the 13 car. We've got one or two onboard machines. CR Cruz is your chauffeur down towards the first corner. So that is the view from second position on the grid behind Mo Smith and the cool racing car that Malta Jakobsen will drive a little later on. Now peering out of the back of Michael Fassbender's Porsche, the emerald green uh, number 93 Proton Competition offering and Michael starting from sixth position in LMGTE, Le Mans G, uh, Grand Touring Endurance as it stands for. And there is the sorry sight, I'm afraid to say, of Bent Viscal installed in the number 19 Algarve Pro Racing car. Only two drivers allocated to that. That was always the plan, by the way. And uh, sharing with Sophia Flersch, who's been grabbing a lot of attention this weekend. It's a real shame that with film crews on site, looking at her, her almost her every move this weekend in Barcelona, that the car has not been released from the pit lane in time. You might be asking, why on earth is it like a double penalty in that they've got to start from the pit lane and a lap down? Well, that is done on safety grounds because there's every chance on the first lap of an endurance race, when you've got 38 cars, as it will be, pounding down towards turn one, there's always the chance of a car getting turned around, you know, sitting in the middle of the track, and then you're potentially launching a car from the pit lane straight to the scene of an accident. So they give it a lap before the officials will then release the number 19 car into the race. The problem is, modern day endurance racing like this, even in a four hour race, very tricky to catch a full lap back again. Quite right too. It's going to be push, 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 isn't it? But uh, to be blunt, from a spectator's point of view, always fun to watch them try. Oh yeah. And you as never we know. Saw... Where, you know, we've had a few safety cars yep. this year, and if they're in the maybe the second hour. Uh, there's the potential to actually buy a lap back again. This is one of the shorter tracks we go to at 4.6 kilometres. Absolutely right. And after the dramas we saw in Monza, who knows what might happen. If you Parnis there in the number 65 garage and he's been out racing in fact this morning as part of the support package here we don't have this weekend the Leisure Insurance Series or the Michelin Le Mans Cup because their extra round is of course at Le Mans this is the one they miss uh, but he was out in one of the Mitjets uh, cars this morning so the European Le Mans Series music is pumping out around this fabulous venue Helder Grand Prix did this circuit back in May uh, but uh, you're guaranteed a bit more overtaking in this area of motorsport, without doubt. Three different classes, LMP2, LMP3 and GTE. The cars with the amber number backings, the GTs at the rear. Purple for LMP3 in the midfield. And the blue numbered cars 
are the LMP2s just trying to work their way into the correct formation. Julian Canal in a moment or two will dictate the pace as he comes out of the final corner and over the start finish line. There is a long, long straight here and you have to be good clearly on the straights, but also have a car that's going to be good through the technical bits, including that chicane in the final sector. So always tricky with setup. But after almost a two month break at the end of August, we are going racing for the European Le Mans series live from Barcelona. To the inside line goes the racing team Turkey car of Sally Jolic for the race lead. Potentially no, but he will slot into second position because that was great defence from Julian Canal. Jolic to second. Nicholas Cruton had little choice but to turn in behind the cherry red prototype for third position for Cool Racing. And it is Paul Lafarge just about hanging on to fourth place for Edex Sport. But around his outside is trying to go Ferdi Habsburg in the championship leading car for Prima Racing. We we have a yellow flag at turn three. Does that suggest some strife? Maybe. Yes, oh, big time James. for the Iron Links card started by Sarah Bovey. And that looks to be quite a bit of contact, unfortunately, for the 83 car. Not immediately, obviously, obvious who she's caught. Although I noticed Jim McGuire and Jean Ludovic Fubert have both slipped behind all of the other GT cars. So they're normally an LMP3. And we're going to go car. safety car because not least Sarah Bovey's stranded machine. Now, there she is in the pink Ferrari to the inside line of turn two. Did she clash with some prototypes? Oh, the prototype moved across on her. The blue, dark blue prototype moved across on her, and she's in the wall, and it's big, big damage to the number three car as well. That's a separate incident. I think it is an unrelated incident, as you say, but I, I had concerns about Jean-Ludovic Foubert and Jim Maguire because they didn't come through the the first sector yeah. so it still happened in that first part of the lap so and safety they car tripped over one another the, so, so the 27 is out the three is out 83 that was a hard hit with the wall it was one of the your international cars uh, involved in that side by side with sarah bovey and now was it jerome de Savalier in the 11 car or was it freddie hunt in the 10 tricky to tell from this distance. That is, that I'm afraid that is done. Oh, massively big, so. Big, big uh, damage to I the mean, rear as well. You look at the front, first of all, and then you realise, hang on a minute, the drive shaft's popped out of the rear, yeah, the door mirror's gone as well, but the initial impact I think she would have got away with, the problem is it spat her out to the left and then into either tyre wall or concrete to drivers left. An absolute killer of a getaway for Sally Jolic. He was using the pit lane exit, which you are allowed to do as long as you keep two Goodyear tyres the correct side of the white line, almost to the race lead there into turn one. But Julian Canal stood his ground. There was also some Chimadomo good jostling as position. Yeah. Yeah. Chimadomo being overtaken by the car immediately behind him on the grid. And if we stick with this replay, we may well see, no, not quite, what happened to the Ferrari, but uh, only one upright on the rear wing still in existence as well. Doctor's car immediately with Sarah Bovey to make sure that she is OK. That's the key thing, that our drivers are safe and well. But quite what happened to Jean Ludovic Foubert or Jim Maguire, they should have been well ahead of the incident that involved Sarah, in fact. So I think that was a bit further around. And if we stay on board, not quite, with Michael Fassbender, we can work out exactly where those two two LMP3 cars have come to rest. So the Ferrari is going to have to be recovered. That will not be pushed, cannot be pushed, no, because be, there are at least two wheels, very uh, oblique angles. I can't see those LMP3 cars on the inside of three, so it might be actually around at turn four that they have come to a halt. Everybody else circling around the safety car, we're behind the safety car. We won't have to worry about a wave by this early on in the race because everyone's still on the lead lap. Would add one just brief detail there. There are the two stricken LMP3 cars, and they are very clearly done. Is that the number 19 car has joined the race behind the safety car crew, uh, 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 train? Yeah. Yeah, which was uh, the plan all along. What was I saying about first corner incidents? And that's the go. reason why you release a car a lap down. Watch this again, Johnny. It was an amazingly good start from Sally Jolic and a really aggressive move in the best possible way. Almost, almost made his way through to the lead, didn't he? He was ahead by a matter of inches, but Julian Canal was far more confident on the brakes. He had a slightly uh, shallower Let's angle to attack turn back, one. As we get a chance to see which of the, the, the uh, Euro International cars it was involved in this, it's the 
less well placed of the two. I think that's Freddie Hunt, you know. That's the impact. One, two impacts with the wall. Yeah. That will have hurt. So that here it is Oof. from the other angle, and you can see the rate uh, that uh, the rate at which Sarah Bovey left the track and slammed the tyre wall there. It is tyre wall, so at least yeah. that will have given a little bit. And the JMW Ferrari, by the way, lucky to stay out of trouble there. It was pretty close call as the Iron Dames car was fired across. Uh, safety, uh, the pit lane is closed at this point, by the way. It is closed for the first three laps of any safety car period. We're only five minutes into the race. If this continues for a little while, though, and bear in mind there are two LMP3 cars that require recovery as well, we might see one or two cars just coming in for a quick burst of fuel. It's got to be said, it's, it's got to the stage where it's remarkably rare to have this level of attrition this early. Uh, we don't have it very often. But three cars in what uh, look like two completely different incidents. Yeah. And uh, a real shame for, well, I mean, United are having to deal with what happened to them at Monza when Jim was really going well. They knew they had a quick race car, but uh, unfortunately he had his moment coming out of Ascari in Italy, you may remember. And sadly, that number three car is now done. Andrew Bentley was pretty confident that they'd, they'd go well today yeah, as well. So that's a, he's a big shape. And the 27 car, just, early on in the race at Monza, they were in stride because yeah. they were off the road down towards the first chicane. They've, that was Imola, beg your pardon. And now, again, they've sadly had a wretched cool year. racing. They've yeah. had a wretched year, the 27. But, it was, it's a driver crew that we expected great things of. And they've just had absolutely no luck whatsoever. But there are three quick cars that we are now denied uh, to see how I'm well they will go so. in the race. I'm afraid so. So we're going to have to wait, I'm afraid, for another race to see Darian Pan in the European Le Mans series, for starters. I think that's the exit of turn three. It's not four, which is where they're coming around now. So it, three could almost be counted. It's such a long right hand yeah. that it could almost be counted as I two corners. Right. So if you call that where um, Sarah went off, 3A, coming out of two and into three, but the exit of three, so 3B, is where those P2, uh, P3s have ended up on the inside of the corner, but no idea exactly what has happened there. Whether it was a chain reaction uh, and in that sort of area where we think Freddie Hunt was making his move, difficult to say at this stage. Just to, uh, just to run down a few of the other positions as we watch the recovery underway of those two cars, the incident involving Jim McGuire and Fubert uh, is under, investi under investigation. We have and it seen, is T3. We have seen lead changes in two classes uh, during that uh, first bit of action because Christian Reed made his way through and passed Ahmed Al Hati to lead GTE. And in the uh, LMP3 class, it's uh, Charles Cruz that leads now in the 13 car. Uh, he's first. Josh Cagle has gone through into second. Both of them going by Mo Smith in the pole setting number 17 current racing car in the early stages there too. Uh, championship wise in LMP3, again, a couple of teams that were doing very well, including the number three car. They came to this round third in the championship on 31 points. The 27 car has always promised much on a Saturday in single lap speed, but struggled to deliver it on Sunday. They did have a good result at Imola with a second place finish, despite that spin on the opening lap in Emilia Romagna, but it was a non-finish at Lucastele for car 27 and a sixth place finish at the last race at Monza. So, as I say, a, a great driving lineup. It's just about surviving the opening exchanges, really. They're getting, getting through that first half an hour, which the 27 car has often struggled with this year. Yeah. We, when we do, we will get an opportunity to see that start again. Be interested to see why we had such a dramatic overlap between the lead GTE cars and the trailing pack of uh, LMP3 cars, because that was not the way the grid was organised, was it? There, there was a pretty clean split between the classes. There is Sarah Bovey being pillioned back to the pits to explain, I'm sure, what her point of view was of that incident, as the number three car is craned to a place of safety, so it'll be a little wee while yet before we can get the race back to green. It's, uh, if indeed it was Freddie Hunt, let's watch this. Watch in the middle of the package, Johnny, if we get the yeah. opportunity to do Looking that. Looking for car 10, basically. We I think, think so. it is car 10. So what was going on at the back of the P3 pack? So looking here as they come in. 
So down towards the first corner and looking out for the pink uh, Sarah Bovey car. And as one of the P3s, we think driven by Freddie Hunt, moved from behind another one, uh, not aware that Sarah was overlapping at the time. And that is what's pitched, uh, what has pitched Sarah into the wall on the left-hand side. I was watching the middle to the rear of the pack there. There was a, a dark-coloured LMP3 car that didn't get away well at all and lost a number of places, was in the middle of the track. And I suspect that's what may have caused the Constantina effect and the problem. So uh, I, I'm not going to try to identify that. We just got no. that kind of overhead shot. But there was definitely an LMP3 car that seemed to lose, to my uh, vision there, five, six places in the run down to turn one, with cars going either side and other cars caught up behind. I'm not attributing blame. No. What I'm saying is that was definitely a factor in getting the GTE cars and the LMP3 cars battling away for the same piece of racetrack. The plastic bollards that have been ripped out of their stanchions are now being refixed. So I think we're not very far away from restarting this race. Still under safety car and the pit lane if not open already, will be very, very shortly if there are any takers. The problem is if we're going to go green within the next 30 seconds, it's certainly not, make, not worth making a stop because you stand to lose anything you might have benefited if it was a pit stop held entirely in safety car conditions. Um, to your point about the grid split, there is definitely a split as far as LMP2s are concerned. Regardless of where an LMP2 might qualify in the race, they're automatically put to the front. Yeah. LMP3s to GTEs, if a GT car is quicker on a Saturday, it's put in front. But actually, we didn't have that scenario yesterday. All no. the P3s were quicker than the GT. So, yes, it was the, the field of 11 GTEs behind the LMP3s on the grid. But they immediately started to overlap just as soon as we went through turns one and two. You know, Sarah Bovey, for example, was getting stuck in, as is her right from yeah, the front row of GT. Too. Yeah. I think, uh, I'm going to call it, and I apologise if I've called this wrong, simply for the position of the cars on track now compared to where they were on the starting grid, that I think the car that was struggling uh, to get away at the start of that race may well have been the number 15 car with uh, Hurst Felbermeyer Jr. The 15 car did lose places uh, before we went under caution. That caution happened very quickly. Uh, it's it's uh, dropped four or five places from its starting grid position. As I say, there was a dark-coloured LMP3 car. It's not that dark, it's the blue-coloured car. Yeah, Felbermeyer blue, so it's slightly lighter, for instance, than the Euro International car that was being driven by Freddie Hunt. We'll try and identify exactly who was who and uh, who was going maybe a little bit slowly into Turn 1 as we go down to the pits to Hayley Edmonds to find out who she's found. So I'm down here in Cool Racing, joined by Nicola Molini, driver of car number 27 for Cool Racing. Um, we're just, everyone's trying to work it out because I've been to United, I've come here, and no one really seems to know, not even uh, Jean-Ludovic uh, Foubert, he doesn't actually know what happened, where that contact was. We don't really know yet, but I think with the car three of United, it's another story. We, someone uh, hit us in the turn three. We don't know which car. Uh, we are together with another car, probably one touch uh, Jean Ludo, and after he spun, and probably the United car comes after and hits Jean Ludovic. But it's two different story. But it's a shame because we, Jean Ludovic, take a great start, but a P2 was really slow at the start, and it was complicated. Only one P3 can able to overtake the P2, and then it was completely strange behind. But probably we. We are able to go out of turn three in second position, but fortunately the race was already, already finished for us. OK, thank you very much, Nico. Thanks. Still reliving, Graham and I, that is, uh, exactly what happened at the first corner. It was a United uh, Autosports car, in fact, that Freddie is trying to get around at the time. But was bottled up behind the 15. If you look at the, the 83, it's behind the 15 car coming through there. We're going to go the safety car, by the way, back in this lap. It, for a variety of issues there, it did seem to me that uh, Feldmeyer got a, a pretty slow start and Sarah Bovey was struggling to get by the 15 car through turn one to the, uh, to the outside, bottled up there. Freddie Hunt, meanwhile, to the inside of her, yeah. bottled up behind the number three car, took uh, a, a kind of jink to the left, if you like, to try to get by the United car, which is where the initial contact happened. There's then some tyre smoke later on. I'm looking at other pictures you'll uh, 
I think you'll have to bear with me, but uh, as we go green again, there's definitely some tyre smoke uh, just out of frame, which is the secondary incident yep. further round turn three kicking off. We're going to be investigating that for the rest of the day, I think, to find out entirely what happened. But let's focus on the matter in hand because Julian Canal now leads after nearly 15 minutes of the race. Sadly, those 15 minutes pretty much all been held behind safety car. But half a second he will have on Sally Yolich at the restart of the race. Sally Yolich doing a brilliant job at the initial start to get into second position and ahead of Nicholas Cruton for cool racing. Ferdinand Habsburg of Prima Racing has wasted no time in gaining a couple of positions now to fourth and Edex Sports Paul Lafargue runs in fifth. LMP3 headed by CR Cruz in the number 13 Inter Europol competition car. There he is ahead of Josh Cagill for United Order Sports and as you've mentioned Christian Reed hasn't wasted any time at all getting to the front in the GT pack. Go okay, so at the moment, Julian Canal beginning to pull away here a little from the second place car in LMP2. We see now the two dark coloured GT cars at the head of this pack. It's Proton Competitions number 77, the 911 RSR, with Ahmed Al Harty close behind, and we're getting a grandstand view through the windscreen of Michael Fassbender, who's running third in the Proton Competition car. Michael, by the way, uh, my understanding is, bought on his final lap. He could have been in pole position yesterday. Uh, caught a much slower car in Sector 3, lost something like three or four tenths in that sector. A good qualifying effort from the number 93 driver. Some number, a number of stories actually coming out of that session uh, a, a long time after it yesterday afternoon, including Nico Jama, who on his pole position lap actually spotted some raindrops on his windscreen, and it was just starting to uh, not, you know, hammer down with rain, but just a little bit of psychological rain. He didn't let, let that affect him, and actually that's what enabled him to pluck out the 134.8, which was not significantly better than anybody else, only 97 thousandths of a second better. Here's the GT leaders then heading into the right hander at the first corner Christian Reed in that uh, all black with the gold detailing Proton Competition Porsche heading this car the Oman Racing with TS Sport Aston Martin with one win already this season Meanwhile, Julian Canal is clearing off into the distance he is. in LMP2. Yeah, he's definitely what 2.7 seconds ahead of Sally Yolich after that clean but aggressive start from Yolich, then into the safety car period. Just does not seem to have the punch after we go back to green flag racing. It was Crichton, Ferdi Habsburg, Paul Lafargue, Duncan Tappy, Pietro Fittipaldi, the train behind him. That train managing to drop at the moment, Francois Perodo who's got his mirrors full of John Falb in the undelayed uh, Algar Pro racing car. Ben Viscar, by the way, uh, having, of course, managed to start the race that lap down, uh, is making his way back up through the train. He's in amongst the LMP3 cars now. Remember, it will still be a lap down to the field. He'll be looking to catch and pass, if he possibly can, this little lot to get back onto the lead lap. It's a long afternoon, and it's a very warm one as well. Uh, Julian Canal is clearing off here. This could be a good move down the inside for Memo Rojas on Philippe Chimidomo, wasting no time at all there, right underneath the rear wing of the Frenchman and is uh, now in front. So that will give him uh, which position in the 30 car? 10th place. Uh, up to big body, 11th place ahead of Jimmy Domo now. Rodrigo Sales for Nielsen Racing number 24 in 13th spot as now pouring their way out of turn five through six and the more dramatic left-hander at seven go that little pack for second position overall. Meanwhile, Takeshi Kimura in the Kessel Racing Ferrari, number 57, running in fifth place, but under a lot of pressure from Andrew Harianto in the uh, entry from Hong Kong. That is absolute racing in the second of the Porsches. And here he comes to the inside. Harianto getting a really good run. Oh, but he completely, well, almost completely loses it. Did very, very well, actually, considering these cars do not have ABS to arrest that slide and avoid 
the movement into Kamuri's Ferrari. It's great. I think both these teams are absolute racing. Big squad that have been struggling to get traction on programmes with international motorsport across Southeast Asia. Obviously still struggling in the hopefully post-COVID era. And uh, Takeshi Kamura and the Car Guy squad. With these squads introduced to ACO rules racing through the Asia Le Mans series. Great to see them in Europe and we hope be back with the Asian series this, this coming season or in the future. On the inside, Vasily Jolic and taking that th third position now uh, goes Ferdi Habsburg. So now it's Palace Racing, Cool Racing, Prema Racing and Racing Team Turkey, your one, two, three, four. Now surely Paul Lafargue's strategy here is to strike whilst the iron is hot because the 34 car is slightly out of its rhythm now. Sally Jolic having not allowed Ferdinand Habsburg through, it was good driving in fact by the Austrian. And uh, Lafargue together with Duncan Tappy and Pietro Fittipaldi are all in this queue. The bright yellow and green into Europol competition car then for Brazilian driver Fittipaldi has joined the party. That car with the yellow door mirrors, Paul Lafargue, winner last time out in uh, Monza. Meanwhile, CR Cruz has just done the fastest lap within category in LMP3. So he is able to edge very slightly away on that lap from Josh Cagill for United Autosports. It's frenetic stuff still, other than in the lead of the race where Julian Canal is romping away almost six seconds to the good now. Nicholas Croyton, Croyton beginning to stem that flow, but it's another fastest lap of the race last time around from Julian Canal, and with a wide open space in front of him, he's taking full advantage, goes through sector two with another purple sector. So he'll be being told by the team what's going on behind him. That's the gap, visually. That translates as the chasing pair cross the line. 5.6 seconds it was last time. 5.5 seconds this time. As Sally Jolic moves the inside to defend from still to foraging LMP2s beyond three, if you include Pietro Fittipaldi. Then a big gap, by the way, to Francois Perodo with uh, John Falb. So up through the gears for Duncan Tappy as sweeping around the outside there was the blue and white car of... Milner? Yeah, the Moomer car, yeah, I thought so. Yeah. The Belgian entry. Good, good overtake here. Well... Oh, there was a touch as well. I was going to say, it's an unconventional one because it's round the outside, but yes, uh, possibly the contact there helped a little bit as well. Matthias Kaiser felt he was being held up by Rodrigo Sales. And down the, well, round the outside into turn one is uh, not a move seen very often, but it worked for him. Gives him the inside line automatically then for turn two. The gap, first to second in GT, is definitely closing up again. Michael Fassbender's not very far away either in third. Now, last time I checked, he was in fifth, so he's already done. No, no, he's been third for a little wee while. There's a move up there, by the way. Uh, we can see in the background through turn one. And that was Duncan Cameron with Pierre Retz. That's the battle for seventh position. But it's a group of four here. Jack Giacomo Petrobelli is with uh, this effort as well. We can have Miguel Molina, another local hero, to come later in the JMW Motorsport car. One, two, three, four in, LM, uh, in the GTE class, separated by, what is that, second and a half, two seconds maximum. But Fassbender definitely fifth in the safety car, so he's already overtaken two cars coming out of that into the green. Petrobelli and quite possibly Takeshi Kimura as well. Kimura's got his hands full, as we know, with Andrew Harianto, who is still just about behind the bright yellow car guy Ferrari. But Ahmed Al Harty putting his head down now, trying to reel in the Porsche. He's done more than that. He will now overlap Christian Reed into the braking area. It's trickier it? to overtake. Oh, he's he's overdone it at turn 10. And off towards the gravel, did so well there oh. not to end up in the stones. And Petrobelli had to check up as he was coming through to turn 10 to make sure he didn't T-bone the TF Sport Aston Martin. And it's a proton competition, 1-2 all of a sudden. 77 from 93, Christian Reed from Michael Fassbender, Ahmed Al Harty with his mirrors and his diffuser full of Giacomo Petrobelli in the JMW car. That's the move again, it was, didn't work, not enough room to get it done. And Michael Fassbender saw the 
window wide open in front of him, made that pass and almost collected. Petro Pelisi rejoined. Yeah, Giacomo had to really react very swiftly there. I don't like the look of how stationed those tyres were for Ahmed Al Harty. They will be majorly flat spotted now into turn 10, which is a much faster corner than it was two years ago. Uh, a harder stop and therefore an easier overtaking opportunity, you might say. It's a, a faster approach these days. And Ahmed Al Harty just misjudging it. I hope they hadn't planned to double stint those tyres because they could be very second hand by the end of two hours for the GT cars. Generally speaking, in GTE, you will have a set per stint, though. Remember, three drivers to cycle through, and the GT car can comfortably do an hour. Helped out if there is a bit of full course yellow or indeed safety car along the way. Sally Jolic now the fastest man within Pro Am. He's just gone through to set a 150, uh, 138.6. Uh, if you're a fan of watching endurance racing, not just with us on the audio and video uh, channels, but also watching alongside with timing and scoring, just keep an eye on the progress of the delayed number 19 Algarve Pro racing car with Ben Fiscal. Uh, ben has made his way through uh, to the uh, GTE and LMP3 uh, cars. He's also gone by two of the G LMP2 cars. Remember, he is still a lap down on everybody ahead of him uh, on the road. So he's already gone by, for the first time, the 51 Team Virage car of Rob Hodes and Philip Jimadomo in the 31 car, and is going very quickly indeed, posting some purple sector times before he caught the latest batch of traffic. Uh, I think he's fueled by anger and frustration at the moment, and that's going to be interesting to see how his progress continues through the remainder of this race, Johnny. As long as he's challenging, uh, channeling that, I should say, that's absolutely Seems fine. To be the moment. But yep. uh, yeah, th there is a danger that the red mist can descend, and then it's mistake after a mistake. But we haven't seen that so far from the young Dutchman. Ben Fiscal needs to just put out of his mind what has happened so far and focus on going as fast as he can, as safely as possible. Another new fastest lap for CR Cruz within category, 144.1. So the gap back to Josh Cagill has grown from four tenths to now eight tenths of a second over uh, a few laps. Uh, more and more pressure being applied to Sally Jolic, who takes a moment to warm the tyres up, it seemed, there, weaving from right to left. Should be said, by the way, uh, car 34 and car 65, the pole-setting car, are under investigation for race start position. It's a very aggressive start by Sally Jolic. So that's just being looked at by race control. We'll keep you posted if anything comes of that. Sort of hope not. Yeah. It uh, did look, re from our perspective, although we're not seeing it from uh, ground level, it looked aggressive but fairly clean. Whether or not the start positions were respected, that's for others to judge. The start position for 65, you can't really go wrong when you're in a pole position because you are dictating the pace. You can't be out of position, as far as I know, unless you're the other side of the track in pole. Mistake a moment or two ago for Takeshi Kimura. That will allow Andrew Harianto, well, with a shoulder barge, yeah. to get through. So Harianto now up to fifth position. <laughs> a bit of a draw of breath uh, from the APR crew. He also had a quick moment there. That was Ben Fiscar looking to deal with the next target on his list. Uh, and that is the number 24 Nielsen racing car of, uh, that is, Rodrigo Sales, to try to unlap himself from the 24 car. This is the lead group in GTE, still those two Proton Porsches, followed by Armand in the 69, Aston Martin, and then Giacomo Petrobelli in the number 66 car. Good spell, this, from Petrobelli. This is going to be important with a talent like Miguel Molina to play with a little later on for, well, the longest-serving crew uh, team in the European Le Mans series. Ricard Leitz, I'm sure enjoying this spell from teammate Michael Fassbender. Petrobelli massively impressed me last time out at Monza as well in his opening stint, the 46-year-old from Venice. And uh, first ever season in the... No, beg pardon, because if you go back as far as... 2009, he did actually he did. take part in the Le Mans series, as it was then, for Farnbacker Racing in the GT2 era. Traffic. But ELMS in the modern day, uh, welcome back to Petrobelli for the three races that we've had so far and this the fourth. 
Uh, but yes, traffic as far as the Prima car is concerned. This is not the race leader overall. Ferdinand Habsburg trying to reel in Julian Canal, but Canal has a 6.2 second lead it, that he is managing at the moment, Graham. And he's extended that. It was 5.5, remember, when uh, Habsburg and Croyton were together. So we've got Ferdy Habsburg now, he got past Nick Croyton. It's going to be interesting to see now what uh, the Prima man can do about our race leader at the moment. Uh, Julian Canal doing a fine job. We're almost half an hour into this four-hour encounter. It will be blisteringly warm aboard these cars. So that's a bit of blessed relief as they find some shade by the grandstand. There's not much of that around this circuit. First corner again for the GT cars. Christian Reed just edging away from Michael Fassbender a bit on that lap. But Fassbender, remember, benefiting from the Ahmed El Harty mistake. So that's what put him into second. As now, well, we were looking at uh, the chance of Bent ben Vizcal getting underneath the 24 car, not for position yet, remember. But from Re Rodrigo Salas, that's Bent unlapping himself. It is indeed. So his next target, by the way, will be Matthias Kaiser. It's, uh, I know you were saying yesterday after a chat with the Mulder Motorsport team has massively impressed uh, the Mulder Motorsport squad, who, let's not forget, scored a podium at uh, Monza. Their first in LMP2 in their first season. That would be a huge encouragement to them. Yeah, unfortunately, they weren't able to celebrate that immediately after the race and therefore stand on the podium. But because of Premer's 10 second penalty, it promoted Thomas Laurent and uh, Hugo de Vilde and the man in the car at the moment, Matthias Kaiser, two third. Those uh, watching the Monza race will have probably remembered the Moulin car stopping after the chequered flag when Laurent was at the, in the, at the wheel. I think he, he actually stopped right at the end of the pit wall and didn't make it back to the pit lane. That's interesting, isn't it? Because they were um, didn't cross the line as third place car, were not therefore on the list to be called to post race scrutineering. Yeah, had they done so, might well have not made it. No, indeed you have to make it back to Park Ferme to at least provide the scrutineer with something like a litre of fuel, I Correct. think it is, to make yeah. sure it's legal. And there were one or two other checks to be made as well. But uh, as they didn't finish third on the road, that rule didn't matter. So they got the uh, podium, they, they got the uh, the points and the podium finished, but didn't stand on the podium. But uh, the flip side is, missed out the potential examination that might have cost them that podium place. The other thing they're waiting for at the moment is the trophies. But <laughs> maybe they'll get oh, really? delivered. Yeah, maybe they get delivered by the end of the season. We'll never know. Uh, well, we will find out, hopefully. Anyway, the 30 car, which is the Duquesne Memo Rojas machine. Such bad luck last time out at Monza, involved in an accident not of his own making. But Rojas uh, is working his way up the order. He's now in 10th, and he has behind him Francesco Draconi. Ben Fiscal in the background there as well. This is uh, Ben Fiscal looking to catch these three cars, the Duquesne, BHK and Muller cars, to unlap himself from that trio. Well for him at the moment, uh, after what's been a pretty desperate start of the race for the 19 car, but he's got his head down and has done a lot of the hard charging that's required to get himself in a position to take advantage of anything strategic that might, might, might get his way. So we see Armand Alharty beginning to take a look up the inside there of Michael Fassbender. Those four GTEs in some significant traffic. It's the 22. In the hands of Duncan Tappy in this first period of the race, under pressure from Pietro Fittipaldi, 22 from United Autosports into Europol. And by the way, the green and yellow car behind, the very newest Orica 07 on the planet, a brand new car this weekend, the second chassis for into Europol competition. They've been doing their two championship campaigns thus far in the WEC and LMS with one chassis owned by the team and a loner chassis from memory from Dragon Speed at Le Mans. So on board with Tappy, oh, now a spear. And that's Ben Fiscal. Ben Fiscal. Now, has that been as a result of some contact or has he made a mistake himself? I'd be very surprised if it's a mistake from the young Dutchman. Lucky that he damaged, nothing I can see. Dive planes still in place. Remember, dive planes and extra aero are permitted in the European Le Mans series, unlike in the World Endurance Championship. So these cars take a slightly different uh, look to them. And he's got to do that all again because yeah. he spotted the Team Virage car going by. So he's got to start again with the unlapping of the LMP2 teams. 
I did mention that element of red mist, but we will give Bent the, the uh, benefit of the doubt for the moment until we see a replay of exactly what has uh, resulted in him ending up there. James, James Allen, Allen, yeah. yeah taking go. Right, so Memo Rojas is already off the road. Oh, he got hit by the Ferrari. He yeah. was hit in the rear from the Rinaldi Ferrari. And that, with not the 33 here this weekend, has to be the... 32. No, the other way round, isn't it? It's 33 is not here. That, right, that so it has 32. to be the 32, therefore. Started by Pierre Arrette, so that was yeah. Arrette on Fiscal. Now, OK, uh, the flip side there is, did uh, Bent take the room that Pierre needed to break? I'm not going to attribute all the blame yet. We only saw the end of it. True, because in a P2, very easy to just pop in front of a GT car, hit the brakes where you normally would, and expect the big heavy GT car behind to be able to uh, arrest the speed. Correct. And it's not always possible. I don't know why Memo Rojas was straight lining the chicane, no, though. That's all, uh, all got very busy there, didn't it? Unconnected incident. Uh, Ferdy Hampstead, by the way, has absolutely roared up to the rear of uh, Julian Canal. What was nearly six seconds is now 1.2 and just one car between the two leading LMP2. So after clearing the cool racing car, Habsburg in the Prima racing car has closed the gap in, what, a lap, lap and a half? Yeah. So it's just done a better job in traffic by the look of things. The car he's just got ahead of to lap is Mark Richards starting the 360 racing LMP3 car. And Richards has behind him on the road Freddie Hunt in the number 10 machine, who sadly made some contact with Sarah Bovey right at the start, putting the Belgian out of the race together with the pink iron Lynx machine. So we won't get to see Dorian Parr, sadly, make her European Le Mans Series debut. But hopefully there is a plan for her to be out at Spa to replace Rahel Fry again. Down into the chicane goes Ferdinand Habsburg, twice a winner this season, leading the championship as well, and certainly homing in on Julian Canal. Canal, remember, is the silver in Panis Racing. Ferdi, a gold, so you would naturally expect uh, the more rapid, generally speaking, driver to be able to find his way through traffic, although Julian Canal is mightily experienced. Some great results at Le Mans through the years, and uh, last ELMS win came last year. should say, by the way, great news this for Panis Racing. Julian Canal, if you like, the junior-ranked driver uh, in that trio, and has been fending off a couple of uh, crews as Freddie Habsburg has taken the lead. Habsburg is thrown into the lead. We've not seen that on screen, but we are seeing it on timing. And he, there, there he is. is. So, so traffic has paid dividends for Ferdi Habsburg. Now it's a matter of just Julian Canal keeping his head, sticking as best he possibly can. Is he in trouble? Mm, first sector time will give us an answer. It's a 28.6. So, oh, That's he got caught behind the Inter Europol competition car yeah. number 14. So the pass had already been made there. Was that just a misjudgment through traffic that Ferdinand Habsburg, a few metres back, was able to read far better? I think it's just he'd lost his rhythm a little bit, maybe a little rattled by the delay. Going to see and again what happened there. Though no. that's what that's uh, one of the. That, that's a game it's with a the 32. Incident. Yeah. So that's the Team Virage car trying to go up the inside of the 32 in the braking area for Pierre Eret. I'm not sure there was a gap there for the prototype. That's that's as Ben Fiscal was catching him again after the spin. Because Ben Fiscal was the car just behind the oh, Virage car. Contact between the Racing Team Turkey car and Edex Sport. Paul Lafarge trying to get up the inside there of the Pro-Am race leader, Sally Yolich. And the Turkish driver says, no, you don't, Paul, and elbowed him out. But there was a bit of contact there, which has delayed clearly Edex Sport. And it means that Duncan Tappy's caught some of that ground back again. Here comes Lafarge on the overlap, using the DKR Duquesne as a pick to help him through the air on the main straight. He will now shade to the left. There's a bit of smoke coming out of the rear of the Edex Sport car, which I don't like to see. And Lafargue's going to have to do it the hard way around the outside. And Sally Yolich does not allow that to happen. But this is just all building a natural crescendo. Let's hope to some good overtakes, some clean ones, rather than further incident, because it feels like we've had far too much of that in the opening 38 minutes. Round four of the European Le Mans series live from Barcelona with me, Johnny Palmer, and Graham Goodwin of DailySportsCar.com.
now behind Freddie Hunt in the LMP3, number 10. He's seventh in class, and they'll have to pick their way through carefully because there's some quick corners coming up. Sally Yolich will be able to get alongside the Brit and through. Oh, oh and did Freddie see just about Paul Lafar, but I wonder whether Freddie's ended up in the gravel as a result of that. Not quite. This is what we love about sports car racing, because you're going to catch slower cars and not necessarily in the ideal positions, Watch Graham. Here. This is where the elbows came out from Paul Lafargue. Freddie turned in, Lafargue was already there, did well to keep it on the island there, Helped Freddie by Hunt. the Sausage Curb. I know Sausage Curbs have not been getting great reviews in recent times, but that does help the car to stay on the track in that occasion. Another message on our screen which refers to Rob Hodes for Virage and the 32 uh, of Pierre Eret, the Ferrari, who came to blows into the chicane a couple of laps ago. So that's going to be investigated at turn 14. There's, there's quite a lengthy to-do list up in race control at the moment. Yeah. That chicane is an awkward place on this circuit, particularly if you're in an awful lot of traffic, as now Lafargue flashes the lights to warn Mark Richards that he wants to get through. So another LMP3 car being overtaken by these much swifter and larger uh, LMP2 machines. Getting close, by the way, Johnny, to the kind of window where we should start to see LMP2 cars pitting in the next couple of laps. Remember, we have that uh, early safety car period. That will delay it a little, but uh, we're not a million miles out of the fueling window for the LMP2 cars, a little longer, of course, for the P3s and the GTEs. Yeah, P3 under full green can make an hour just over, so maybe an hour and ten before they will need to make a stop. Very good spell, this, by the way, from Sally Yorick. He has, of course, been passed by a couple of other cars, but with absolute respect, one of those is Ferdy Habsburg, who, by the way, is two and a half seconds to good now in this race. Still retains fourth place, and, of course, there are the two pro drivers still to come in this Pro-Am effort, and he leads the Pro-Am class, he's fourth overall. The next one back is the AF Corsa effort with Francois Perodo. Leads that car by 18 seconds. Yeah. So, actually, Sally Yolich, who has uh, now become so used to these prototypes, how they behave both in traffic and in clear air, and not a surprise to see him doing so well compared to the other Pro-Am offerings in the race. Uh, the other Pro-Am cars, by the way, a bit further back, Francois Perodo's 88 AF Corsa car and the Algarve Pro Racing car of John Faub are second and third currently. Race distance from first to second in LMP3 still hovering around 0.8 of a second. So good driving from CR Cruz back to Joshua Cagill for United Autosports. Yeah, Charles Cruz seems to be enjoying his time in this number 13 interior pole competition car. It's a team that knows that platform well. Yes, Lichier uh, is identical until the team gets hold of it, and then it's a matter of what you do with the way in which the car is set up and developed for that team and around those drivers. And they certainly seem to have found a sweet spot for Charles Cruz. It was a heart in mouth moment there for all involved with inter European competition because the P2 nearly made side to side contact with the P3. They avoided it by a cigarette paper, so that was for. Pietro Fittipaldi not wanting to lose any time as he went around the outside of car 14, which is being driven by Noam Abramcic. So he's fourth in category. Looking to get third here from Mo Smith, uh, the pole starting car for the efforts of Melty Jakobsen. And Abramcic looking for a way around the American driver. While the old fox Mo Smith is looking what he can do to make that as difficult as possible. So first and fourth for the Polish team, looking to try and make it third, but Morris Smith keeping the number 17 car as wide as he can as the tail is kicked out there by Abramcic. Working his way now down towards the chicane itself. So the man who carries dual nationality, French and Israeli, and uh, out now of the final corner will go those two. All fairly calm down at Cool Racing, running third overall in the hands of Nicholas Cruton with their 37 car, and third in LMP3 with Mo Smith. So Premier Racing and Ferdy Habsburg now lead by 2.2 seconds. That's uh, lead in the latest batch of traffic, just trimmed back a little by Julian Canal, who, of course, has to pass those same cars that the number nine has managed to find his way by. 
looking good at the moment again for Premier Racing. They've been a pretty dominant force in the European Le Mans series in their first season. Uh, due, by the way, to see a driver changing that car. And a very welcome one, actually, by Manuel Correa, uh, should make a belated uh, debut with the team at Spa. And for Portimao, we understand, that is the plan at the moment. Driver, of course, recovering uh, uh, recovering after the horrendous accident at Spa a couple of years ago, suffered serious injury, and his recovery season in the FIA F3 European Championship. He's in action at Spa this weekend. He'll be back at Spa. So he's got practice there uh, to be aboard the number nine car to join the regular two more experienced sports car pros in this. 23 laps completed and nearly 45 minutes. So this would be the time that we would expect the LMP2s to be pitting had we stayed green. But remember, we had about 15 minutes of safety car, so they should be able to go at least another five or possibly even 10 minutes, um, which will, well, automatically send the strategy out of a skew quite early on. So several spreadsheets up and down the pit lane will be being adjusted. Meanwhile, this queue of LMP2s, as one of them will peel off, that's the BHK Motorsport yep. car making an early stop. They do tend to do that from memory. So Francesco Draconi wanting to get into the pits when it's nice and quiet. There might be something to be said for that. Underneath the rear wing of the 47, Algarve Pro Racing car is the 30. This is for position. Memo Rojas around the outside of John Faub and gets it done. He does indeed. Neat and tidy, clean as a whistle and double European Le Mans Series champion Emma Rojas uh, powers by and up into ninth position. His next target for the three seconds, four seconds up the road is going to be Francois Perodo. So Francesco Draconi, the Italian, silver rated, sharing with another silver driver, Marcus Pommer, and gold graded Sergio Campana. I'll be surprised if they're doing a driver change this early on, certainly at least a double stint for Draconi. Here's the gap, by the way. Here comes Ferdy Habsburg. There is Julian Canal, and it's over four seconds. That is the difference that the traffic is making. Looks here as well, by the way, as if Christian Reed is getting away from the chasing trio behind him. Michael Fassbender playing rear gunner for the number 77. So 77 from 93, 69 and 66 there. 10 seconds to the good ahead of the chasing pack in GTE as Duncan Tappy brings the number 22 United Autosports car down pit lane. There's someone else on pit lane there too as well. Yes, GT it? car. It's Pierre Eret in the 32 Rinaldi Racing Ferrari. So is there some damage on that car as now Paul Lafargue will go ahead of Sally Jolic in the braking area for turn one. So Jolic just caught a napping a touch there. They were right behind one of the Euro International cars bottled up behind. And I wonder whether that's the reason why United have said, get out of this, we are losing time in such a queue of P2s, let's try and put you in a better place within the race with some clearer air, hopefully. They are doing some, oh well, I was going to say remedial work on the 32, but they're actually going to do a driver change there as well very early on, get Pierre Eret out. Pierre, uh, Pierre rather uh, limped away from that car, so whether or not he's struggling with the heat, whether or not there's a fitness issue or injury for Pierre, we'll just have to wait and see, but uh, Rinaldi are indeed uh, tyres, fuel and a driver change for the Rinaldi Racing Squad. They don't have a platinum or gold driver in their combination, Rinaldi Racing, this weekend. It's two bronzes and a silver, the silver being our Argentinian driver, Nicolas Veroni. As the 22 rejoins, no driver change there, just fuel and probably not even tyres for Duncan Tappy. Yeah, John Falb and Rodrigo Salas also on pit lane, and as I speak, so too uh, comes Julian Canal, previous race uh, leader, of course. So Julian comes to a halt now, and there is no driver change going to be required there. The car is being fuelled, tyres are ready. Good year technician takes a look. Rodrigo Salas comes out to rejoin the race. I think this is fuel only, is it? For Julian Canal, I would expect so. The tyres are sitting there next to the car, but haven't yet been offered. You can't put them on right now because the fuel's going in. The tyre change has to be separate. And also Paul Lafargue is in for EDEX Sports as the personnel 
in some cases, leap onto the car. Certainly that's the case for the guy who has to cr clean the windshield. No need to take a uh, windscreen tear off just yet, just a bit of fluid applied and rubbed down. And they will do tyres because air guns are about to be uh, offered to this car. Still conversations being had, though, yeah. it looks like at EDEC. Here comes the 65 car back out into the fray. Julian Canal stays aboard. Fernie Habsburg, by the way, now with a near 10 second gap to cool racing Nick, Cro Nick Croyton. So Lafarge still in the pit lane, Sally Yolich also pitting on that lap. Julian Canal back out into seventh position, no driver change there. John Fowle for Algarve Pro Racing has pitted and rejoins the race. Same goes for Rodrigo Sales for Nielsen Racing in the number 24. So, frenetic stuff, in comes the leader. After a good spell for Ferdy Habsburg, he is going to stay aboard this car. Again, no sign that tyres are there, but no sign that there's an imminent need to change them. I think at this stage, it's going to be a matter of whether or not there might be damage, there isn't. It was a strange sight, actually, of uh, the nine car arriving with the 31 in front of it. That's because Habsburg has virtually lacked Chimidomo now, and they came in together. And I'm sure we'll get that done in the next uh, next phase of the stint to follow. The 43 car is also in for Pietro Fittipaldi. As now to the inside for second position, or rather third position in the class in GT goes Petra Belli. Thought about the move on Ahmed El Harty, who is very wide coming out of turn four and down towards the apex. Petra Belli for the second race running. Really great opening stint so far. Almost in a podium position. Great stuff, 43 car. And from third, out comes the Prima car. Comes out just behind Ben Fiscal, who's made his way up, by the way, to 18th overall at this stage of the race, but obviously owes us a, a pit stop. That will be just a touch later than most of the pack, by dint of having started a lap down. Yeah, and uh, obviously he had his spin as well, so uh, that uh, has taken, again, some tactics in the mind to try and clear that away, wipe the memory banks and push on again. Another incident involving a few cars at Turn 15 is now on an investigation. I think that is the incident that was uh, that involved Ben Fiscal and Pierre Arrette. And that Memo Rojas that... straight lining the chicane, although yeah. sort of unrelated. Back into the race goes the 88 AF Corsa car with still Francois Perodo at the wheel. He's second in the Pro-Am category behind Racing Team Turkey. It's our first pit stopper in the LMP3 stakes. Now that is early. Should be a little more than an hour for these cars, particularly bearing in mind the uh, the safety car early in the race. Maybe there might be a tyre issue for the number five. This is Michael Jensen. Watch drops down the field as a result of that. So looking down the field, the only one of the LMP2s that has not so far pitted is indeed Ben Fiscal. That is, as we've got the 47, John Falb, and the 21 from Miller Motorsports. Still in the hands of Matthias Kaiser. And, uh, exchanging positions there. What's this all about? Is this a contact here? I think it might well have been. Just threw the Algarve Pro car off his rhythm. Two positions lost in two corners there from the 47. Now Viscal makes his stop. Uh, by the way, hearing from Hayley Edmonds in the pits that Pierre Eret is fine and uh, is able to continue in the race, so uh, just a tactical stop perhaps or maybe they wanted to assess him mid-race. Now, Ahmed al Harti with Fassbender a little wide as he works his way through turn 11 and 12. Maybe had an opportunity to go to the inside line there, but Fassbender covered it off well. So second and third, you can tell that by the illuminated dots on the side of these cars. Two for second place for Fassbender and the all-black Aston Martin has the three positional lights illuminated. Petrobelli wants those though and is looking at every corner for a way by the Omani driver up ahead. They're also about to be lapped 
by an LMP2 driver and Petrobelli in the background using that almost uh, to uh, pick up a bit of a tow down the main straight. This train is allowing, there is uh, Christian Reed going through turn one. He's getting away a little with this battle here. Petrobelli to the outside this time. No way through this time, but the pressure is going to allow... It's Petrobelli, sorry, up the uh, inside of Al Harty this time. Is that the position that's going to change? Ferrari and Aston Martin side by side. And the Ferrari's going to get it here, Johnny. A oh. little bit of a shove to the left as well for the Aston Martin, but that's GT racing at the end of the day. The Ferrari is carrying some damage on the front right corner as well, and they almost exchanged door mirrors there, did Petrobelli and Ahmed al -Harty. Petrobelli running a touch wide coming out of turn five, down the hill through the rapid six and into the hard braking for turn seven but neat and tidy through there. He got virtually the move done, so I don't think the contact afterwards will be an issue on the exit of Turn 4. Petrobelli up another place. Fairly early stop here for Ryan Lynx, though, Graham. That's the number 60 car. That's Claudio Schiavone started that car. Oh, Petrobelli wide at Turn 10. Is that going to be the chance for the Aston Martin to pounce back again? Not quite close enough, Ahmed al -Harty. Gets the large snout of the Aston Martin very close indeed to the rear of the Ferrari. This is great early racing for the bronze-rated drivers for the main part, and now it is side-by-side side in LMP3. That was a wiggle, it's the 2 it's and the, the two. 13. Yeah, with the red roof, the number 2 car, the 3 is out of the race, That of is course. a change for the lead. That is Josh Cagle going through on Charles Cruz, and that's all happening with LMP2 cars. In fact, the leader closing in on them. Another lap on the LMP3s as they close in. Well, that was almost contact, by the way, with the 18 Absolute Racing car. The, the place had already gone. But Cagle now leads LMP3 for the very first time. It was Cagle in a really big moment, actually. He, he was virtually 45 degrees to the direction of travel, but did well to recover that. These cars are great uh, when they're going at high speed through the quicker corners because they're glued to the road surface for their downforce. But mechanical grip at low speed is uh, left wanting a little bit. That's the whole beauty of a prototype. So Josh, at his tender age, did well there to uh, gather up the moment and uh, see our crews loses a spot. But otherwise, to this point, that's been a really good drive for the American. Has it just, say, finding a good groove with this team? Josh Cagle, though. Uh, back end of that car does look very screwy. The tyres look to be going away. Battle here between the 60 and the 32. Iron Lynx and Rinaldi Racing. This is a battle for position. It's Diego Alessi, by the way, aboard Rinaldi car now. Claudio Schiavone has come back out aboard the number 60 car. And now, Petra Belli looking up the inside of Michael Fassbender, the GMW man looking to make progress here. And again, oh, he touches him! Now Disaster! That, that was absolutely... I'm afraid that was on the Ferrari man. Disaster for Petrobelli and for Fassbender, but particularly for the recovering portion now, who all of a sudden rejoins the race right in front of Spirit of Race, and Fassbender, I think, sensibly will come down pit road. They damage? can weave this into the strategy, theoretically. He's not far off, is he? Yeah, Proton Art will he have to be quick to react to this. It might have been he was on an in-lap anyway, but let's hope that it's not done any significant damage. That's such a shame. Yeah. I mean, Petrobelli was driving within himself pretty aggressively, but that, um, the way I saw that one, he was nowhere near uh, a gap enough for him to take that move, and uh, that's rather spoiled. The end of Michael Fassbender's stint, there's side-by-side -side contact between these two battling Ferraris, round the outside, and through goes the 32 in the hands of Diego Alessi. So, Rinaldi ahead of Kessel now. Fuel going in, first of all. Are the Dolly Jacks about to come out, though? It's going to go up on the internal. No, they're no. happy to change tyres. They I will think assess. Michael's staying aboard for a, is this a double for Michael Fassbender. Yeah, I would have expected so. He's the bronze, and they want to get his time out of the way as quickly as they can. So, coming over the rise out of turn 12 and into 13. 
and yeah, it no. was a half-hearted manoeuvre there. That's a fast corner at 13 as well, and you have to be fully alongside. Michael's turning in, just he was not on the apex. expecting that. Yeah, it was yeah. The, there was no gap. He was on the apex. I'm sorry, but that uh, you know, after a good spell from Giacomo Petrobelli, I'm calling that as an error from the Ferrari driver. And by the way, he lost the position to the Aston Martin in doing so. So he'll have been ruining that. Rather oddly, of course, stays in third place as a result of that, but I'm sure that is going to be added to a long list of things being considered in race control at the moment. I thought we were going to have a repeat of the move there for Peter Belli at the same corner, this time on the Aston Martin, but he thought better of it. Um, it's, uh, yeah. You want to see hard and fast racing, clearly. Oh, yeah. And Petrobelli, you know, had been doing so well. There was some contact on Ackman al Harty to get to third, but I thought that was fair, just about. But certainly not on Fassbender heading into turn 13. And very little that the uh, Irish slash German actor could do about that. But he's good. He's game for more. Is Michael Fassbender staying on board for another stint? They've given him new tyres as well. Right round the outside there will go the third place LMP2 car of Nicholas Cruton. Shows you how much more downforce a prototype has compared to the heavier GT machines. They still have a fair bit of aero on them as described with that massive rear diffuser, for example, on the Aston Martin. Still battling nicely with Jacopo Petrobelli from JMW Motorsport in uh, the more familiar uh, livery these days, although at the start of the year, you had to kind of look twice to, see, to think, is that the JMW car? But it's not yellow. But the red and black looks very, very smart for 2022. Yeah, and running in third position. Open the doors, you see the yellow still there. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's the same car, folks. Oh, most certainly She's is. got an extra layer of uh, wrap on it. She is proudly the Ferrari 488 that they've campaigned throughout. And I think I'm right, that has done every Le Mans 24 hours since 2017. That is a car with some history, including, of course, a win in its first year at Le Mans. So, out of the sequence of corners at six and seven, and through eight will go the fight for uh, sixth position. In fact, for fifth, because uh, Duncan Tappy in fifth place, you've got the Edex Sport car that has rejoined after its pit stop. Paul Lafargue is running in sixth place, and then Sally Jolich. Now, Jolich a bit closer to Francois Perodo now. Well, they're together on the screen. In reality, there's 14 seconds between them, which he is managing well. As he powers his way out of turn 12 to gobble up another LMP3 car, put a lap on that. So, Sally Jolich continuing with his the second part of his double stint. We have had an hour of the race already. We have indeed. It should say, by the way, in this second stint, Francois Perodo in that battle for LMP2 Pro-Am is closing in on Sally Jolich. Not something that was happening in the first part uh, of the battle. The other change uh, I've not heard you note, I certainly haven't, uh, is a change for the driver in number 19, the Algar Pro car recovering. Sophia Flourish now aboard that car. Hadn't spotted that, so thank you. Down towards the first corner will go this team fight manager car in P3. 35, team manager car 35, report to race director, please. Team manager car 35 to race director. That's, That's the BHK yeah. Motorsport car, the first stoppers, in fact, in yeah. LMP2. First stoppers and also uh, under investigation, or rather, uh, instant involved under investigation, which is three cars. The 32, Rinaldi Racing, the APR car we saw hit by the 32, and the 35, I think, was the car. That wasn't the car, was it, that took avoiding action. Big lock up there from one of the LMP3 cars. It's a 14 car of inter Europol competition, just ahead of Francois Perodo, who's looking to deal with this pair. It's the 14 going through on the six. Mark Richards keeps it on the island. Mark Richards for 360 racing, yeah, just about. And now to the outside, Francois Perodo in his AF Corsa LMP2, having to really get out of the throttle, though, there with the Inter Europol competition car just up ahead. Found his way underneath uh, Noam Abramchich in the end. And this is very busy indeed <laughs> for just... Memo Rojas still, yes, for the 30 Duquesne car to the outside of the Felbermeyer liveried machine with Horst Felbermeyer Jr. still at the wheel of car 15 for RLR M Sport. Nose to tail still for second position. Ahmed Alhati ahead of Giacomo Petrobelli. Remember, the class is led by Christian Reed. Let's hear from another GT driver, though, now with Haley. I'm joined here by the official driver of car number 93. Now, let's just go back to the incident uh, with, uh, with the um, uh, JMW car. Um, Michael did manage, despite 
quite a spin. He came in, pitted, changed tyres. Was he on his outlap? I uh, know. So that was that wasn't a planned pit stop. We were going to go a little bit further, but then after the incident uh, on the track, we figured you know might as well get it over with because we were in that window. So you've managed to kind of weave that into your strategy. Yeah, it was uh, quick thinking. Great job by the team. I don't think we lost too much time. Everything considering, so. Uh, we're still very much in the race because there's a great there's been some great battles in the GT category uh, in the early part of the race and Michael doing fantastically really holding on up until that instant to the second place yeah it's been it's been a great start I think he really likes following Chris <laughs> um, when Chris is in front of him he's kind of able to keep learning and, and he's been driving a great race great thank you very much Thanks. Yeah, so all not lost by any stretch for the 93 car there it is heading into turn number one it's damage to that car the uh, front right wheel cover appears to be flapping. Or was I just imagining that? Well, the, da well, the contact obviously came on the rear, but then he skated off and might have caught a sausage kerb, which has perhaps damaged the undertray of the car. I wonder if it's either, if it's either an optical illusion, the, uh, the wheel cover or the light. But there was something about when he hit on the bumps there that did not look right from the angle I saw it. From the lead of the class, the 77 Porsche is now in, as now some change of position. Horse Felbermeyer Jr. on Noam Abramtic to put the RLR M Sport, the Felbermeyer livery car, ahead of car 14 from into Europol competition. That's into fifth place. This is fuel going in for uh, the number 77. Is this a change again? It is. This is Petra Belli going ahead once again of Al Harty as both are under pressure with. LMP2 cars involved. It's been engaging stuff this GT class so far. This is before we get the majority of the pros involved. And that's a big wide moment for DKR Duquesne. Tom von Rompuy is uh, exploring the scenery on the inside of Turn 1. By the way, Petrobelli now leads the class because Christian Reed has pitted in GTE. Was oh, there contact? There was, but pretty substantial contact with the 17. Yeah. Car 17, the now remaining Cool Racing P3 offering. And that uh, car... Mikey Benham just aboard that yeah, car. indeed. Mikey Benham running in eighth place. I think it might have been his first flying lap for Mikey Benham. It's not his out lap. And uh, the car was started by Maurice Smith. You're right about that bodywork. Definitely just starting to... At higher speed, lift up from the A pillar basically. So it's the rear part of the uh, front fender, the, yeah. the right hand side wing. Now, I can't work out really how that has been damaged, unless, as I say, it's the rumble over the sausage curb, but it's under braking that it just starts to rise up a little bit. It will certainly be a distraction for Michael Fassbender. At least it won't be limited, limiting his visibility though, as here comes Ahmed Al Harty from third position in the class. Duncan Cameron had been overtaken, remember, by... Well, he was already uh, behind Jacopo Petrobelli. So JMW Motorsport now lead the class, but owe us a pit stop. Duncan Cameron second in GT and another Ferrari also, though, needed to come into pit lane. Oh. And so there's a slight mistake there by for the car number two, Josh Cagill. That's costing the lead. It has. So he's given the lead back again to CR Cruz. Remember, you cannot rejoin if you overcook it at turn one. You can't drive straight back onto the circuit. You have to go to the left-hand side of the bollards. Ah, it was a spin and possibly on his own for Josh Cagill down at the first corner. And where, where does CR Cruz get back through? They didn't touch each other, did they? I've because got a funny feeling he'd already gone through. Maybe. So was there actually some... I only caught the back end of that spin where maybe there was some contact in the lead-up to it. Meanwhile, the TF Sport run Oman racing car for Agwen Harty is into pit lane. Johnny, you will remind us of what the bogey time is for the time pit stops for LMP3. Yeah, it's a minute and 45 seconds. So 105 seconds. Yeah. Just checking whether or not... Everybody so far that has stopped has respected, has, has burned one of those... Longer stops. Sorry, those, I, those are pitted. A minute and 45. One minute, 45 seconds, right, yes. Okay. No, 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 they haven't, in which case we'll come back to that a little later. So just to remind you, if you're new to the European Le Mans series, LMP3s, um, they have to make two long stops, They're, as in they are timed from pit in to pit out, and the minimum reference time for this particular circuit, it varies from track to track, but it's 105 seconds. So 
60 at 45 is 105. Correct. I'm right there, aren't I? Yeah. Yep. So a minute and 45 seconds uh, is the minimum pit stop reference time, and each LMP3 car has to serve two of those stops. However, you need three to get home, therefore one of those stops of the three can be as quick as you like. And of course, any further ones that are necessary can be very rapid as well. But what we'd like to, like to try and do is tick off which teams are serving their longer stops early on in the race. Slightly easier in GTs because we don't have the minimum reference time. And, and likewise, the top three have yet to make their stop. So 66 leading the class, Jacobo Fett Petrobelli for JMW Motorsport, Duncan Cameron for Spirit of Race, happy to push on for the time being. And the Oman Racing by TF Sport Car, the other Aston Martin from that team, number 95, driven by John Hartshorn, is up to third, but will obviously drop back as soon as it makes its first fuel call. An hour and ten minutes very nearly already elapsed, and it's the championship leaders that are not quite bossing this race, but they have a ten-second advantage over Julian Canal and the Panis Racing gang that managed to get pole position yesterday afternoon. Nicholas Cruton in the best of the cool racing cars, the uh, only one, in fact, in LMP2. Number 37 is in third, and Pietro Fittipaldi, uh, done well actually in those pit stop that pit stop phase a minute and two seconds with the pit stop for into Europol competition it's gained him a couple of places he's gone from sixth to fourth after the first stop I uh, would say as well by the way JMW going long on fuel but pitting now from the lead of GTE so Giacomo Petrobelli it's a, well a misadventure but other than that a very impressive first stint Hits for the very first time as we've got the number 93 car uh, battling away with the 57. This is for fifth position in class at the moment. I'll come to who's burned one in terms of longer pit stops in LMP3 in a moment or two. Meantime, a fairly battered looking Iron Lynx Ferrari with uh, some bodywork askew or at least a dive plane out of position on the front right corner is overtaken there into turn number four. Alessandro Harianto on yeah. Claudio Schiavoni. And Schiavoni actually still shown as being ahead of Harianto, but we might wait for them to go through the next split to confirm that positional change. It's going to be a warning flag for Michael Fassbender for the abuse of track limits. Remember, track limits penalties, if we get to that stage, awarded to car rather than driver. So Fassbender needs to be careful there on the edge of a further penalty, just a warning flag at this stage. This is a battle for second position. Julian Canal under uh, pressure now from Nicholas Coyton. We've got quite a gap still, by the way, to Pietro Fittipaldi, who is currently running in fourth place for the Inter-Europol competition squad. We'll take a look at this, and I'll keep watching as I'm telling you, that of the five cars in LMP3 we've seen so far down pit lane, four of them have taken a long stop. Now, that can make a uh, difference of up to 30 or 40 seconds um, against a quick stop. And the four that have taken them so far, the 14 from the Europol competition, the 17 cool racing car, uh, the number six from 360 racing, and the five from RLR M Sport. All of those four have taken one of their longer stops. Uh, the car that has stopped and taken a short stop, so still has two long stops to go, is the number 10 from your internationalist. In comes Josh Cahill from, what would that be? It was second, third place as he pitted. Right, so Jerome de Sadalia had got ahead in the Euro International car smoking. as well. Was that, was that a cool racing car smoking behind? From which uh, I think the it P2 was or the P3 the car? The 17 car looked to be smoking. The LMP3 car of Michael Benham then, possibly in some strife. Remember, that car did have contact with the DKR car. Last time, Mikey did a 147.6, which is there or thereabout, so not affecting the lap times just yet, if there is a problem. Um, Josh Cagill obviously has had his spin down at Turn 1, so that they might be thinking at United will have to change tyres now because these are too badly damaged, the Michelins. I hear from several parties in LMP3 that tyre degradation throughout the course of today's race, particularly in the heat and on a fairly highly abrasive track here at Barcelona, tyre deg is going to massively drop off in, in the trouble. closing stages. Mikey Benham is in trouble. He's pulled to one side. The RLR car swept by him behind. Mikey Benham has a problem. 
All right, well, we'll keep an eye out on that for that. He's certainly slow through the first sector. And uh, Ben and behind Ross Kaiser now for 360 racing. Mean, what, meantime, it's very close indeed between these two cars, fourth and fifth on the road, but there is one GT car ahead of them that hasn't pitted. That's John Hartzorn in the class leading Oman Racing by uh, TF Sport car. But once that car comes into pit road, it will leave Christian Reed leading the class from Takeshi Kimura. Yep. So they mustn't have done tyres on that car. A very quick turnaround indeed for Kessel Racing. Up to second position now for car 57. Yeah, five seconds quicker than anybody in pit lane for the Kessel Racing car as well. That's made a big difference in putting them back into contention in this race. Ahmed Al Harty looking very racy indeed at the moment in the rear camera of Michael Fassbender's number 93 Proton Competition Porsche. Premier Racing lead this race. Ten seconds to the good now with Nick Croyton still on the rear end of the Panis racing car. Sophia Flersch here looking to unlap herself from a number of the... In fact, I, I do apologise, this is now full position. Right, so Sophia Flersch, yeah, looking to pick those cars off in front of her, and that would gain her positions in the LMP2 class. Here is the 17. Damaged so we've had a slow puncture. Yeah. Look at that line on the tyre yeah. that's just been taken off. I wonder whether that is the big issue and the reason why the 17 was slowing. You spotted it, Graham, and they have to uh, sort that out as quickly as possible. Yeah. A quicker stop. It's very tricky so soon after their expected pit stop to now kind of swallow that up into, into their spreadsheets, but they'll have to, unfortunately, rejoining in 10th position. So just to confirm, by the way, for position, finally, after starting a lap down, so the number 19 Alcar Pro car, in the hands of Sophia Flersch, is now up into 15th, not 16th, in LMP2 after an hour and 15 minutes. It's gone by the Team Farage car. Avia Rodriguez is climbing aboard that car, and that's a replacement here, and I believe the remainder of the season for Jasmine Jafar. Uh, here is the LMP3 class leader, first stop of the race for car number 13 for CR Cruz. I understand Charles had got ahead of Josh before Josh's spin. That's so, that, yeah, the, yeah, the overtake, the re overtake for the Inter Europol competition car on United had already taken place. Mikey Benham's extra pit stop has taken 39 seconds. Now, a straight drive through where you don't stop with the team takes 23 seconds. So, it's about an extra 16 or so to switch one tyre. And I was reminded at the start of the race, actually, by Alex Capadia that in a season, you get what are called joker tyres, four joker tyres for the season, so that you can use an extra tyre effectively, additional to your allocation, if you do get a slow puncture, which we think uh, is what Cool Racing have just suffered from. So one of those joker tyres used up because of that. Down into turn five goes the number 11 car that now leads the LMP3 category for Jerome de saint but he has not yet stopped, nor has the car behind him on the road, horse Fe uh, Febelmeyer Jr. for the RLRM Sport Gang, number 15. So once they do come in to make their stops, it should still be this car, CR Cruz, at the head of the field. Yeah, the 13 car, by the way, not one of the long stops for them, so they've still got two long stops to go. But it was a relatively slow, quick stop, if you see what I mean. Yeah, it took tyres in that stop as well. Yeah, if you're not going to do a minute 45 in the pits, you have to make it work. Well, you know, you have to really go some to be as quick as possible. Here's the battle still between Proton Competition in fourth for Michael Fassbender, Giacomo Petrobelli to the inside line. And uh, these two have already made contact, remember, resulting in a spin for the German. So uh, he gives him a wide berth this time for Petrobelli to get by. Fassbender not as consistently quick in this second stint. So not the heat and the fatigue is paying, paying a part here. He's less experienced a racer than Armand Al Harty, for instance, who's managed this time to deal with the 93 car rather more easily. And now, oh, and there's, uh, that's Fassbender going backwards in the background to spin for Michael Fassbender. From fourth, well, now fifth position, and he's going to lose even more places now. That must have happened at turn seven then. And uh, we know that the 93 crew put new, well, put different tyres on that car. The two car was in trouble there as well. Were they new tyres? Possibly unlikely. So here we go on board with Fassbender. Was there contact? I think he just dropped a wheel on the dirt, in fact, on the run into turn seven. 
Yeah, you can see the front, that front bodywork is becoming a big problem as well. Yeah. I think we're going to see that car on pit lane. We're going to have to, because if he doesn't come in, that's now at a point where that's going to see the mechanical flag. The so-called meatball flag will be deployed, I'm sure, because that is not in good shape. And unfortunately, the incident that's this body weren't ready for 93. There you go. Not this time. Well, there's always a danger of that bodywork completely parting company from the car, and then you've got either bodywork on the track or, worse, it hits a, a car behind. So you can understand the reason why we might see the mechanical warning flag in a moment or two. But uh, they obviously think that more stuff needs changing on this Porsche because that was the floor, wasn't it? That was, it was the, front the front floor. splitter. Yeah. Give an idea of what can happen when these things come uh, uh, awry. We commentated earlier this weekend, Johnny, on a Carrera Cup race involving... Uh, Horst Felbermeyer Jr.'s son, Horst Felix yeah. Felbermeyer, lost a front tyre. We'll come back to that after taking some time for highlights the first hour of this race, Johnny. Plenty of highlights to this point. We got underway at quarter to midday this morning under bright sunshine and uh, very quickly indeed, Sally Jolic in the Racing Team Turkey car got stuck in trying to take the overall race lead from Julian Canal. He did gain one spot on Nicholas Cruton but couldn't get underneath the man from Le Mans, Canal, who led in the opening phase. But look out for the pink Ferrari. Then in a moment we'll get a side swipe from Freddie Hunt in the Euro International car. Freddie Freddie himself was trying to avoid uh, the slower Jim Maguire United Order Sports machine and further around the road, I think Jean Ludovic Foubert spins on his own and the after effect sadly claims Jim Maguire who had nowhere to go. Foubert was sideways in the second part of turn three and eventually got T-boned by the number three United Order Sports car. The sorry state of three very badly damaged cars, a uh, LMP3 and, and GT graveyard building up very quickly in the first lap of the race. We were then into 15 minutes of safety car, but when we got going again to the inside for the GT lead went Ahmed Al Harty, but he overcooked matters, ran out of road and almost into the gravel. Big, big lock up though for that set of Goodyear Eagles that he would have to nurse to the end of the stint. Petrobelli very nearly made contact with the Omani as well as he worked his way through turn 10. And this was the moment when Prima Racing took the race lead from Paris, Ferdinand Habsburg judging the traffic more efficiently than uh, Julien Canal and uh, managed to get ahead of the Frenchman. Frantically, lights flashing from the cool racing car of Nicholas Cruton, working his way through LMP3 traffic. And this, some contact, a bit naughty from Jacobo uh, Petrobelli. There was a double kiss, in fact, but the first nerfed the Irish-German actor around on the approach to the chicane, and Petrobelli scampered his way away from the scene, having gained the spot. Uh, meanwhile, Proton Competition were able to say, well, we needed to pit the car anyway. There it is again in slow motion, and Fassbender got a, a double thump for his trouble. Big bright red arrow on the screen inside to say there's a Ferrari there Michael but what else can you do it, it was Fassbender's corner and uh, Petrobelli well he's uh, certainly wasted no time at all in getting up the order in the JMW Motorsport car and some very neat and tidy passes apart from that one meanwhile on the back of the 69 Aston Martin there was a spin for Josh Cagill, who had already lost the LMP3 lead by this point to CR Cruz for Inter-Europol competition. And Cagill, I think, maybe stalled the car as uh, Charles Cruz came in to get his fuel for the LMP3 lead, stayed on board the car and still is, in fact, out front. The race is led overall, though, by Ferdinand Habsburg for Prima Racing. Damage now, back as well. to live action. We've got damage for the Ar Ahmed Al Harty driven Aston Martin. So he is in much, much earlier than expected. Where has that damage come? Big time on the nose of the car. Indeed, and that is going to have to be fixed. Is that a tyre? It's a puncture, I think, which has caused all of this damage. No, no. it's not. Beg your pardon. He so it's something or somebody, hasn't yeah. he? By the way, Johnny, he's been watching this, uh, this underway. Let's see what happens here. The Donny's going to go out. They're doing all four tyres first. I'm not, I think that's just happened. Well, we were 
reviewing what had happened in the, the first hour of the race, and there was plenty for the highlights package. And back to live action, all of a sudden, a very dog-eared Aston Martin appears on pit lane. And remember, this is one of the key players on for a podium before that happened. Just in a great team car. And, oh, it's trouble for the 28 as well, and that's had an impact. So not is a that... lot left of the nose of the 28 Edex Sport car, and that is buried deep in the gravel. Turn, turn one. one. Now, is that part of the same issue? Did that? Has that has been a separate issue? If that happened at turn one, it clearly isn't the same issue. Uh, while we watching these pictures, by the way, we saw again that incident between the uh, Petrobelli car and 93. Part of the impact was in the area of that bodywork. That car's been in the barrier at uh, the yeah, entry to turn one. That's happened by himself. But Petrobelli did hit the 93 at the point where that uh, bodywork is fixed on the 93. That is desperate luck for the uh, 28 crew. Winners last time out, remember. Looks unlikely to be repeated this time. And it's a weird moment for Edex Sport. Paul Lafargue uh, was well into his second stint. Now, whether that is because the tyres were getting pretty second-hand and he's made an error on the braking, there didn't seem to be a car anywhere near him as we caught the back end of the replay. Whether he's had a side swipe from uh, another LMP2 car, not sure. Course, it was Duncan Tappy who was ahead of him, seconds. and the decision from the race director is a full course yellow that yeah. we will go to into in, in the next 15 seconds. As Fires Ramsey Fires makes clear to all Ten, of the team, here's nine, the countdown into eight, the first full seven, course yellow six, of the race. Five, four, three, two, one. Full course yellow deployed, full course yellow deployed. Please be aware we have Marshall's crew working at T1. We have Marshall's crew and recovery vehicles working at T1. And full course yellow does not automatically close the pit lane. No, you can not. make a stop here, so this can definitely be utilised possibly to the advantage of one or two teams. They'll, I'm sure, choose to put a bit of fuel in if you can get to the pit lane in time. Now, generally, full course yellows are kept out for two laps, regardless of how long the incident takes to clear up. And our first taker is the Duquesne, number 30, still with Memo Rojas at the wheel, from coming sixth. in from sixth and also from Just seventh, Matthias Kaiser. I mean, it had already happened by that point, it but it's obviously slapped the concrete wall to drivers left. What happened to cause that? And uh, departed at high speed. I just wonder whether he's caught a bump in the braking area and it speared him off straight into the wall. We saw that happen a few times at Monza from very high speed down to the chicane. Paul Lafargue uh, is a silver-rated driver. I'm not saying, you know, that's the cause of it, but they, those drivers are less experienced about dealing with a big, big moment like that. So in comes the race leader, Ferdy Habsburg is out of the car, a driver change there. We've had, by the way, just before this caution came out, completion of the first round of LMP3 stops. So the last of those, the 11 Euro International car, didn't they stretch the envelope almost an hour and a half on fuel for the number 13 car, albeit with a uh, safety car. Julian Canal finally climbs out to the number 65 car. So first driver change for the Panis Racing car from second place, also in cool racing for third. We'll wait and see whether or not Pietro Filipaldi comes in too. He surely will. It'll take a little wee while to recover that uh, Edex Sport car. Cars in and out all over the place. Yeah, plenty of them, as when, you say. When it all comes down, some interesting numbers from what's been going on with LMP3 stops. We'll come to that. So the top three overall are in. Lorenzo Colombo, the new driver at Prema, who will take the lead. But Julian Canal in 65 in. Nicholas Cruton, 37 in. Pietro Fittipoli Poldi for a second stop is in as we head to the Aston Martin world. Now TF Sport to catch up with Hayley. I'm down here in the TF Sport garage, joined by Marco Sorensen, who's going to kind of give us more, more clarity as to what is currently happening. Uh, now, what was the damage? And it was down to contact with another car during a fight, if I'm correct. Yeah, exactly. Uh, to be fair, we got off a little bit uh, of a bad, a bad start, so uh, Ahmed, he had to kind of fight his way up again. Uh, and he got past some of the cars, uh, and then he came to the, the Kessel car. 
uh, and um, he have, yeah, we, we didn't see it on the replay, but he had a contact with him while he tried to over, overtake. Uh, so yeah, it uh, did quite a bit of damage on the on the front. So it damaged the front splitter and some and some bodywork. But yeah, we'll probably make it out again. But it looks like it's uh, our race kind of uh, over and out. Well, I hope you get to make it out, Marco. Yeah, I, well, just to get a, a little bit of driving in at least. <laughs> so, but it's a bit of a shame because I think. Uh, from Monza, where we didn't have the pace, to here, where we're actually in the fight, uh, it would have been nice to obviously we need it. We need the points, so I think we'll be lucky if we get some some points. But let's let's see. But I mean, overall, the pace is there. You know, the car's looking good. You did great in free practice. Uh, Ahmed got a um, pole uh, here in Barcelona as well. Is you know for the second time this year. Yeah, that's also what I said yesterday that he is the goat in these uh, in these qualifying but Unfortunately, you know, you, you have to finish the races uh, high up to get the points, obviously. So we are, yeah, it's, it's in a bad position to be in. So we can hope that the cars around us in the championship are going to go or not get so many points. So we still have a chance the rest of the season, you know. So but it's always a, a playing game. It's always a gamble. All right, thank you very much, Marco. Thank you. So the Aston Martin and Ahmed Alhati making contact, we think, with Takeshi Kimura's 57 Kessel Racing car. Is that damaged as a result well, as well? Still running in fifth place. We'll catch you with that. Two other points of interest, by the way. We've got a quick shot of the Iron Links garage as the remains of the 28 car makes its way back. Now, that shows us all four wheels on the wagon. We saw some pretty aggressive attempt to clear gravel and maybe even to shake some of the debris clear, which seems to indicate nothing vital broke on that car before for the impact. So how on earth did he lose it in a straight line? Well, it's braking. I mean, that, that was in the braking area, as I say. It happened several times at Monza as well. Uh, if you hit a bump, the, the car yeah. just goes left or right, and uh, a number of a number of them did at Monza into the first UK. Brand new front to the Aston Martin. You wouldn't have known it had been involved in an accident, apart from that rather large segment of uh, tape, which joins the new bodywork to the old. I should say, as a wounded warrior myself, actually having a large section of tape in a vital area, just get a tape anything away from the aesthetics certainly not i would wholeheartedly agree with that um so yes they have uh, bandaged up oh, oh and a bit of bodywork now appeals away from the edex sport car but a bandaged up, bandaged up omar racing by tf sport aston martin the same will have to be done for this car but it'll be take the whole nose section off and fit a new one as long as the edex have a spare Yes, and uh, hope that there's been no internal damage done to suspension or indeed braking systems. It's got to be quite careful there because the damage is such that what you don't want is that to break off and jam under the wheels. Uh, Toyota Kazoo Racing at Sebring found out what happens when that uh, occurs. No brakes, no steering. But uh, it's going to make it back to the pit stall. That car will rejoin the race, albeit heavily delayed now. Where does that leave us, Johnny? Well, it leaves us with Prima Racing having put Lorenzo Colombo in the car, leading the race from Cool Racing's Nick Croyton. Nico Jaman runs third for Panis Racing, and we've just seen pit stops from the 43 interior pole competition with DHH. David Heimann Hansen introduced the race for the very first time. Tom Campbell is now aboard the 22 for United Autosports, and another addition, by the way, the late addition to the grid here, uh, Duquesne team's 30 car out in sixth place with locally based Dane and his Fjord back guesting for the team here. So he will go to work. Tyres are going to be changed first and then they'll remove that bodywork. Just check underneath to see if there's anything further that is an issue here. And hopefully from their perspective it will be because that's the bit that flew off in the run down to the chicane. It's a new door for the 60 car. Interesting, right, so was the contact made at the chicane, therefore, and was it nose of Aston Martin into the side of the Ferrari as the but, Ferrari is trying not, to turn left? But that's not the Ferrari they said, but did they confuse oh, no, it with the 60? Good point. Seconds to remove yes, did we think, yellow. yeah, did they think it was Kessel when it was actually the 60, uh, yeah. also with a similar livery? Now, we saw some spirited discussions with Andrea Piccini. to remove full course yellow, 20 seconds to remove full course yellow. There was the car guy car. Does that look to be any damage? Yeah, we only caught a, a bit of uh, that car through frame there. Well, we'll have a look at Here's that. Here's the count out Seven, of the full course yellow. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Full course yellow removed. Full course yellow removed. 
So we're back to racing again, an hour and 33 done, two hours and 27 minutes still to go of the fourth race of the season of the European Le Mans series, live from Barcelona. 28 is back out into the race, as we've seen, so too is the number 69, albeit right at the back of the field, number 60, Matteo Crisoni, that car back in too. So at this stage, despite all those dramas, the only cars we've lost, we lost on that one. Yeah, amazing. So, yeah, uh, the attritional rate, which seemed very, very high for the level of laps we had completed, has thankfully tailed off now. And uh, let's hope that we can get certainly well north of 30 cars to the finish. Started with 39, 36 still racing round, although at different phases of their, of their race, unfortunately, with some having lost a, a number of laps, namely the 69 Aston Martin in the pit lane. Latest regarding the number 19 Algarve Pro car that started from the pit lane. Sophia Flush took that over from Bent Fiscal in one of the pit... Was that the first pit stop that they did a driver change in car number 19? Uh, Possibly the, the second, second stop yeah, for yeah. car 19. But it is now making ground in LMP2. Obviously, a full course yellow doesn't help them out as much as a safety car would have done. But the number 19 car is up to 14th position. On board with the 13 Inter Europol competition car that leads the LMP3 class. And out of the number 93 Porsche, Michael Fassbender will climb. So the Proton competition car still in pit lane with uh, either Zach Robichon, who we were hearing from a moment or two ago, with Haley or Richard Leitz to take it over. I would guess the Canadian because they'll be holding Leitz back for the closing stages. Here comes Christian Reed out of the final corner and over the control line to tick off another lap for the class-leading Proton competition, Porsche. Yeah, and still aboard that car, Christian Reed, Giacomo Petrobelli, so it's the way back uh, now. I did say we take an opportunity to talk a little bit about this uh, first phase of pit stops in the LMP3 category. Uh, some real differences in the pit stop times for those cars. We've had one, two, three, five of the cars now that have burned one of those long pit stops. But for the short pit stops, Johnny, the difference there is pretty radical as well. The longest of the short pit stops, if you forgive me that indulgence, 79 seconds. The shortest, 57. Wow, OK. So uh, what is that? Uh, it's uh, 13 seconds different, even doing it as quick as you possibly can. Out of turn three goes the squabbling LMP2 battle car 37 trying to get by the lap 31, so that's not for position. Second place for Nicola Lapierre, putting a further lap on Time and Van der Helm, who's now in the wheel of the TDS racing by Valiant car. So race control saying the incident between 69 and 57. Um, is, and I'm looking at that car, there is no damage that I can see to the 57 car unless it just meant that it pitched Ahmed Al Hati into a wall somewhere. True. Just uh, the shape of the damage on the front of Ahmed's car, as in all of it on the front right, would have suggested to me a T-bone into the left side of, a, of another car, and that was, the, that was the correct side of the door replacement on car 60 as 60, well. But, yeah. Um, yeah. OK, well, we'll wait and see. They will get to the bottom of that. They've got very many more camera angles than we have at our disposal within race control. Indeed, they do. This is battle not for this is track position, but not for race position. This is 65 in the hands of Nico Shaman, our pole sitter, remember, looking to get by the 31, which is now in the hands of Timon van der Helm. It is not on the lead lap. Now, Time and van der Helm taking over after Philippe Chimidomo did the opening stint. Chimidomo is a bronze-rated driver. Uh, there were, a few, a few years ago in ELMS, uh, the days where bronze drivers weren't permitted to race in LMP2. That changed, though, with the introduction of the Pro-Am category. So the focus for TDS by Vaillant is certainly to try and finish on the podium within Pro-Am. They are currently second within that subcategory. And Timon van der Helm can pedal these cars very swiftly indeed. He's a silver up against Charlie Eastwood, who's the new driver in the racing team Turkey car. Charlie, the Irishman, a gold. 
So he is currently ninth overall, but leading the Pro-Am division. We're focusing on the battle involving Nicolas Lapierre and Nico Jama, the two guys from France, the two Nicos. Very, very rapid, as Jama particularly proved yesterday, bagging pole position at the death of a 10-minute session. So they're running second and third, and essentially behind Lorenzo Colombo, who leads the motor race by nearly 14 seconds. Going to go down to Edex Sport, who've been in the wars of late. Here's Hayley. I'm down here in the Idex Sport garage, joined by team manager Nick Manassian. Now, Paul Lafarg just pulled, uh, just came in after his stint. He had he came off into the gravel. There was extensive damage to the front of the car. Can you tell us what happened exactly? Uh, it's, uh, it's very simple, you know. He's, um, he made a mistake under the braking. He lost the car. And, uh, and he got stuck in the gravel. So, you know, uh, he's, uh, he's very um, devastated, you know, because, you know, when you make a mistake, you, you, you feel the weight. But what can you say? Racing is like this sometimes. Uh, he, he was driving very well. His pace was very good. Uh, we were all on target with everything. But uh, sometimes racing can be like this. And, uh, you know, his staff out there. The track is pretty slippery. And there was a mistake, and that was it. So, as team manager, how do you manage the team for the rest of the, le of the race? How, how do you approach the rest of the race? You know, we keep going. You know, I think he's, uh, he's, he's, we are a team. We're not an he's not individual. You know, so we need to keep pushing, keep doing what we do best, uh, trying to grab what we can grab. I think there is point to get maybe. Um, Pit stop needs to be uh, good. I think we did a very good, uh, very proud of the guy. The way they've changed the, the wheel, changed the front block very fast. We practice a lot with this. You need to keep at it because it's an endurance and you don't know what can happen. So you've really found your form recently. Idex Sport winning in Monza and also you know, Paul Lou doing fantastically during free practice. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's good to see that we are there, you know. Uh, we are, we're proving that we have a strong team, we have a, a fast car, a good pit stop, and, uh, and we're there. So it's competitive out there. So when you are in the top five, you are happy. Great. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you. Well, it was a win last time out. They finished fourth at the start of the race. They've always been in the top five, but it's looking like that will be unlikely in the fourth race of the season. A certain Patrick Pile, though, has taken the car over, and we were suggesting there might be some damage on that machine. Well, Graham? Uh, no. Uh, he's just on the fastest lap of the race. Oh, there we go. 7, 5, 3, 6. Uh, interesting moments here, by the way, in LMP2, as we see from the rear of the 93 car, uh, with Ricard Leitz and uh, LMP2 cars all around him here. It's like uh, something out of a war movie right now. And the interesting part of it is we've got the battle for second position overall interspersed with the battle for the lead in LMP2 Pro-Am, which is actually the battle for ninth overall. Yeah. So this is cool racing um, with Nico Lapierre fending off Nico Jamin battle of the Nikos, and then you've got Charlie Eastwood ahead of this pair, and he's been chased uh, by the TDS rated by violent car of Timon van der Helm. Uh, they're just a couple of seconds apart as well, so all sorts kicking off at the moment. Uh, so, one, of, one of my uh, screens in front of me, I think it's showing Robbie Kerr at Cool Racing, who is a driver coach this weekend. Oh, is he? Uh, so, uh, I understand uh, from one of your colleagues that's what he's doing, yes. Fellow Leicestershire-based David Lord, who's uh, taking many photographs this weekend. So good to see Robbie back in a paddock. I want to see whether we can get him into an LMP2 car at some stage so as well. One would presume he's looking after Nick Croyton then. Well, because Nick and he are sitting together, but I'm aware that our viewers aren't actually seeing that screen right yeah. now, but it is uh, nevertheless, that's definitely Robbie of, uh, well, so much fame in the past. I remember being a spectator at Brands Hatch something like 15 years ago, watching him win the very first they won Grand Prix race oh, around the Grand Prix always circuit. Always struck there. me as a driver, another of those drivers that never quite got the opportunities his talents deserved. Agreed. Robbie Kerr. But, but, uh, um, he's, he's not done a great deal of ACO rules racing through the years, so uh, that would be great to um, get him back again. First years of the FIA World Endurance Championship, I notice, with a couple of races, but that Sig was a long time ago. Sig first significant penalty has been added. It's a five-second penalty added to both the pole-setting car and the 34 for not respecting the position at the start. Now, 
that's going to take some explaining for why the pole position car gets that. So that needs to be taken into account. The 65 currently running third and the leading car in uh, the LMP2 Pro-Am class, the Racing Team Turkey car. So that effectively has just cost the, the 34 car its current lead. Yeah, very interesting indeed. To my mind, when you're the pole sitter, you dictate the pace to a certain degree. However, did Julien go too early? Did he start to hit the throttle before the red lights had been extinguished? Because remember, there was massive pressure from behind from Sally Yolich. Was he on the wrong side of the track? Let's have a look at the qualification sheet and the grid. Well, he, he needed to be on the right. So, side uh, by side here. Indeed. This is Diego Alessi under pressure from one Matteo Griffoni. Griffin. And the two of those with the 69 car behind of Johnny Adam. Now that, I think, was a cut. It's the lap down, though, isn't it? On the, it is because of the repairs required to the 69 car. Yeah. And a P3 car, the number six car in the midst of that lot. What it might have been, just thinking about it, is that the, in the driver's briefing, uh, hang on a bit, there's been a correction. Car 65 and 34 have five seconds added to the next pit stop for right. Oleg, being out of position at the start. Right, so yes, uh, if it had been later on in the race, they would have added it to the race time, but there's yeah. a chance to soak it up there. Very busy coming out of turn four, going either side of the number 17 LMP3 car, and that's uh, the, well, the cool racing car having to lap its uh, baby sister, if you like, in the... Uh, alternative prototype class and Lapierre just about able to keep Jamin behind. This is great stuff. But these two can read traffic like the back of their hands and a, a fabulous manoeuvre around the outside for one, the inside of the other coming out of four and basically the same amount of time it took through sectors one and two. More LMP3 traffic to deal with as the correction that we've already mentioned reaches the top of your screens now as well. Uh, hearing from our friend and colleague Jens Jensen in the press room, they didn't drive over the starting boxes, they drove yeah. down the middle of yeah. the track. Trouble for gonna, two. That was going to be my suggestion. We'll deal with this issue, though, for car number two, first of all. Josh Cagill off the road again. Remember, he's had a spin, and uh, there's damage to the rear of that car as well. I wonder whether one of the bullets has now come off the back of that it's car. It's not come off. It's gone 90 degrees Trading. to true. Yeah. Well, even that... Yeah, because it, it, look at it almost oh, dragging the wall. through the gravel. He hit the wall, that's that, what yeah, did the damage. That's finished it off. And the bullet has to be firmly attached. By bullet, I mean that cheese wedge-shaped bodywork that sits immediately behind the rear wheels. The team will have to address that at the next pit stop. Going back to the race start, in the driver's briefing, everybody is told when you are starting the race that you have to be in line with the grid hatchings. You have to be going through the boxes as if it were a standing start. It's just that you don't stop. So, And that's to provide sufficient space to the left and to the right of each of the cars. So clearly, Julian Canard was not left to right in the correct position on the grid. And it's a five-second penalty that has been slapped to both machines, 65 and 34. So, uh, Panis and Racing Team Turkey, those five seconds to be served in the next pit stops. Frantic stuff, isn't it, again? And still, this battle goes on between the two Ferraris. Diego Letty, new addition to the 32 squad. Matt Griffin, not a new addition to the 55 squad. It's... Uh, like that comfy armchair in the corner of Duncan Cameron's living room, part of the furniture. Uh, Matt Griffin. He's been part of this effort with Duncan for as many years as I can remember back. Uh, we are, have got confirmation as to why Iron Lynx changed the door on the 60 car, by the way. That was because of contact, but not with the Aston Martin 69. Overlap again here. To the inside line then for Matt Griffin, trying to get third position away from Diego Alessi, and on the brakes, confirmed into turn number seven. Yeah, he'd have enjoyed that, without a shadow of a doubt. Still very much a driven man, Matt Griffin. Super keen on his motorsport, has been from the very start. Enjoyed watching his introduction into GT racing all those years ago in the British GT Championship. Recovered from a very nasty injury in a testing crash. Goodwood came back into British GT Racing, introduced into the Ferrari family, has been a firm part of it ever since. Super bloke. 
Diego Alessi, who is just overtaken, actually a long pause in motorsport from 2016 to this season when he's been doing some GT2 competition. But this, I reckon, is an ACO rules debut for the 50-year-old Italian. Diego, I seem to remember being a very early um, proponent of GT3 racing. And if I'm right, that was in Corvettes back in the day. Quite possibly so. Um, yeah. Have to search back through uh, all of the archive. Yeah, it's dirt. certainly 2009. He was in Corvettes that season, and a former champion in the ADAC GT Masters in Germany as well with Callaway yep, competition. Corvette. Yep. Meantime, 10th and 11th for Timon van der Helm. Tucked in behind is the Rapid Dane Nicholas Nielsen in the bright metallic silver this is AF Corsa car. So the battle for the lead for the moment, although that will change with that five-second penalty, is over in LMP2 Pro-Am. This is the battle for second, but de facto the battle for the lead after the next pit stops if uh, Johnny Eastwood can't escape the clutches of this pairing. Indeed. Yep, so uh, lots on this. He might kind of dismiss the battle for being in the lower reaches of the top ten and think, well, they're having fun, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, correct that for sure, because there is a second podium, remember, in the ELMS in LMP2 for the Pro-Am driver combination. So the equipment used, the cars are all the same, but if you've got a bronze in your trio, then you are entered into Pro-Am, and this is the fight for second and third within that. Battles everywhere once again. Once again, this European Le Mans series this season is delivering the action up and down the field. Lorenzo Colombo, though, relatively untroubled, 19 seconds to the good, still ahead of Nico Lapierre, who still has Nico Chaman welded to his mirrors. Cool racing from Panis Racing. In comes the number 77 car from the lead of the race in GTE. That means that uh, Giacomo Petrobelli goes through and into the GT lead. It's a finally a driver change for that car. So Petrobelli leading from Matt Griffin by just under 14 seconds. And uh, yeah, we will wait for the next lot of pit stops. Takeshi Kimura in distress, actually. Yeah, uh, after a, a, a brutal couple of stints and uh, obviously taking on liquids, but you don't want to do that too swiftly. So just taking a moment to chill out a little bit. It's very difficult to do that, though, because the garage itself is so, so warm. He but is able to head over to a timing screen, so he's still very yes, concerned absolutely. about where his car is. Uh, and the 57 car may be suffering from a little bit of damage, although it's not visible. Frederick Scharndorf has taken that car over and has fed back in to eighth position. Ask anybody that's done this professionally or as an enthusiastic amateur, this is an athletic sport, trust me. <laughs> and in the heat we've got here today, Johnny Palmer, uh, never more so. Track temperature yesterday within the 50s. Yeah. And it is so easy, as we witness cars, you know, almost seamlessly going through corners, braking, accelerating, to think that these cars are on rails. It just shows from a Paul Lafargue incident down at Turn 1 how close, how perilously close they are to disaster Ragged at edge. virtually every corner. Absolutely. And I don't think that's necessarily portrayed through television. Sometimes when you go to a racetrack live, as I'm sure some of you are, and maybe re-watching this race at a later date, you realise then the rate of speed that some of these cars are arriving into the really quick corners and it is so easy to make the smallest of errors which can result in massive disaster but Takeshi Kimura a bronze rated driver we must remember from Japan started racing only in 2017 seriously to the inside line Nicholas Nielsen a few moments ago to finally get ahead of time and van der Helm to give him second position in the Pro-Am division in P2. Little bit of a hip check but uh, that looked reasonable fair. Still, this battle for second place underway. What a cracker this has been. Nico Lapierre, Nico Jama. Fascinating to me again that uh, Lapierre, though, has a moment to, if not warm tyres, at least he's cleaning them on the run into turn number one, zigzagging from left to right. That is also to sow the seed of doubt, I suppose, into Nico Jama's mind. But it takes a lot more than that to throw the man from Rouen off his rhythm. 
down into turn five will go this fight for second and third overall. The race is still led by Prema Racing and Lorenzo Colombo. Interesting moments here as they try to get by two other LMP2 cars, putting a lap on the BHK car and ahead the Virage team car. Could this be the moment with faster laps traffic that Nico Schaumann finds his moments? P3 cars in the mix as well, DKR and the number two car. BHK up the inside, up the inside again from the Kill Racing car. Have they realised there's fast traffic coming here? Schaumann. Here comes Schaumann to the inside and Lapierre cannot hold him back, so he's plugging the gap, although Lapierre, the wider line, gives him the better exit out of the corner. Unbelievable stuff there. And Schaumann, because he was tight to the white line, couldn't accelerate. They are two abreast now into the chicane. Surely you can't fit all these prototypes through the chicane at once. And no, Schaumann had to take to the escape route oh. there. Oh. Feeds back into third and a prototype car two from P3 somehow made the pit lane. Absolutely staggering stuff. <laughs> Lap, yeah, heads up stuff there. Damage, uh, damage, damage, damage to Lapierre's car. I don't think that's from Jaman. That must have been through well, the traffic. I Julian did... Canal has just spotted that as well. Didn't see him hit it. So what has he done there? Caught maybe the BHK car that sits in front? I don't think there was contact, as I say, with the car that he was battling with, Nico Jama. Well, it'd be good to see that, uh, that progression through the chicane again, but that is significant damage to the front of the 37 car. Can he make it through to the next pit stop without too much of a loss in performance? Yeah, that will be affecting the balance of the car, though, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the tyre rub is concerning for me as well, as now he tries to get the overlap on the Rinaldi Ferrari, driven by Diego Alessi. Alessi has seen him from a long way back. Alessi running third in the GTE category, behind Matt Griffin and behind the race leader, Jacobo Petrobelli. So it's all about the Ferraris in GTE right now, isn't it? First, second and third. So that was Julian Canal's reaction to the damage on the front of the 37 car. And they're trying to work out where that came from. They're trying to work out if it's his car. His car, <laughs> yeah. It's already happened on the main street, yes. so it has to have occurred in the chicane. Or the run out of the chicane into turn 12, perhaps. What Cool Racing will be trying to work out here is it's risk against reward, or lack of reward, if you like, here. They're not a million miles out of a fuel wing, though, here. No, no. When I said turn 12, I meant turn 16. We didn't see the cars go through no. the final corner at 16. So has Lapierre tripped over a slower car there? Or did it all happen in the chicane? There was a great deal happening. Look at the tyre rub here, Graham. Yeah. There's a lot of smoke coming from that front right corner. And is the tyre going to go earlier than the bodywork, if you like? It depends how much pressure is uh, involved, but of course, when the downforce is at its maximum, the car's at its maximum speed, that's where yeah. the bodywork's being pushed onto the tyre and stressing the sidewall like crazy. You see, they're still not by the BHK car. Well, it's been two laps doubt. now. Yeah, indeed. Who's uh, driving the BHK car right now? It is Sergio Campana, who's, who is the gold, so I'm not surprised by that. Turning through the corner where the, the wheel is rotating underneath the skin as well. It's going to add further stress. How far do Cool Racing push this, or do they say that's enough and get the car back in? Let's have a word with the man we spotted on the camera a moment or two ago, Julian Canal with Hayley. I'm joined here by Julian Canal, but I can't take my eyes, as you can, off the screen because there's a big battle for going on for second with your very own Nicolas Jamin, who's currently in third, and Nicolas Lapierre up there. What's it like to watch that kind of battle? For sure, it was. Um crazy start for me. I have uh, I had a big gap uh, with the, all uh, of the guys in, in, uh, behind me, so I can take uh, take a long distance from them. After we have a safety car, that safety car pack everyone, and after I take again a gap. But uh, Ferdinand Habsburg have, uh, for me, I have a good traffic. It's a he's a bit uh, faster than me, so I try to to stay with him. But it was quite difficult. And after I was in a good rhythm, I told me that I am nearly in his time as well. And after that, we had um, like an incident with Scruten. I'm sorry, but we went together to break really late and I lose the front. So we didn't touch his soldier, but uh, I have a penalty, I think, of five seconds. But, you know, going back to your stint, it was a great first stint. Unfortunately, he did get a penalty of five seconds for that start. He, 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 he got the penalty, Scruten. 
me, I get the penalty. Yeah, for five seconds in the next stop. Okay, so that's going to be going. That'll be at the pit, during the pit stop. I think we will do at the next stop. I saw that with the um, cool car, they damage the front. So I think it could be a great battle for the end of the race. Okay, Palace Racing, your last victory was in Monza this year. You're showing some great form here in Barcelona. I mean, you're looking hopeful for the rest of the race. We are quite confident because we work a lot on the car this week uh, on the car for the race. It's a quite a surprise that we did the pole. So I think our car in the, the two stint is really, really consistent. So we have a great, uh, good chance to make the podium uh, this weekend. And hopefully the victory, but we cross finger. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, it's been about a year since their last victory in the championship. Monza 2021, which was held, I think, in August. It was a long time ago now, but anyway, it would be great. To, it was actually early July 2021, so a little over a year now since they've tasted the champagne on the top step of the podium. Something lost in translation there as far as Julian Canal and his understanding of why he's got the penalty. There was a mention of contact with car 10, I think he said. It's definitely for the start, and yes. him being in the, in the incorrect position left to right over the grid hatchings at the start of the race. Uh, Nicolapia, I think they're trying to shake loose any of that uh, dragging bodywork. Uh, it's certainly nothing to do with, his, with the state of his tyres at the moment. He's going to be very soon into his fueling window, and as uh, we're reminded, the 65 car is going to have to burn an extra five seconds in that same fueling window. So it really is a matter of how quickly the 37 crew can change that nose. So far, I have to say that front right on Nicolas Lapierre's car is standing up to the test. They build these tyres very toughly indeed at uh, Goodyear's headquarters. Very competitive lap times yeah. from Lapierre right now. This and is... obviously, you know, you, you would definitely want Lapierre behind the wheel of the car to judge how it's behaving, how, it, how it's altered it, the setup. And if he can just feel generally the movement of the tyre is OK, um, he'll probably be saying to the team, we can stay out with this despite what looks like pretty bad damage from a visual perspective. Very close for sixth and seventh in GTE. The Proton Competition Porsche now driven by Ricard Leitz ahead of Frederick Schandorf, who's really keeping the Austrian honest. We're about to see the introduction here. We are of Melty Jakobsen to the 17 car. Stand Six. back, everybody, stand back. Yep. Sixth place, uh, the car comes in from with Mikey Benham. Two hours to go. So, Schandorf getting very racy with Ricard Leitz. Leitz, not very polite, won't, let you, won't just let him by here. I can't understand that. No. You know, a, lo a long service member in ACO Rules Racing, Ricard Leitz. He was involved in the first ever World Endurance Championship season back in 2012, and even further than that in the Le Mans series. Absolutely. And one so, of, one uh, yeah. of the longest serving Porsche. Uh, factory drivers now, Ricard. Still at the top of his game. Absolutely lovely bloke. Um, ideal foil for the programme here with Michael Fassbender. And lots still to be achieved in this race. At the moment, the pendulum has just swung the way of the Ferrari runners. So one, two, three at the moment for Ferrari, although Rinaldi races dear girl Lessie pits as I speak from third place in that class. JMW Motorsport still with Giacomo Petrovelli at the wheel of that car. Matt Griffin runs second. He's five seconds back, and that's trouble for, for the... Now, is that the race leader in P3, or is that the 14 car? I can't tell from that angle. Now, where has it come to a halt? Late on in the lap, it's the 14, 14. car which has stopped, so it's not CR Cruz, crucially. Obviously, that's still a horror show for the sister James car. James Dyson from fifth place. Yeah. Yellow flag at turn 12. So it was still a key player in LMP3. I think that's going to be a full-course yellow there, Johnny, unless they do it under, under local yellows. Car with the rear wheels in the gravel. That's going to be tricky to extract. So yellow flag certainly affecting the exit of 11 and all the way through 12. No overtaking there for the time being. I have to say, if this is a full course yellow at this point, that's a massive get out of jail free card for Palace Racing because they'd be able to pit, take the five seconds under yellow. Excellent point. Side by side there for the 88 and the, uh, the uh, AF Corsa car versus the 35 BHK motorsport machine. Well, Nico Lapierre is picking up time through traffic here, despite that damage. So, yeah, and uh, just starting to drop Nico Jamat. 
to the inside line, car 35, Sergio Campana. 45 seconds for full course yellow. Yep, full course yellow it is, and we are going to see some pit lane action and then some now. So Nicholas Nielsen, who's now taken the Pro-Am lead, by the way, away from Charlie Eastwood. So AF Corsa lead that division from Racing Team Turkey. And in between the two is Sergio Campana. That car, 35, just ahead of the Porsche as they leave turn seven. But a full course yellow about to kick in. In. Full course yellow. Stand by for full course yellow. 15 seconds it is. 10. Here we go. 9, 8, 7. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Full course yellow deployed. Full course yellow deployed. We are working on the track at turn 12. Drivers left. We're working on the track, turn 12. Drivers left. We will have recovery vehicles and marshals. Uh, yeah, you can understand why James Dason cannot leave the scene there. He's tried to ease with the throttle, but all that's done is just dug the rear Michelin's further into the gravel. So beached on the edge of the trap and the hard standing. But when the marshals arrive, they should be able to lift him out of there or indeed push him out of there and he will get going again. But he was, has certainly lost his fifth place, dropping all the way back to, in fact, 10th now in the category LMP3. So Premier Racing lead this race, Johnny, as they have, since the pretty early stages, the number nine car somewhat romping away again uh, from the 37 of Cool Racing. Then Panis Racing, that's the one, two, three. United Auto Sports' Tom Gamble is some little way back then in fourth place into Europe All Competition. David Heimer Hansen now aboard the 43 car, runs fifth. Milner Motorsport, another good position for them after a podium finish last time out. The 21 is in sixth. The 30 Duquesne car, uh, the 88 uh, AF Corsa car, BHK Motorsport, who pit now, and Racing Team Turkey, that is your top 10, with AF Corsa, Racing Team Turkey, and TDS racing by Viant, the top three in LMP2 Pro-Am. In LMP3, it's the other interior pole car, the 13, that leads the way from 360 Racing, who again pit now, top of the hour, an ideal time for an LMP3 car to stay on its pit schedule. Uh, it is Deco Engineering running third, and Euro International's number 10 car running fourth. But remember, of all these classes, LMP3 is the one that can be most heavily affected by pit stop strategy. Who took the long stops first? That will wind out in the final hour. GTE and the two leading cars, JMW Motorsport, Giacomo Petrobelli surely will climb out now. Matt Griffin looked like he was uh, walking away from the 55 car, the top two cars in GTE on pit lane right now. Then it's the 77 Proton Competition car in the hands of Lorenzo Ferrari, Matteo Cressoni in the number 60 Iron Lynx, another great run from them, and Proton Competition's number 93 car, that's your top five in GTE. So we've had just over two hours, 67 laps done in that 120 minutes, and uh, these gaps are a little false because they're under full course yellow, but uh, safe to say, Nicolas Lapierre and Nico Jama are going to be nose to tail as we come out of the full course yellow, unless they take alternate approaches to their pit stops, of course. One maybe decides to do tyres and the other not, but we'll have to wait and see for that. Tom Gamble driving the United Spark car in fourth position, as Graham has mentioned. LMP3 led by CR Cruz. It has been pretty much from the start. Yes, there was that period where Josh Cagill got in front in car number two. But United in the number two car have sort of dropped out of the reckoning for the time being. That's because they will have taken some of their longer stops, but also Cagill had the spin and he had some contact as well. Bailey Voisan now driving that car. And Sean Husbeth rejoining as the GTE class leader for JMW Motorsport now. Ferrari, Ferrari from Porsche because Lorenzo Ferrari uh, in the previous class leading Porsche for Proton. Uh, has just made a stop and uh, is about to rejoin in probably third position. To correct myself, by the way, neither the 34 nor the 65 can take that five-second penalty under a pit stop under yellow. So apologies, my misdirection. I thought that run had changed. It hasn't. So those will wait for the next pit stop cycle.
Yeah, so you can take a standard stop. You can't bolt a time penalty Correct. onto it within a full course yellow, which, to be honest, makes sense to It me. does, absolutely. Uh, a five-second penalty is a five-second penalty at the end of the day, and it needs to be compared to green flag running. A, a, a race right on pit road now between these two that have been duelling for so long, but are they going to change the nose on the cool racing car? There is one ready, yeah. if you see, just in front and behind the Nicolas Lapierre-driven car, so this should put Jamin in front, and it's a great time to change the nose, actually, under full course yellow. Yeah, they'll reduce the delay, won't they? And you would guess that there might well be tyre damage to be fixed front right there away go the cool racing crew to their task it's and not breaking not away firmly away. though is it there you go there we go finally it is off new tire now they change as well. the tire on that corner airline out the way still don't know how lapierre picked up this damage yeah we could see that when we see highlights again it's a bit of a mystery, but uh, thankfully, though, now it has all been straightened out. There's your top three at the bottom of the screen in GTE. Hudspeth for JMW, Duncan Cameron, Spirit of Race, Lorenzo Ferrari, Proton Competition. The gaps are fairly significant in places. Actually, not first to second, though. It's only, it's, it will be less than a second when we get back to green flag running. Bigger gap back to second spot. We're going back, by the way, to green flag running in 30 seconds' time. So this is going to get uh, very hot indeed in all sorts of ways. Back out into the running, by the way. Nico Jamal it is, and Nico Lapierre stays aboard as well. 15 seconds to remove full course yellow. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Full course yellow removed. Full course yellow removed. And the loser with that timing. Oh, no, no, it wasn't. It's just perfect timing. Tom Gamble uh, emerging almost on the tick of the moment the full course yellow came off. We're back to green flag running. This is the battle for the lead in GTE Pro, Johnny. And you're quite right, Sean Hudspeth has Duncan Cameron right with him. How far back is Lorenzo Ferrari? It's a minute back, the 77 car. So it's a significant gaps, but then again, we've got Pro and Am uh, drivers mixed up all the way through this field now. Yeah. Well, Sean Hudspeth, the Singaporean, is silver rated by the FIA. Duncan Cameron, the bronze, but Duncan's got to be one of the quickest bronzes in the race, I would say. So if he can just live with Sean's pace in the early stages, that will be fine. We've had a segment of Matt Griffin, haven't we, in car we 55? Well, remember, we've still got some Miguel Molina to come in the JMW car and yeah. David Perel to come in the 55. So there's some quick drivers still to come. But obviously, Cameron started that car, and clearly he hasn't done sufficient time yet to tick off all of the bronze distance. So he's done an hour and ten minutes in his opening stint, I reckon, and uh, now an, an additional, because he'll probably have to do, I think it's 90 for the bronze in GTE. Which, of course, doesn't sit well with a fueling stint. No, and deliberately so, because a fuel stint is an hour, uh, and you think, oh, right, OK, we'll do an hour of bronze and that's us done. No, you've got to do an extra 30 minutes after that as well. So uh, Matt Griffin wasn't at the wheel of that car for too long, but he will have done enough if the team are happy with that, if Matt's happy with that. He did to just over 50 minutes in total. As you say, Molina still to come in the 66, and David Perel, the South African driver, uh, with a trip to the 55 car, presumably in the closing stages there. As far as the third place Porsche is concerned, number 77, that was started by Christian Reed, and then we've had Lorenzo Ferrari since then. So as yet, uh, no sign of Jimmy Bruni, who they are keeping um, prepared in the wings, raring to go for the closing stint. He's in the traditional cage at the back of the right. garage, being prodded with a stick as I speak. Indeed, snapping at his uh, pit crew and engineers, but they're used to that wouldn't have it any other way, in fact. Uh, out of the 12th corner will go this battle for fifth position. Matteo Cressoni chasing, or rather Alessio Piccariello chasing the Italian. Piccariello with a very Italian-sounding uh, name, but he's from Belgium, in fact, racing with Absolute. And uh, 
had uh, the bonus of going to Le Mans this year, which was unexpected. He was the first reserve, wasn't he, of the absolute racing crew? So uh, Picariello has done long and royal service in Southeast Asia after the Porsche Motorsports Asia Pacific. There he goes. Favourite driver there. Here you go. Through it sweeps and takes the position. Neatly lined up on Chris Oni, who is certainly no slouch, but couldn't hold back Picariello in the all-black Porsche. So Iron Lynx Ferrari overtaken for fifth position in the category. 20 seconds is the gap now for the, the Porsche to attack for Frederick Schandorf in the third of the Ferraris, fourth position. David Heimer Hansen pits now under full green conditions. It does okay. seem a little odd. Indeed, it's the fourth. I wonder if he's got a problem. That's the fourth stop for the 43 car as well. And it's only a three lap stint coming out of the full course yellow, so clearly there is an issue for car number 43. That's the brand new Orica being run by Polish squad into Europol competition. Um, he had done 20 laps prior to the full course yellow being deployed, and then uh, everybody pitted pretty much. Full course yellow in this stage of the race, what the race officials try and do is keep it out for two laps to allow everybody to pit should they wish to. When you're limited to 80 kilometres per hour, it does take a long time if you're just starting a lap and the caution comes out to actually find the pit lane. It's going to be at least sort of five minutes or so before you can actually get into pit road. This is a battle, by the way, between the 31 in the hands of Philippe Cimodomo and Matt Bell. That should only go one way and looks like doing so. Nielsen Racing Car making its way through around the outside to take that position. And that's Matt Bell through into 11th spot. Matt giving Jimmy Domo plenty of room on the inside at turn 13. I can tell you by that, there it is, just about to say the 43 car. I was right, it is a problem in the garage. Rear deck is off. Brand new car, this. And hopefully not new car woes. It's going to be a drive-through penalty, by the way, for the 35 car. That is the BHK Motorsport car running in the top 10, says your Campana, but overtaking under full course yellow. Has been assessed for that. So right. it'll be a drive through penalty for BHK. That is going to cost, uh, I think, three or four positions. Yeah, uh, a big no no overtaking under full course yellow, needless to say. And I'm surprised Campana has been pinged uh, with a man of his level of experience, but nevertheless, have to come in and serve that as quickly as possible. Drive through penalty, point to point, 23 seconds. Obviously, you are still moving, so you don't lose a full 23 compared to a normal lap time. Colombo over the line as the race leader. We haven't spoken a great deal about the 21-year-old from Italy, but he is uh, almost sometimes the forgotten talent in this new team for 2022 from Legano in uh, Italy and uh, silver rated. Started in karting in the mid-2010s and then a season in the Italian F4 third in the championship after a couple of wins and eight podiums and then he's continued on in the single seater ladder but this year broke away from uh, formula three fia formula three to race in both the elms and the world endurance championship it's water being added coolant being added to this car okay so uh, an engine temperature issue perhaps for inter europol competition frantic work on this car that had got up as high as fourth earlier on in the piece, driven expertly well by Pietro Fittipaldi and now by David Heidemeyer Hansen. And after a, a, a faultless 20-lap stint for the Dane, sadly, next time out for him, he only lasted three laps, and the car now having to receive essential service. Well, this car looks like it's heading back out, rear wheels being reapplied. So whatever the issue has been, they seem to think they've got their head around it, but that has cost the 43 car deer. They've been running as, as high as fourth. It's now dropped to the tail of the LMP2 field. Continues to drop whilst this is all going ahead. And as fuel back, who was put into the Duquesne team car uh, fairly recently, running in fifth place ahead of 
young Belgian star Hugo de Vilde for Moulner Motorsport, also a Belgian based uh, really just a stone's throw away from the Spa Francorchamps circuit where we go to next in the European Le Mans series. So Moulner looking forward to a home race. They are about to be lapped though by the race leader Lorenzo Colombo who is getting close in the rear of shot there. That's a mark of the pace of Prima today, isn't it? That uh, this is the race leader with an hour and 42 minutes to go in a four hour race looking to put a lap on the fifth and sixth place cars. Incredible stuff, especially because we've had, you know, that 15 minutes of safety car, then another safety car after that, and a couple of full course yellows as well. So, overtaking opportunity actually taken away from car nine, and even then they've uh, la lapped virtually up to fifth position. They're coming up now in amongst the battling pair for the lead in GTE. So there's your gap, first to sixth, effectively, which is a minute and 39 seconds, virtually a lap time. And to the high side of some of the GT traffic will go Hugo de Vilde. That, I think, was still the fight for... Yeah, it is, the lead in GTE. So Hudspeth and Cameron, nose to tail. Right together, there's the white front of Duncan Cameron's Ferrari. That helped Duncan Cameron somewhat. He's closed a little bit of a gap. A few tenths clawed back with that traffic just holding up Sean Hudspeth through the final complex here in this circuit. As they come over the crest, he moves to the inside, Hudspeth to defend. Here comes one of the... That is the number 19 car, and it's continued, and it's, it, it's the position taken. Yep. All the way around the outside for Duncan Cameron. I didn't think that was possible necessarily in GT cars, but Hudspeth uh, seemed to slow earlier than Cameron. Unsure perhaps of what was going to happen. Oh, oh a little touch there between two LMP3 cars. Car 11 being driven by Louis Rousset for Euro International. And it is a place change as the RLR car awesome loses the spot. Yeah, down to sixth position Previous, for... Yeah. Uh, for uh, Austin McCusker, as you say, yeah. Austin McCusker, previous IMSA prototype challenge champion. And so they thread their way through the chicane at the end of another lap. Still the fluid being poured in to car 43, and now they're just checking to see whether it's going into the right chamber or is it, in fact, escaping out the bottom of the car, which would be a nightmare scenario. Third position for the only Duquesne in the race, by the way. The Duquesne M30 D08, to give it its full name. It still runs with the same spec of Nissan engine that the Ligiers have yep, in the five, middle of them. Yeah, now a 5.6-litre engine, remember? A power boost from 2020 for these cars sound mighty they always have done in fact naturally aspirated power plant from the japanese manufacturer top and wrapper there <laughs> yes not the, not the person just the wrapper she was holding i got what you meant yeah very good uh, car four then running in third position and actually about to overtake the inter europol competition machine because it still sits in the pit lane car uh, 43 for David Heinemeyer Hansen. There is the second place car of Nico Jama rounding turn 16 to complete another lap. Turns Woodward 360 racing up into second place here, just quietly plugging away at this task. It's been a roughly toughly sort of race in LMP3. Number of cars hitting trouble and indeed each other. Said this will unwind again in the final phase of this race as we find out which of these teams have opted to save their rapid pit stop for the very end, that is going to make a 30 to 40 second difference. On board briefly there with Nicholas Pino, who is the talent from Chile in South America, Santiago to be exact, just 17 years old. And again, uh, a prospect from karting only a handful of years ago. He was still karting as late as 2019. Did a season in uh, British F4 with Argenti Motorsport two years ago. And uh, with that, straight into the ELMS in 2021 with a couple of races with this team. And he's now doing a splendid job leading the category. Uh, also punching above his weight, you might say, too try and get pole position yesterday just missed out in the end to Malta Jakobsen we're going to stick with this team though as we head to Hayley Edmonds I'm joined here by Charles Cruz driver for NT Europol uh, now you're currently leading in LMP3 
I'm just caught you after a two two hour ten stint. I've let you have a little cool down. Just take us through it, how it went for you, and just tell us about tire degradation and how you went about managing the tires out there. Now this race is completely about managing the tires right now. We've had to be so disciplined early in the stint to control our pace, and uh, we've relayed that to Nico and uh, Gui. So I was just it's it's quite tempting in the beginning of the stems to do the to do the big lap times but it's better at the end of the day to, to have it at the end of the the hour so just tell us about a lot of battles going on out there you know i kind of get the impression you, you managed to stay stay out of all that yeah it's uh you know all these lms races four hours a lot can happen it's keeping the car clean and uh keeping the dive planes on it which we have most of them but not all of them about yeah, we learned so much in Monza and together as a package we've come together and we're, we're really diving and collecting so so coming off a win in Monza I mean you're really bringing that dynamic and that energy over to here in Barcelona today no absolutely we, we've all sat down and championships the focus the only way we can do that is by winning more races so we expect to be a contender at every single one fantastic thank you very much Charles. thank you well the only trail by uh, 13 points coming mm. into this round, amazingly. It's very, very tightly bunched indeed between Cool Racing, the 17 crew, who uh, are still going in seventh place right now. RLRM Sport with their number five machine, second in the championship, United Order Sports third, and then the 13 car of Charles Cruz. Remember, 77 points still up for grabs at this moment with yeah. the race results from here. Spa, Portimao, and a couple of points apiece, of course, for the last two races. Trouble for the 35 car. And is that on the main straight down towards turn one? Just trying to work out where that car is looking slow. But Sergio Campana. It's a puncture. Right yeah, rear. rear right. And that sent uh, the bodywork out a little bit on the left hand side. It's coming out actually at turn four. So he was running uh, wide coming into the first bit of four. Everyone behind has got to look out, though, as well, because arriving on the scene, three very rapid race cars, including Anders Fjordback, who is in fifth position for Duquesne. Yeah, just keeping an eye on the gaps here. The, the big battles underway at the moment are this battle for the GTE lead. Duncan Cameron doing a fine job here. And Anders Fjordback, you mentioned, they're going to build their right with him for that fifth place between the 30 from Duquesne team and the Milner Motorsport number 21 car. The, that team looking for another cracking result after... Slow car, turn nine. Slow car, turn nine. After that uh, podium Ooh, finish. That's not a nice place to be encountering nine. a slow car because nine is so rapid. Through there goes Nicholas Nielsen and sensible driving from Sergio Campana. He stayed slow off the racing line on slow the run into turn 10. We'll add, by the way, as we see one uh, LMP2, we hope, heading for pit lane here. Uh, the other one that was there has now departed after nine and a half minute delay with that water leak. The 43 into Europol competition car back out and running with David Heinmeier Hansen, but that has dropped them behind the lead Slow battle car, in L and GTE. So, uh, Fires, Ramsey Fires, updating everybody where this car is. There's also white flags from the marshal posts leading into each of the corners are expected. Thankfully, uh, Campana is almost at the end of the, uh, of the lap now and able to pull into pit road. But some hairy moments into the chicane, I'm sure. There's the dice for the GTE lead. Duncan Cameron now ahead of Sean Hudspeth. We saw that happen with the brick going around the outside of the man from Singapore. And uh, remember, Hudspeth, the silver-rated driver, so should have the ability to stay with Duncan Cameron, if not fashion an opportunity to get in front of the bronze-rated British driver from Cheshire, originally in the UK. And he will move now through turns two and three, round the long right-hander at three. That's the one that really kills the rear left tyre on each of these GT cars. Well done, Sergio Campana brings that car back with limited delay and damage. From the puncture, Duncan Cameron again doing well with traffic there. But uh, will not want to be held up by the 34 car. What's happening behind this pair? Renzo Ferrari 27 seconds behind with Frederick Schandorf three and a half seconds back. Alessio Picariello catching both of those two at the moment. But uh, with work still to do. Over an hour and a half still left of this four-hour encounter, Johnny Palmer and there's another phase coming here 
where some of these gaps that look large really are not going to end up being like that. Yeah. Remember, a mix of pro and drivers to come in certainly LMP3 and GTE. It's going to be, by the way, a drive-through penalty for car 32 is the next one on the list. That's for the contact at turn 15 with car 19. That was the Ben Fiscal incident. 32 is the Rinaldi racing car. That was the nerf up the rear, if you remember. Yeah. So that's a drive-through penalty for Rinaldi racing. They are some way back down the field. That is not going to be a major issue for a significant race position. And it'll be limited if absolutely no uh, consolation whatsoever to the 19 car, which, by the way, runs 12th now. Ben Fiscal uh, is ahead of the Team Virage, Edex Sports, BHK cars, as well as the now recovered from its uh, water leak into Europol car. Next targets for the delayed car is going to be uh, Philip Chimadomo. Trouble for the 21 car now. Mulner Motorsports machine is up on the kerb, and uh, this is early on in the lap by the looks of things. Car 21, has that gone through the first sector just yet? Yeah, so it's somewhere in the middle sector for Hugo de Vilda, parked in a very vulnerable position. It's the run, actually, towards turn nine. He does find a forward gear, just though, now, so had to turn the engine off, maybe, quick reset, and got going again. Just looked like it died, didn't it? Bizarrely, yeah. I mean, at the slightly slower speed corner at turn seven, perhaps. Uh, BHK Motorsport, by the way, back out after that uh, puncture, but will be serving a further five seconds in the next pit stop for cutting the chicane. I'm pleased that the, the contact. The race, the, I'm pleased that the contact between Ben Viscal and the Rinaldi Racing Ferrari was confirmed because Ben actually re reported to Algarve Pro Racing. I wasn't hit, and I thought I'm sure categorically there was contact there. And the Rinaldi Racing car, uh, unfortunately, therefore judged to be at fault. It was definitely the GT car nerfing the Algarve Pro car into a spin. There's the race leader at the back of the 93 of Ricard Leitz there. That's the race leader looking to lap the fourth place car now. Yeah. So, despite these relatively short caution periods, but obviously that takes opportunity to close uh, on your rivals, doesn't seem to matter to Prema Racing, who dominated the first two rounds of the championship. They had a sticky day at Monza at the start of last month, but this is back on form now for Prema Racing, a huge name in single-seater motorsport elsewhere within the discipline. So. You know, Formula 2, Formula 3, F4 as well, but Prima joining forces with Iron Lynx, the, who are becoming a, an established name in ACO rules racing, to really uh, provide the link between single-seater racing and endurance motorsport. And it's looking very much like this will be a third win of the season at this stage. However, we still have 90 minutes to go. Yeah, and it's your back not looking in a mood to allow this to happen. Uh, we've got team manager car 64 and car 28 to the race director immediately. 66, by, uh, unfortunately. 66, which is JMW Motorsport. That is because there is a pit stop under investigation for the second place of the car in GTE. 28, don't know. Yeah, strange one, that. But we'll wait and see. Meanwhile, the 14 car, so not the class leader in LMP3, but the car that uh, was doing OK in fifth, but then, unfortunately, James Dayson had a moment at turn 12, left him in the gravel and caused a full-course yellow. And that car rejoining, running in 10th position now, but uh, behind a significant chunk of the GTE entry. The battle of fifth in LMP3 is looking very lively. Euro International versus Cool Racing. Still, Louis Rousset ahead of, actually, now Mal Malta Jakobsen, who, as expected, is making waves through this order. Yep, uh, he has quite a chunk of time to find after he gets, if indeed he gets blessed, uh, Louis Rousset. He's got a further 40 seconds before the next car up the road, which is this fellow Euro International car, the hands of the moment of Glenn Van Berlo. So Jakobsen has got some heavy lifting still to do here. 28 minutes to go. And my guess is we might. Do we have to see Mikey Benham back in the car? 
Uh, I will check that in a moment or two to see how long he's done already. Louis Rousset, relatively inexperienced, but so is the 18-year-old behind him. Rousset's 23, hails from France, but top-level motorsport. Le Mans Cup, a few races this year. Here comes Malta Jakobsen with a better run out of 16 and gets the slingshot on Rousset to dive up the inside. But yes, it's sort of a return to motorsport for the 23-year-old Frenchman. Did some FFSA GT4 racing in his home country, uh, what, four years ago, and back again into motor racing for 2022. And watching the, the lead gap, you know, it, 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 Lorenzo Colombo does look as if he's struggling with that traffic. That lead gap has tumbled. Was 20 seconds, wasn't it? Seven uh, yeah. seconds now yeah. is that lead gap. Yeah, big yeah. difference now. Leaders in GTE, uh, Husbeth back through again. Husbeth back in front of Cameron, but then immediately ran a bit wide coming out of seven and gives the place back. So I did think that Husbeth would generally be able to carry a bit more speed than Cameron, but he's got to keep it on the hard stuff. Yeah, so Duncan Cameron keeps a cool head, keeps the lead. 2.3 seconds to good after that uh, rather wayward move from Sean Hudspeth. So it's Cameron, Hudspeth, Lorenzo Ferrari. Who's after Romano Sol's Ferrari is in a, in a Porsche. <laughs> 55 from 66 from 77. And that 93 car still carrying damage, you know, on that front right corner. And uh, the race tape appears to be coming awry there. Jaman is catching the leader under seven seconds now. Is this tyres? Must be tyres. Yeah, and again, that is something that has to be thought out for many hours, really, in the lead of the race. Where do you use your restricted amount of tyres in the race? Two further dramas, both of them affecting the car 65, which is the car catching the leader right now. 6.6 .6 seconds is the gap, but remember, reminding myself, they've still got a five-second penalty in the pit stops to serve, and are now under investigation for not respecting full-course yellow procedures. OK, so uh, the issues become thick and fast, uh, arriving at the doorstep of uh, the said team. And, um, yeah, something else perhaps to grapple with in the closing stages. Still about an hour and a half out from the end of the race, so that's going to be at least one more stop for the LMP2s, depending on where they are on fuel right now. They can generally make 40 to 45 minutes if it stays green. As you say, the gap's really coming down now. Seven and a half seconds back to Nico Jama. Uh, Colombo did take, did not take tyres on the last stop. It will be, I'm sure, tyres that's beginning to kind of bite here. He is certainly slower than both the two cars immediately following him, but quicker at the moment than Tom Gamble in fourth, who's some 50 seconds back from Nico Lapierre. And with five seconds penalty to come for the 65 and the potential for something more we shouldn't ignore just exactly where nico lapierre is in this so lapierre currently 20 seconds back from the leader quicker of the last couple of laps than lorenzo colombo remember the cool racing car delayed in the last pit stop with the requirement for a replacement nose section of the car Panis Racing car pushing on. Just looking at the relative pace of the car chasing. Tents being taken out by Lapierre, but not hugely significant chunks of time yet. That could be where the threat is going to be coming from. I've gone a bit quiet because I'm just trying to research uh, how much more time is required in the number 17 car. Uh, if you run with two bronzes, as Cool Racing do, Morris Smith and yes. Mikey Benham, they each have got to do a minimum of 50 minutes, and they've both done 50 minutes, in fact, over that. So it's Malta Jakobsen so to the Jakobsen end. So it's to the finish now for certainly the remaining hour and 25 minutes. There you go. So that is that has, has been from the very start of the season. There was the calculation from Cool Racing. That's why they put this unusual crew together, is it allows them to fuel up and deploy the missile that is Malta Jakobsen. Yeah. And at the moment, Malta is up into fifth position. 
Just looking at where we stand, you've got to note uh, on the system of just how long the pit stop was, uh, the second pit stop was, because the third pit stop was a shorter stop. Ah, uh, no, the second uh, pit stop was a very short stop. Yes. So they've still got to serve a long stop. OK, so one more of those longer one at a minute and 45 seconds stop still to come. That's the gap from second to third between Terence Woodward and Alvarez in the TKR Engineering Duquesne. So Sebastian Alvarez, the Mexican, joining Alexander Bukansov and Tom Von Rumpai, who started the race. Here is Alvarez now down towards turn uh, number 10, running in third position for DKR. And uh, Glenn von Berlo just tucked in behind for Euro International, who's lapping them all quickly there, generally speaking. Well, last time around, actually, it was Alva Alvarez, in fact, for DKR Engineering. But Glenn van Berlo is certainly no slouch in fourth position for the Italian squad Euro International. So the, the, the gap, if you like, let's talk about the, the, uh, the, the race lead for the 17 uh, core cool racing car in the hands of that standout talent. Uh, Matthew Jakobsen, but he's got two minutes to find yeah. in the next hour and 21 minutes, plus any penalty he may have against the cars ahead of him that may well have burned two uh, long stops. The race leader in GTE, Duncan Cameron, heading down the hill towards the chicane. Fair bit of clear road in front of him that he will be making use of, and he's dropped Sean Hudspeth now he in has. second position. That was a lively battle only five or so minutes ago, but remember Hudspeth made that error running into the gravel trap at turn seven, and I think the next few laps will have been affected by slow lap times as he cleaned his tyres up. It was a fair old trip through the gravel stones there. They are being caught, by the way, by Lorenzo Ferrari, to the tune of about a second and a half or so a lap, uh, but Ferrari has his mirrors full of Frederick Schandorf, Picariello, for the 10 seconds back, Ricard Lietze for the 13 seconds back. This GTE race has got some chapters still to write. As I said, with David Perel coming for JMW fairly shortly, and Miguel Molina. Sorry, my apologies. It's, it's uh, Molina for JMW. It is Perel for the 55 squad. And this man, too, there is <laughs> the other than his suits, Jimmy Bruni. And he is absolutely glued to the timing yeah. screens in the garages, taking an active part, as he always has done, really, regardless of what team he's involved with. Still a factory driver, so brought in for uh, the competition within 77. Lorenzo Ferrari at the wheel right now. Christian Reed, we have to assume, has done all his time, and that will leave the final hour or so to Bruni. Yeah, he's got a career ahead of him post his factory GT racing career. Jimmy Bruni, it's a professional Rob Bell look-alike, and uh, the same applies in reverse for Rob Bell. Oh, yeah, I mean, when they've got clashing commitments, you know, two events to be at, and uh, just a quick ring. Yep. And uh, you can bring, you in, you bring in your look-alike. You never know. If you can tell the difference between Geordie and Italian, that's... It was always hilarious when they drove together for, oddly enough, for JMW Motorsport back in the day, where... They looked even more alike in those days. Memories of the fast show character Julio Giorgio suddenly crept in <laughs> into my mind. I can't think why. Anyway, let's move on before I break out into an actual impression. Uh, that's a fairly narrow audience, bear in mind we're broadcasting to the world. Uh, nevertheless, a really good fight here. Frederick Schandorf reeling in Lorenzo Ferrari. I reckon this car guy Ferrari, the bright yellow, is looming larger in the mirrors on the main straight. Schandorf had a quick race car and some quick stints at Monza. I remember him being elbowed out at the first chicane, not through his own fault. So, But he's continued really where he left off uh, two months ago. In, uh, just up the road from Milan, where we had our first, third race of the season. This one and two more to go, remember, Spa-Francorchamps towards the end of September and in the middle of October, Portimao in the south of Portugal, not far from Faro, as uh, the two RLR M Sport cars now are battling for seventh and eighth positions. You can be forgiven for thinking they're not part of the same squad, radically different paint schemes, but that's because it's the Michael Jensen livery for car number five, now driven by Brit Alex Kapadia. He has behind him uh, the 34 Racing Team Turkey offering. Where's that in Pro-Am? Down to second, second place now, yeah. Nicholas Nielsen is uh, 
stellar form at the moment into the yeah. 39s and consistently so for the Ferrari factory driver running sixth overall and with Hugo de Vilda between him and the challenge of Charlie Eastwood. Just to finish the point about RLR, the other car is in the Felbermeyer Sky Blue. And I notice one of the dive planes is actually uh, cracked back onto the uh, headlight lens there, front right, and yep. sort of attached itself. So that won't be helping the aero for car number 15, driven by Austin McCusker, as we've said, although he gets through turn nine safely. The uh, quick statistic of over 2,000 overtakes in this race. Oh, oh no, sorry, beg your pardon. I thought McCusker was going wide there, but uh, that's where that corner goes these days. Yeah, turn absolutely. 10. Absolutely. But uh, and every one of them, the potential for drama. That's why sports car racing is worth just sticking with over these long distances. There is potential for traffic to be a factor in all sorts of ways. It's, yeah. it's never over until the chequered flag. So, yeah, nearly 1,800 overtakes for LMP2 alone. Now, now a lot of those are mo uh, movements of lappery, but nevertheless, you are still side to side with another car, and the potential for disaster is there. There is the 31 TDS racing by Vaillant Car, now being driven by Matthias Besch. Easy to overlook uh, the rapid man who's taken a couple of pole positions, overall pole positions this season. Having been installed in that car, it's running in uh, fifth position in the Pro-Am category and 12th overall. Pit stop now for Racing Team Turkey. So we are about in the phase where LMP2 cars will have to take another gulp of fuel. And from this point, you cannot get to the end on a full no, tank. You cannot. It's going to be a splash, or more than a splash, time fuel stop for the 34 car to the end of this race. Yeah, probably about 30 minutes away from the chequered flag, they'll need to be in again. John Gamble looks up the inside of the number 40 car car, no way through there. He's got uh, Sergio Campana on the outside. So Campana laps down, but uh, unlaps himself from the 22 car. And the little Duquesne can carry good mid-corner speed it. through turn five, I noticed. The high line there being utilised by Sebastian Alvarez. And, uh, yeah, uh, 0.4 of a second away from Terence Woodward still. So this is the battle for second and third for the LMP3 podium. To the inside line will go Alvarez. And maybe get through on the outside then towards Woodward. Car 28 team manager to the stewards in race control. That's ominous. Okay. We were taking a glimpse there into the 360 racing garage, by the way. That move was made. Terence Woodward not able to keep back the Mexican in the Luxembourgish run uh, Duquesne. That is for DKR Engineering. Multiple champions in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. Ross Geiser there asking for another slice of cheese for the burger. <laughs> Shadow of a doubt. I think that was the coffee order going in, wasn't it? Two sugars and milk, thanks Ross, very much. Hugely successful in radical racing. Also one of the early winners of the, uh, the, the Daytona Challenge, getting a free ride at uh, the Rolex 24 back in the day, Ross, and impressing there. Yes, so uh, yeah, winning um, a points competition in the UK and uh, getting a chance to go stateside to race at that uh, very uh, historic track at Daytona. Oh, problems for Tom Gamble. It sounded like he got a bag full of neutrals it's, there. I have to say, I'm not being convinced by the pace of this car at all. 144 through last time, and it looked like he's been driving around a problem. Yeah. And I think we've just heard why. Yeah, I'm not convinced that the sound was necessarily synced entirely to the visuals, but nevertheless, there was a kind of... I mean, bear in mind these are sequential boxes, but yeah. he went for a gear and it just wouldn't engage. No. It sounded like to me. Which Maybe we can get Haley on the case there regarding whether the 22 is fighting a gearbox problem. Which would also explain why he couldn't get by the Duquesne. Yes, indeed. These are uh, stock parts offered by Gibson and by x -Track. Gibson, the Derbyshire company that supply and in some cases lease the engines to teams. And the x -Track gearbox kind of comes as one, uh, uh, the same assembly as well. It's a drive-through penalty for car 66, the second place car in GTE, causing contact with car 93 at turn 15. That was the much, much earlier incident that took uh, Michael Fassbender out. He's got 34 and 31 side by side. Matthias Pesch.
Jack Aitken it is now aboard, by the way, the 34 car for this final phase. So the 66 car is going to drop away from what has been a lead battle and I think is going to lose second place as well, ironically, to the other Proton car. Very busy, this battle for fifth position then, down into turn number 13. Duquesne just ahead for fueled back, ahead of Nicholas Nielsen in, uh, in sixth position, but leading the Pro-Am division. That will not stop Nicholas Nielsen punching for more positions, though. Yes, he's leading Pro-Am, but they want a great overall finish as well. Now, was there... Oh, this was the contact earlier on between the Fassbender Porsche and Jacopo Petrobelli. And there's a drive-through penalty, as mentioned by Graham, for car 66 for that collision at turn 13. That was earlier in the race. Just to clear up another, another little bit of housekeeping, with thanks to Martin Pass at United Autosports, Jim McGuire, uh, you remember, out of the race on lap one, uh, reported, and you said you thought that the, uh, the issue of the 27 was all by himself. Jim confirms car rotated at turn three. A couple of cars ahead, popped out right in front of him. No way of avoiding him and game over. Uh, so it was a luckless um, moment for Jim Maguire. Yeah, Foubert, I mean, it's on cold tyres, and Foubert was a little wide through the first bit of three, and it just looked like we were actually watching the replay, and if you wind the tape back far enough, uh, look at the, the moment for Sarah Bovey, mm -hmm. and at the top of frame, Foubert's having his moment all on his own uh, on the outside of turn three, and then Jim Maguire just collects him. So a, a horrible start for that crew who knew they'd got a quick car, had a quick chat with Andrew Bentley in, uh, in United Autosports Hospitality, in fact, this morning, and thank you to them for some breakfast. And Andrew says, we're feeling really good ahead of today. You know, it's gonna, it, we've got a good car, but uh, it didn't get any further than the third corner. Horrible situation. Yep. They'll come back fighting in the next round at Spa. Meanwhile, very uh, close again, although it's going to extend the gap this time because Nicholas Nielsen pits from the lead of the Pro-Am division in P2. And sixth overall, and a much improved bag of form for the AF Corsa car. Pretty dominant, this trio in the early competition of the year, but uh, some of that form just fell away in the middle part of the year. Also in the pit lane, 37 car from third, Nico Lapierre climbs out of the car, his day is done. It's a warning, by the way, for Frederick Schandorf from the Kessel Racing 57. In and out of the pits, two for the Export 28 car. Paul Chatan joins the race for the first time. Their day effectively ruined by Padera at the end of the start-finish straight under braking from Paul Lafargue. New boots going on for the new driver in the 37 car. So who have we not had in car 37 so far? Lapierre, Cruton, Ife Ye. It is Ife Ye to complete yeah. this race. So, cool racing in. Nielsen, sorry, apologies. They of course are in, Nielsen in. And the Algar Pro 47 car of James Allen in the pit lane as well. Need export have been in and out. Also coming in is the number 22 United Autosports car. Hearing from the team, by the way, nothing on the radio at all about a gearbox fault. But Fine. I agree with you, it sounded very odd. Yeah, but as I say, not convinced that the sound of the, the pictures were necessarily uh, broadcasting at the same time, if you like. So let's keep our fingers crossed that the, the issue is uh, not there, non-existent, and we imagined it, because Tom Gamble will have been reporting back to, their, to the crew, I'm sure. And generally speaking, you know, Gibson produced this uh, incredibly reliable engine, and extract likewise, the gearbox mm. tends to be bulletproof, so I would have been very surprised. United confirming, by the way, to Hayley that there is no gearbox issue. So. Fine, so we'll pay close attention to the lap times in the closing stages for car number 22. Phil Hansen leader will be taking pits. that over, I'm sure. So leader pits with eight seconds the good over the Paddis racing car. But remember, this, I think, is the stop where they've got to hold this car for five seconds. They couldn't do that under the previous stop because of the full course yellow. So we should see, if we've not already seen, this car held for five seconds. If they do it at the beginning, will they do it at the end? There goes the Prima car. 
skipping by the 65 as uh, well, Phil Hansen will rejoin in car number 22. Well, nine seconds was the gap when they came in. They'll complete the work and then hold for five. Didn't hold there, so must have held at the beginning if they held at all. We can compare the times in a moment or two. Meanwhile, the number 19 car is down pit road. When a, a car stops, we're able to take a look at uh, its fastest sector times. Ben Fiscal has been quickest in the race so far through sector one and two. That's a well, rapid a, car, number a 19. A little earlier in the race, it was all three. He didn't put it together for one lap, but he had all three as purple sector times. Yeah, and that has been overshadowed somewhat by Patrick Pilo, who hooked it all up on lap 50, a car that's not really in contention now, number 28. But that is still the fastest lap of the race for the very experienced Frenchman, Patrick Pile. But it's a real shame again for Stuart uh, Cox's team uh, and the fact that they knew how quick that car was in the hands of Sophia Flersch and Ben Viscal. Two absolute best sector times and sadly they're way down in 12th position. Drama for Cool Racing is going to be coming because they're going to have 10 seconds added to the next pit stop for that car for a pit stop infringement. The same penalty is going to go to Team Virage somewhat further down the order but that is disaster for the, uh, the race winning uh, opportunities for Cool Racing. Makes it 10 seconds more difficult, doesn't it? Already was an outside bet, and that's, uh, as you can see on the faces there, of the Cool Racing team, not good news for the Swiss team. Ifeye is the man given the... Looks to me as if what uh, Cool Racing did was hold that, put that five seconds in before they touched that car. So, 1 minute 30 on pit lane, 15.8 seconds is the gap. Jan van Utrecht bringing the Panis Racing car back out. They've served that penalty. Right on the boot lid now of the Oman Racing by TF Sport Aston Martin. I think that was actually the second of the two Astons. No, actually, the better place of the two because of the dramas for car 69. So, that was the 95 being lapped by... Car 88, driven by Alessio Rivera now. That was Alex Peroni just going by Alessio Rivera, wasn't it? The uh, 47 car up into sixth place. OK. So 47 Algarve Pro Racing's Pro-Am offering. And as you say, Alexander Peroni now at the wheel of that. Car 47 that he shares with John Falb and James Allen. No, it can't have been. I'm sorry, but it can't have been that. What did I just see? So... Oh, that was the 37 car. It was the 37 car. Cool Racing in third for Yifei Ye. Meanwhile, back on board we go with Alessio Rivera. Takes a standout driver to be able to overtake this guy. And 88 still leading Pro-Am. The gap back to Pironi, who is second in Pro-Am, is 22, nearly 23 seconds. So Rivera, Pironi and Besh are your top three in Pro-Am. There is one hell of a battle, you know, underway for that second place in Pro-Am. 47 car with Alex Peroni has got Matthias Pesch right with him. Jack Aitken is just 1.4 seconds back, and he has his mirrors full of Thomas Laurent in the uh, LMP2 class, 21 car. So positions 7 back to 10 uh, are covered by something like 2.5 seconds. Confirmation of the drive-through penalty for the 69 Omar Racing by TF Sport Aston Martin on the top of your screen. So that was after the contact that we heard about from Marco Sorensen on Takeshi Kimura's 57 car guy Ferrari. And that Ferrari, presumably it took a bit of damage because, I mean, the state of the Aston when it came in. Yep. But Frederick Scharndorf has kept it on the island and is running in third position. I don't think yet we've seen... We haven't seen any of Mike Mikkel Jensen in no, that car. That, so that he's still coming, got a lot more to give. That will be coming very shortly. It's uh, clearly made out of unobtainium. So uh, the Aston Martin came back effectively in two pieces. Yeah. Uh, so they've been losers in both directions. This is a battle for position. And a bit of a squeeze from Jack Aitken on the, the 31 car that was. So 31 being driven by Matthias Besch. Besch. Also in the mixture, Thomas Laurent for yeah. Moulin Motorsport Absolutely. right behind. These are for position. 8th, ninth, 10th, as you can see from the graphics tower. And just ahead of them is Alex Peroni. He's in this fight as well. 
And uh, I think we're about to see Miguel Molina, by the way, introduced into proceedings. Sean Hudspeth is on pit road for JMW Motorsports. And away that Ferrari goes from the yellow um, fuel um, uh, crate for JMW Motorsports. So that's still carrying the old livery of that car, but it goes back into the race. And car number 66 then now in the hands of Miguel Molina, a rapid GT driver wherever he goes, but this is his home track. He hails from Barcelona, so an extra kind of shot in the arm to do very well here, but drop back to eighth position as a result of that latest pit stop. Behind this group, by the way, you can see the Edex Sport car there. That car is a lap down, but uh, we'll be looking to do what it can do to unlap itself. But there are four cars here in contention with Alex Peroni, Jack Aitken, Matthias Besch and Thomas Laurent for seventh place overall. Three of those cars, the first three I mentioned, are in contention for second in LMP2 Pro-Am. Look at this. Aitken's got the run on the car in front. He'll now be too abreast. He That's was pretty Peroni. forceful in qualifying yesterday and he will get the place under braking as long as he can get it stopped and up to second position in Pro-Am. So, uh, right, yeah, so uh, Aitken to Peroni now. Not much at all, but Aitken really only going one way. Can he start to reel in Alessio Rivera now as well? 24 seconds to the good, that's the downside. Rivera, you might be able to get odd, odd uh, chinks out of that time, odd tenths here and there. 24 seconds is a big ask. Yeah, and uh, Matthias Besch held up a little there by the LMP3 car. That's allowed to Laurent to get a sniff of the rear of Matthias Besch's Orica. Remember, this is for the, the moment the final podium position. Now potentially an unsafe release for the EDEC Sport car, which uh, a while ago was taken out of contention because of a mistake for Paul Lafargue down into the first corner. But if that car's had the lollipop lifted and into the path of another car, that will normally be pinged by a penalty. There is the 28 car, in fact, right on the tail of this scrap for essentially seventh place. Aitken now ahead of Peroni, Matthias Besch uh, fourth in Pro-Am and ninth overall, Thomas Laurent, and then you've got Ben Hanley in the Nielsen car there as well. But uh, Edex machine for Paulik Chatat will have to... Uh, well, we'll wait and see what happens, but it's under investigation nevertheless. Stellar drive from Duncan Cameron. He strides away. And it will be David Perel to complete the race for Spirit of Race. He'd have been very happy with this afternoon, Duncan, I'm sure. Led the race and led it well. We're homing in on just 60 minutes still to go in the four hours of Barcelona for season 2022. This is round four of the championship. Patrick Pile closing up on the 21 of Mulder Motorsport. There was a slight error from a car in front there. Big puff of tyre smoke at turn four. I don't know whether that involved a GT car or one of this long line of LMP2s. Rivera still a long way ahead of Jack Aitken, but Aitken, Peroni, Besch and Laurent, together with Pile, laps down, but still trying to get himself involved. There is the Pro-Am LMP2 leader, Alessia Rivera cresting the rise as he leaves turn number 12. And now pit stop for car 65 is under investigation. Did they serve the penalty? Did they serve the penalty correctly? It, it, it is stipulated as the next pit stop, isn't it? Well, so I think they did. It's did they do it correctly? Right, OK. Now to the oh. inside, oh, Rivera looking for a way underneath Richard Bradley, but Bradley closed the door firmly in his face. Thankfully, Rivera able to get out of the throttle before he found the grass there. But for some forceful driving from the British driver up ahead of Rivera, who's looking for a way by, they're both going to overlap the number 11 from Euro, uh, Euro International, Louis Rousset. And now Rivera looking for a way around the outside, I thought, at turn four. Might be able to do it now on the run down towards turn five, but Bradley not making this easy and also trying to lock in Vent Fiscal, not on the same lap as these two, though. No, I could do unlap himself from this pair.
plenty of sausage curd being smacked there coming out of turn number seven, which briefly unsettles the car, but mainly the downforce is the, uh, the overwhelming force in that whole sequence. Keeps the cars glued to the ground. 99 laps work, so this is now 100 laps about to be completed by Louis Delatraz for Prima Racing. He has the 21 second advantage over Jop von Outert and it's Yifei Ye for Cool Racing in third position. This, by the way, is going to be helping Jack Aitken and his chase for the overall, sort of the lead in LMP2 AM uh, in no small part. That gap 21 seconds now. Half a second quicker last time around for Aitken on Rivera. One to watch. Very close indeed. Now, Rivera is going to try again on Richard Bradley, but Bradley is keeping a watchful eye on the AF Corsa run 88. With every movement from the nose of that Orica, Richard Bradley sort of copycats it, really. You can't afford to be changing direction too much in the braking area. So if it's a zig to one side, you can't then zag to defend for a second time. They are closing in on either the Iron Lynx or the Kessel Racing Ferrari. I can't quite tell from this distance. Might well be the Kessel machine down into turn number five. The better of the two uh, is definitely that Kessel car. And it is the Kessel car, confirmed, number 57, now being driven by Mikkel Jensen. It's just made a stop, in fact. So now on an outlap for the Dane. One, two, three LMP2 cars very tightly bunched indeed as Ben Viscal tries to hang on to the coattails of this duo fighting over fifth and sixth positions. We're watching this, just a bit of an update on one of the other battles we told you we'd keep you up to date with. It's the ongoing chase of Milton Jakobsen looking to get the 17 car back into contention. He's fourth place at the moment, maybe still we believe got to burn a longer pit stop. Two minutes and four seconds was the gap when he got into that car to the leader. Now one minute and 46 seconds, he's taken 20 seconds out of that lead. Some more GT pit stops taking place. We're inside an hour, so this will be comfortable for fuel for all of those involved in the GTE category. 10 cars still running of the 11 that we started with. Again, getting closer and closer on the long straight that we have here at Barcelona. Rivera to Bradley to the outside it. line. That'll give him the inside for two. Great move. Late on the brakes, round the outside of one, and that delivers you into the apex at turn two. Richard Bradley has no response to that, and it put him out on the marble. So now I think he's going to struggle to hold Ben Viscal back, but this is less of an issue for Bradders because he will know that Viscal's not on the same racing lap. Great move from Nicholas Nielsen, not a lot of room to work with but just enough, lent back into but no touch with the Duquesne, beautiful overtaking manoeuvre uh, to perfection there. This is the 18 car from Absolute Racing, pits from the lead, Alessio Piccariano this is all going to wind its way back out and it's a driver change Martin Bump I don't think we've seen yet in this car, so it'll be ramped to the end of this race also in and out, by the way. Jimmy Bruni now aboard the 77 car. He's rejoined in fifth place. Uh, Marco Sorensen, chatting to Hayley Edmonds earlier on, was hopeful that he would get some time behind the wheel of car 69. Well, he is now in the Aston Martin from Oman Racing and has just set the car's best lap of the race, in fact, at 147.048. And sadly, sadly, that car is stone last, though. So at quarter to midday today, we got the fourth race of the European Le Mans series underway. A great start from uh, Julien Canal and also um, Sally Jolic. However, both judged to be out of position, not in terms of where they were from uh, turn 16 to turn one, but left to right on the grid. They needed to be directly over the grid boxes. And that proved from several replays to not be the case. Look at this for a moment for Sarah Bovey. Bang! Into the tyre wall after Freddie Hunt was looking for spaces through traffic. Jean Ludovic Foubert had his own moment and Jim Maguire had absolutely nowhere to go. That would account for two uh, LMP3 cars. This was a clumsy moment for uh, Jacopo uh, Petrobelli spinning the 
spinning the German-Irish Hollywood film actor Michael Fassbender around, and he would immediately pit at the end of that incident. But the 93 car still pounding round. A spin for the uh, then second-place car in LMP3, Josh Cagill. And this incident we didn't actually see in real time, but it was contact for Oman Racing's Aston Martin of Ahmed Al Harty with the Kessel Racing Ferrari. A mistake from Paul Lafargue pitched him into the wall down at turn one in the Edex Sport number 28, and that would force our first full course yellow. Quite a bit of damage done to the nose of the 28 car, as you can see, but they changed that fairly quickly. It did, though, take that car out of contention. Premier Racing have won two races so far this year. They are on course for a set of for a third from four races. This was James Dason in the gravel at turn 12, which would bring out a second FCY, where everyone is limited to 80 kilometers per hour. The nose change for car number 37 would take place here. Nicola Lapierre picking up damage, we think, in traffic. Terence Woodward having a, a good battle in the 360 racing car. He's literally just pitted, actually, and might be handing over to the third driver within that gang. But it, was a, it has been a good run from 360 racing up until this point. But the class leader for a long time now in LMP3 has been into Europol competition. It could be two wins in a row for the little team from Poland. And Nico Pino still at the wheel of that car, a real talent from Chile. Jacopo Petrobelli eventually holding, handing the 66 Ferrari over to Sean Hudspeth, who had a good dice with Duncan Cameron. Cameron eventually getting ahead to lead the GTE fight, and there have been further driver changes there more recently too. That was the gap at the time, back to the 65 uh, Panis racing car being driven by Nico Jama, and they are holding, therefore, Jop van Outer back for the latter stint. There's the third-place car of Yife Ye, but it is Louis Delatraz for Prima Racing who leads with an hour to go. So 51 minutes left of this four hours. That is the overall running order. Just under 20 seconds, the lead for Prima Racing, who've led pretty much at a fast canter for much of this race for Panis Racing. Panis Racing may be under a cloud of potential further penalty to come from Cool Racing's Yife Ye, closing in on the lead battle. Phil Hansen for the United Autosports. A, of course, as Leslie Rivera has put a cracking move on the Duquesne team and the 30 car to reinforce his position in fifth and in the lead of LMP2 Pro-Am. LMP3 still has to wind out with final uh, long pit stops, but at the moment it's the interior pole competition car. Nico Pino, the Chilean driver, head of Sebastian Alvarez in the DKR Engineering Duquesne GTE. The 55 Spirit of Race Ferrari back to the lead ahead of Jimmy Bruni. David Perel in the Ferrari, Jimmy Bruni in the 77 uh, Proton Porsche. Both these cars have had periods in the lead. They now lead the Rinaldi Racing 32 car of Nicholas Ferroni. But that car, I think, uh, is uh, owes us a pit stop and it's out of sequence. 10 seconds to be added, by the way, to the next car, 65. Stop, car 65. Yeah. And that is going to gift, at the moment, uh, Cool Racing a second place. Yeah, so you oh, have that, to actually, think. My apologies, they've both got 10 seconds to be added. Oh, right, because the other one was questionable as well. The other five second. Uh, no, uh, no, 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 no. Okay, so no. Six, well, let's just deal with 65 first of all. That's they the had a five second penalty. They clearly didn't serve it correctly. That's why they've got the 10 so seconds. They've now got 10 seconds added at the next pit stop. But we already know that Cool Racer have got 10 seconds to be added. Right. So both the second and third place cars have got 10 seconds to be added. So whilst we've got 20 seconds, here comes the 65 car. Well, this was a while ago, not right, right. now. So this is what one, happened during two, the pit stop. Three. Four, five. What was that about? Were there were there feet over the white line? Don't know. I mean, you're talking about that's that's almost like uh, you know you need goal line technology to work out whether the personnel had actually encroached when you have to be clearly the safe side of that white line into the apron. They certainly didn't touch the car for five seconds. No, they didn't. Now, what about this as an overlap? Mulner Motorsport looking for a way by Alexander Pironi. So it's Thomas Leron. Oh, and a bit of argy-bargy into the chicane there from the 28 car that isn't on the lead lap, remember, but it doesn't stop 
potential spinning out of uh, LMP2 cars. That's Paul Luke Chatan looking for a way through. Chatan's there. The 24 car is there for position with them on the motorsport car. I thought for a moment that was Ben Hanley uh, getting stuck in, but it wasn't. It was Paul Luke Chatan. 47 car, by the way, that is for position two. This is Alex Peroni, Tom Laurent, Ben Han Hanley, uh, one uh, uh, are running in eighth, ninth, and tenth position. That is the third and fourth place cars, the Alcar Pro car and the Nielsen Racing car in Adam Peter Pro Am, with a Mulder car between them. But uh, Nielsen Racing's Ben Hanley goes by Laurent and is now looking for a podium position in LMP2 Pro-Am. So the 65 Panis Racing prototype, LMP2 prototype, has to serve 10 seconds next time around. Correct. Oh, is there a touch there on the run into turns seven and eight? It was the merest of grazes on the sort of hind quarters of car 47 on Ferrari 66 from JMW Motorsport. Certainly it's lost the door mirror now the as a result gone, of yeah. that. And it was that side of the car. Oh, and popped off right onto the racetrack. So it's now sitting in the middle of the racetrack, it's kind of on the racing line on the approach to turn 10, which might enforce a full course yellow. Depends whether it gets head butted out of the way by a following car, actually, and does the marshals a favour. You sort of hope it gets just shifted by yep. airflow away because it could do some damage, that. It's, it's a 10 seconds added to the next pit stop for another LMP2 car. This time it is the Edex Sport car. Somewhat out of position, the 28 after that issue for Paul Lafargue, or the, the off for Paul Lafargue earlier in the race. Been reminded, by the way, to Miguel Molina's mirror goes bouncing down the track, I'm sure to Jim McWood has utter disgust, um, that Miguel Molina is the reigning GT champion. Yes. From Iron Links last year. Indeed. Good point. Coming. Returning to the European Le Mans series uh, to join with JMW Motorsport. So Louis de la Traz leads with just over 45 minutes to go from Jop van Outert. It's time, though, to get an update from one of our British squads now with Hayley. I'm down in the United Auto Sports garage, joined by driver of car number 22, Tom Gamble. Now, the team managed to go from starting off ninth, working the way up to fourth position. Although when you got out the car, you seemed frustrated. You said you were maybe struggling with it. Yeah, I mean, Duncan had a phenomenal start. Um, he got us all the way from ninth to fifth on the first lap, which was great. Um, put us where he needed to be. He had a good first stint. Um, we started to struggle a little bit on the double stint, so in the second stint, um, just with the tyres going away. Um, so, yeah, in my stint, it was a similar situation. The first stint was really promising. Then the second stint, we just struggled a lot with the tyres dropping away. Uh, I think we incurred a bit of splitter damage as well, maybe due to contact, which was uh, which is a shame because then that just sort of enhances the problem once you get a load of understay you just start destroying the front tires and then it makes the rears worse so it's just uh, an evolution so yeah we'll salvage what we can um you know a lot of people are getting penalties so i think if we can keep our nose clean we should be able to uh, maybe move on to the podium which would be a good result for us absolutely and you know looking at the overall we're in the second part of the season um it would be an important result for you if you do get on that podium. yeah i mean this championship is all about consistency um, to be a bit higher up the grid than we are. Um, we've been struggling a little bit this year, to be brutally honest. Um, but, you know, like you say, there's still two rounds left after this, so I'm confident that we can have a good one there. Um, we had really good speed at Spa and Portimao last year as well, so they're two super strong tracks for us. So, yeah, fingers crossed we can end the season on a high. Great, thank you very much, Tom. All sorts of dramas going on on track, and finally, that merit is collected fairly comprehensively by the number 19 car and part of it wedges in one of the air intakes on the front of the number 19 Orica. Got uh, trouble too, potentially looming for into Europol. The LMP3 leaders, Nico Pino, reported to the stewards for cutting T15 several times. He's on pit lane at the moment for what the final routine stop, routine stop for that car, as is the second place D-Car Engineering, Duquesne. There was a clash a few moments ago between the number 28 EDEX Sport car of Paul Lup Chatin with Ben Hanley. That's just held up Hanley for a moment or two, but enough to allow Thomas Laurent to retake that place. So up into the lead of LMP3, for the moment at least, is 360 Racing, I believe. 
number six car. Xavier Laveres is with the 360 racing car in a battle for the lead as things stand at the moment. Car 35, by the way, is going to be in trouble. Reported to the stewards for not respecting the time penalty added to the pit stop. So there's all sorts kicking off in race control at the moment. Two race leaders then in LMP3 come back out onto the circuit. Uh, missed by me, Johnny Palmer. Melty Jakobsen has taken his final pit stop. That was the long stop. And once we've got things evened out here, we'll call exactly where that is leaving things. Well, the top two in LMP3 are now on out laps, so the Inter-Europol competition car with Guilherme Oliveira, the Portuguese, Sebastian Alvarez for DKR Engineering, and Ross Kaiser, we saw him snacking uh, in the, whilst uh, one of his teammates was doing a stint. He was taking on some much-needed energy and uh, now has clambered on board the 360 racing car, who are having a great race to this point, with thanks to Terence Woodward, who put in the hard yards in the middle phase, and uh, the 360 racing crew also had Mark Richards in the opening stages from uh, the, that opening stint. But Ross Kaiser now... Making things very interesting indeed. He's going to have uh, the local man, the Spaniard uh, Javier Loveras, though, behind him for contention. And that Euro International car looking marginally faster than the British uh, run car up ahead. Yeah, uh, 13 car does retain the lead, but is potentially in trouble here. Might well be a drive through to come for Nico Pino. In fact, Guillermo uh, Alvera would be taking that. It's a black and white orange flag going to car two to repair the rear cheese part, it says here. First Excellent. Of there you go. That's that nice is the see. technical term. That's then. what we'd like to say. This race director says it must be true. True enough, yeah. So the 13 car leads the race uh, in LMP3 by 13 seconds, but is in trouble for track limits. That could be a drive-through is likely it has to be said to be a drive-through at the moment. DKR Engineering looking in very good shape for this race. The, uh, the reason why, by the way, those cheese parts, the rear cheese parts, have to be part of the car is they carry a tail light, and uh, that is sort of integral to the, the technical regulations that the car should have two of those immediately behind the rear wheels. They're often called legality panels as well. We've seen them on prototypes of, of different shapes and sizes all the way through the years. There they are, good view of them on the 10, yep. as they should be, as the designer intended. But one has been torn off the number two car. We detailed that at the time. We, we did, we saw that with the clash with the wall, didn't we? Yeah. So this is the 13 car, we're aboard here. The gap on track to Sebastian Alvarez chasing is 13 and a half seconds, as we said. There's a potential penalty looming here with the earlier driver, Nico Pino, reported to the stewards for cutting turn 15, quote, several times. Right. And that would be 23 seconds running down pit lane if he gets that, which is... It's going to put those cars very close together on track. Absolutely, yeah. T turn 15, the second element of that rather nagy chicane, but uh, and it's been the scene of quite a bit of incident. I'm sure there were plenty of spectators at the start of the weekend that chose to watch at least the first hour of the race there. But, yeah, if you run too deep into the chicane, there is an escape route, but obviously you're, you're going to be gaining time if you do that too often, and Nico Pino judged to have done that. Uh, we'll say, add as well, by the way, for, I know with a couple of people on, Social media asking about the progress of Melty Jakobsen. He served his final pit stop. It was a long stop, as we said it would be. That puts the gap back over two minutes. So, effectively, what he gained on the leader, he lost back to the leader because the team had opted to, to, to leave the long stop to the end of the race. But uh, now pushing on again and is significantly the quickest legal uh, car out there with... Uh, the Europol car quicker on the last lap, but being pinged for track limits. Again, that will not help their case. Zachary Robichon in the Proton competition portion of a 93, under pressure now from uh, Davide Regon, who's taken charge of the Iron Lynx Ferrari. You should be able to see him just peep out. There he is in the bright yellow Ferrari. 
So the emerald green Porsche started by Michael Fassbender, Robichon now doing his stints. We still have not seen Jimmy Bruni. Yes, we have. Oh, yeah, we have seen we Jimmy have. Bruni in that car. Second, pardon. Right. They say in second place in the other car. In the other car. Uh, no, I'm right. getting mixed up then. Who's in the 93 that we haven't seen? Leitz. 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 Leitz did the middle he stint. He did the earlier stint. He did. So, yeah. Robichon to the finish, do Correct. we think? Yeah, it must be, because so they will have done their final stop now. Just looking at what we've got out there at the moment in, uh, G in GTE. David Perel leads the race from Jimmy Bruni by 6.3 seconds. 55 from the 77. JMW Motorsport with reigning champion Miguel Molina making a guest appearance here. He's a further 12 seconds back the JMW car. Martin Rump uh, for the Absolute Racing car, 2.7 seconds back again. Miguel Jensen uh, pushing hard, closing in on Rump uh, in the Kessel Racing car, the 57 car. Then exact Robichon, as you quite rightly say, it's a wee way uh, while back. But definitely Recon right behind him as you, we, and he can no doubt see. Well, Leeds is in the garage. I hope I haven't suddenly alerted him to, th to think he needs to be in the car. He's absolutely fine, but obviously paying close attention in amongst the engineers there and the uh, Brains Trust within Proton Competition. If a yay on pit lane from third overall, and this will be the stop that includes a 10 second delay for that car. The other concern for me about the 93 Porsche is that still that. Uh, damage to the front wing, but um, the fact that we haven't had a mechanical warning flag for that car just yet, unlike the number two in LMP3, yeah. suggests that the scrutineers are happy. Here's the start for Yifei Ye, and there's De also some debris on the track. Now, that's not the door mirror from JMW Motorsport Ferrari. Well, it, well, it could be, because that reckon? was what... Uh, well, you were just away from the screens for a moment. Yeah. That was collected by the front of one of the... Uh, by the 19 APR car, which broke the piece in two, but part of it was lodged in the front of the Orica while the air intake... So has it could dropped it's... out somewhere else on the circuit then now? Done. Away goes the 37, also pitting was Fabio Scherer in the 43 into Europol competition car. That car so these two rejoining. Delayed. Full course yellow is coming for that debris. 20 seconds for full course yellow. And we will find out exactly what this debris is and where it has ended up on the circuit. But uh, again, this is going to buy back a bit of time from fuel mileage point of view. It, it, it is, but it's also going to hand the race to Kramer. Three, two, yeah. one. Full course yellow deployed. Full course yellow deployed. Okay. This could be a very rapid full course yellow, but it does give the opportunity for anybody in a position to do it. And just looking, that's not Prima immediately because Prima in Please sector guide, one. We will be collecting debris all over the track. We have several pieces of debris to collect all over the track. Please. Including that uh, very nasty looking shard, which could very easily work its way into a tyre and. Uh, Spell disaster. That's on the really fast part of the circuit as well, isn't it? The main straight. 35 seconds, uh, 35 minutes to go. That was quite That's a, a big dive plane, I think. It's a big dive plane. Possibly, I don't know, a, a cover from a I prototype, perhaps? I think it looks like one of the covers from the front of a P3 car over the suspension elements. Yes. That That's the, that well. the mirror. Door mirror from Ferrari number 66, the JMW Motorsport machine. And other bits and bobs as well. Amazingly, the dive plane that has been flicked back on the RLR Felbermeyer sponsored P3 has still been retained on that car, even at the slower speeds. I'd expected that to have fallen off. Just like bigger than a dive plane, that's yeah, uh, yeah, agreed. Piece. Yeah, and uh, it was it, it, it was wrapped on one side but black on the other, so that would suggest it probably does pop onto the top of the nose of an LMP3 car. So who's made it into pit lane? The, the 2030 20, car is in. Yeah, 30 car is in. The 34 car for Race Team Turkey with uh, Jack Aitken is in. This, by the way, will get these cars all the way to the finish, and this is good news for anybody that needed it out of sequence. Also in and out, the Alcar Pro number 19. Sophia Flersch will finish this race for them. 28 Edex Sport car. So a replay of where the door mirror ended up. This was the incident you had seen yep. being picked up by the APR car and then dropped elsewhere at slower speed, presumably. So, uh, well, half the job was done there. And, and credit, you know, to Stuart Cox's team doing a track sweep, almost. Absolutely. You know, pluck, pluck the mirror up, and it would have been great to have dropped it off somewhere in the pit lane, but in the, in the end it got spat out somewhere else. Inconsiderate, I call it. Well, it's just half a job, you know. <laughs> either complete it or don't bother at all. We're kidding, we're kidding. 
Bremer Racing lead by a good chunk. It was about 17 seconds before we went caution. Chance to blast the Adex Sport or Tur car with a bit more fuel. And there are a few others deciding to do that as well, including the number 47 APR car for Alexander Peroni, Tom Laurent and Ben Hanley in for Mulna Motorsport and Nielsen Racing, respectively, from ninth and 10th places. And here's the race leader, Louis Delatraz. As you watch this pit stop underway, a significant change just before we went into this caution period, uh, up into third position in LMP3, Championship leaders number 17, the cool racing car with Delta Jakobsen at the wheel. He's not going to be a challenger for this race win with the gap that uh, has been built up and certainly not able to close that gap under this caution. But more points going the way in what is a tight points battle in LMP3. It was neat and tidy by Prima. Away it goes, and if uh, there was any doubt that that car might be short on fuel, well, it needed to get to the last, uh, through the last half an hour, and this uh, full-course yellow has provided the perfect opportunity to pop a bit more fuel into it. Panis Racing on pit lane as well as the 35 here, and this will be that longer stop for the team. So, if again, the work... Well, we only caught sight of this uh, stop part way through it. Have they served the 10 seconds well, they already? Served it, they served it at the beginning, remember, um, of the previous stop. Very good point. And uh, have we got to the bottom exactly what was wrong no, with that uh, no, pit we stop? No, we haven't. I just wonder whether, as I say, team personnel were either had their feet on the line or just over it. And away it goes. Well, the fuel nozzle was removed and the car started going. So uh, no extra time there at the end of the pit stop. But um, as we've said, before it was the measure of the day for the five second, the attempted five second penalty. That so we'll assume that was OK. That was either a time fuel stop. It was only 53 seconds on pit lane. Now, full fuel stop is about 52, 53 seconds. Yeah. And OK, we've got 10. It probably was a time fuel stop plus 10. You're putting two-thirds of a fuel load into these cars. Normally, they take 40... Oh, United, United Autosports have just come out after 47 seconds. Yeah. At the same time. True. Uh, it does depend on how much fuel was left in the car. Mm, but you would have expected it to be closer to a minute rather than the 53 seconds. That's only six seconds slower than United Autosports. Well, OK, maybe there's more to follow on that as well. 65, incidentally, feeding back into still second on the road. So it's going to be something like half an hour. Full course yellow is going to finish in 4.50 seconds. We're Johnny. under full course yellow, though, remember. They so can't they can't take the, take the ten penalty. Seconds. They can't it's take the 10-second penalty. Course. Completely correct. Just suddenly dawned on yes. me there. So, Sorry. yes, yes, they buy back the fuel, but that that's a killer, because they're basically going to have to come in for a 10-second penalty now. No, they'll have the 10 seconds at the end. You think they'll just push on and they'll just add it on? Right, OK. And it does. it's not 10 seconds, though, then, surely, is it? It... it uh, it will be 10 it seconds. Will be, well, uh, yeah, but the officials are going to say, we told you to do it in the next pit stop. You can't. You came in to do the pit stop and you didn't do it. But you can't. 15 seconds to remove full course You can yellow. do it. There's still time to do it. Ten, oh, this is, this is nine, really, uh, you know, eight, there's eight, arguments both five, sides. Argument and I'd like to be a fly on the wall five, in the discussion. Here's the countdown four, out of the full course three, yellow. Two, one. Full course yellow removed. Full course yellow removed. So there we go. 30 seconds uh, are... Uh, 30, 30 minutes, rather, still to go. Uh, there's a lot bouncing around in my head now regarding uh, the, the non-taking of that penalty, and I perfectly understand the reasons I why. I think the answer will be that they were unable to take that penalty because of the timing of the stop. Um, uh, and links to the inside of the 93 Proton for position, and that is uh, a good pass on Zachary Robichon from David A. Rigon up into sixth place for the Iron Lynx Ferrari. So, sixth place in GTE. Switches hands, 30 minutes to go. It will be very interesting to see how that's viewed. So, to, to flesh it out, you're told as a team there's a 10 second penalty that you must take in the next pit stop. However, the next pit stop is under full course yellow, and the regulations say you can't take a time penalty in a full course yellow. Then the team say, well, we don't have another chance to do it because we don't need to stop again. The, the officials will say, you did make a pit stop. Oh, yeah, I, I can see it both from both sides. Very I, I tricky. think the answer will be the penalty is 10 seconds. It's and it's ten, bolted on at the end of the race, It's 10 seconds basically. to be added, mm -hmm. not 10 seconds plus a pit stop. 
Yeah. OK. Well, we, uh, we will know in due course. We will. Sadly, for the 65 crew, for, you know, when they were potentially going to win this race, they had a strong enough car to do so. Just look at Nico Jaman's really quick time yesterday. Uh, but it's been taken away from them. And um, 10 seconds won't drop them another position, though, the way things are. Yi Fei Ye is just virtually remember they, back. They stopped just before the full cost yellow and did, and did take the penalty. Yeah, they also had a 10 second penalty, don't forget. And uh, they took it within their pit stop. What it has done is closed the gap uh, for United Autosports to under 13 seconds. Yi Fei Ye, Phil Hansen, is. 12.8 seconds now back from third place. So there is the possibility, depending on what tyres are on those cars, what state those cars are in, that there could be a battle for the final podium position here. In terms of the LMP2 Pro Am, Alessio Rivera, we saw that fantastic pass on Richard Bradley, has got a gap between himself and the chasing Jack Aitken. The battle there, 22 seconds is the gap between the 88 and the 34, with the 30 in between them. Behind uh, racing team Turkey, it is uh, Alex Peroni, a further 12 seconds behind, and he has got his hands full with Tom Laurent. And then the fourth place car at MP2 Pro Am, uh, that's Ben Hanley, a couple of seconds back from that battle. Into Europol, with potentially a penalty looming for them too for track limits. We wait to find out what happens with that one. They have, what is that, 12 seconds on the chasing Sebastian Alvarez and the DCAR engineering car. If they've got a drive through to come, they're going to lose the lead of the race uh, yep. with that penalty. But that's one that's still outstanding. Third place is Melty Jakobsen. He's a minute and 19 seconds back uh, from the second place uh, car, uh, Sebastian Alvarez, and is not close enough to take advantage should there be a drive through for into Europol. But has clawed back a podium finish for Cool Racing. In GTE, Spooner Races' David Perel still fending off, but ever closing, Jimmy Bruni 2.4 seconds behind now with Miguel Molina, a Molina in the JMW uh, motorsport car, 30 seconds back, Martin Rump 2.5 seconds back from him, David Regon putting pressure on at 1.2 seconds back there. It's all to play for in uh, the lower positions, if you like, or the final position uh, for the podium for GTE. There are storylines to be written. It is a minute away from the magic 25 minutes at the end of an endurance race where I'm just checking the rules. Yes, anything can happen. Indeed so. Isn't it great to have Henrique Chavez back at the wheel of a race car? He pulled off just then an absolutely sublime overtake on Zach Robichon. Remember, in ACO rules racing, the last time we saw Chavez, he was doing a backflip at the second chicane at Monza. A horrible incident to witness. But he's back in a TF Sport Aston Martin this weekend and charging like crazy the Portuguese racing in Spain. If you watch, as you should, the FIWC's Full Access uh, YouTube series, uh, these kind of bite-sized fly-the-wall documentaries, you'd have seen the scenes of the garage at TF Sport when that happened. Front brake failure for that car. But either way, I'm going to put my hand up and say it's absolutely unacceptable in those circumstances that part of the circuit infrastructure that is designed for a sporting purpose to govern track limits could lead to what was a horrifying accident for that car. And we are lucky that they build those cars strongly at ProDrive. This is still a battle, by the way. That's a side by side contact. Ben Hanley with the LMP3 leader this time. Uh, yes. So, fellow Portuguese, we're talking about Chavez, uh, Guilherme Oliveira piloting the Inter Europol competition car, and sensibly he straightened out the steering once he felt the contact there. No need to force the issue. He's uh, over a minute to the good. Over, no, beg pardon, it's 10 seconds actually back to Sebastian Alvarez and then a, a full minute back to Malta Jakobsen. So Oliveira certainly needing to pay close attention to the advances of that Duquesne from second place. Um, yeah, Malta Jakobsen, by the way, it's a minute and 17 seconds back from the second place car. At the moment, he's two seconds lap quicker than the second place, four seconds quicker albeit I'm sure that was in part that delay there with the issue in traffic than the, the race leader, the number 13 car. And we wait to see if there are going to be 
uh, any kind of regulatory dramas. There's reason to think there might be for the leading car in LMP3. To the inside of one of the two Euro International cars will go the 88 of Alessio Rivera, still leading the Pro-Am category in P2 from Jack Aitken's Racing Team Turkey car. This is the battle for the lead in GTE. David Perel has been closed in on, caught by Jimmy Bruni. Winner of Le Mans this year, remember. Porsche factory driver. Knows the Ferraris well. Back in the 458 era, certainly. Looks the inside. Is he going to be able to do something about the... So there's contact there. There certainly was, and that has uh, shoved the 55 car out of the way, but was the 55 sort of in the middle of the road, not fully committed to the apex or indeed to the outside? Bruni showed the nose. He then tried to get out of the throttle to avoid further contact, but uh, Pirel was already out in the marbles. Spirit of Race aren't going to be too happy about that because it was an overtake after some contact. Let's Shoot have a look again. again. It was... Mm. Um... That's tough, tough to call, and thankfully we don't make the decision. But uh, 55 later on the brakes, and uh, I wonder whether there was a bit of bodywork there protruding from the Porsche, but all is well, and the two cars very straight. Can David Perel, David Perel come back fighting? Not looking like he might be able to immediately. So 55 back to second position. I wonder whether that contact will be investigated, though, by our race director. Yes, though. Further battles, this is Mikkel Jensen now. And Mikkel Jensen has caught Martin Hunt. This is not the same dark uh, coloured proton handled Porsche. This is the absolute racing car. This car running in fourth position and being caught by Mikkel Jensen in the Kessel racing car. That's had a good day today. And looking to be knocking on the door of a fourth place finish if the current Peugeot factory hypercar driver, Mikkel Jensen, this his other major role in ACO Rules Racing. He'll find a way by the Porsche. Another Ferrari on Porsche battle, this time in the opposite direction. So Martin Rump, who hails from Estonia. Not too many drivers from that part of the world, but fabulous to have another national flag represented on the ELMS uh, grid for 2022. And uh, Rump just fending off Jensen for the time being. Absolute Racing versus Kessel. Davide Regon in the Iron Lynx Ferrari in sixth place. And Takeshi Kimura looking significantly more comfortable in the pit carriage than he was earlier. It's a heat-related distress, happily now a distance, if unpleasant memory. Yeah. Gap from uh, Regon to Chavez, not that large at all. Uh, it is 0.8 of a second right now, separating the Ferrari from the Aston Martin for sixth and seventh. But Jensen making a real nuisance of himself now in the mirrors of car number 18, the absolute racing entry for Martin Rump. By the way, just behind this pair is a pair of battling LMP3s. This is the seventh place in their class, the Euro International car in the hands of Max Cobalt, the 11 car, and the 15 RM Sport car in the hands of Valentino Catalano. They'll be fighting just as hard as anybody else is at this stage of the race, flashing the headlamps from the Felber Meyer liveried Ligier. Will make absolutely no difference whatsoever to the Euro International <laughs> driver. Well, uh, it was the Felbermeyer car that made the move first, and then in reaction, diving to the apex, went the uh, car ahead of Max Cobalt. So Euro International up against RLRM Sport. And yes, uh, Takeshi Kimura really struggling immediately after his stint. We made those comments at the time. Desperate to get fluids on board, but looking like, uh, in, yeah, I'm well up for it now. And, uh, a little way from Kimura as well to say, I'm fine, I'm fine, fully recovered. But the thing, the thing to point out here is you hear a lot about gentleman drivers, etc. They have epic levels of fitness as well yeah. to just get this thing done. It's effectively what you're doing is going and sitting in an oven for a couple of hours and being expected to, to perform athletic tasks while you're there with amazing levels of acuity about all sorts of things going on around you, including, by the way, someone throwing an Aston Martin at you in the middle of your stint. Exactly. But I mean, it, it, it's physical capacity, yes, but you've got to have the mental oh, capacity yeah. too because there's an awful lot going through your mind. You, you're keeping the car on the road, you're changing gear at the right point, you're turning and braking, but you're also eyes everywhere, particularly in the GT class. Oh. 
Oh, that was a bit Gets of a, that was almost a... a headbutt. Was there some contact, yes. in fact, on the rear of Martin Rump's car? Just to say, you do remember I'm still here, I'm here. don't you, Martin? Yes. Um, but yeah, because you're in the GT class and the G and the LMP2s and 3s are wanting to get past virtually at every corner, you cannot afford to rest from a from a mental point of view as well. I mean, we're currently at 60% humidity at Barcelona, very low wind, which means that track temperature is basically at 50 degrees, and it's 31 degrees Celsius in the air. The kind of weather that Estonians and fin Finnish people are well used to, I'm sure. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, can only dream of, <laughs> which is the case. Now, to the inside, thinking about an overlap there, was the 11 car of Max Cobalt, together with Valentino Catalano in the Felbermeyer Blue RLR M Sport car. Still no way by, though. That's how rapidly these GT cars are being run. Meanwhile, the number 28 car from Edex Sport slices its way through at turn number four. Yeah, it's uh, fighting back, isn't it? The 28 car, but a long way back. Looking where Paul of Chatan has made his way back to, and he's made his way back up to 13th place. And there's not much more to be gained here in the final 17 and a half minutes. Certainly not on pace. Looking where these battles might still emerge. It's 22 seconds Louis Delatraz has on Gilfanuta, 56 seconds back now to Ye. 12 seconds, Phil Hansen not making huge inroads in that gap. Has closed it a little, but it's 10 to not full seconds that are coming back the way of United Autosports. Moments up against it for a podium position. So, uh, Michael Jensen. Yeah, ahead. Got ahead of him into the braking area for turn 10, and now running off into the gravel briefly there was Catalano. Still, still trying to find a way by Max Cobalt. So, getting the run through the kink at nine, and at the very last moment to the inside line at ten, or oh, there was a oh. lock-up and some more contact as well. These uh, the Ferrari and Porsche are going to look very second-hand at the end of this race. A forceful but eventually fair manoeuvre, I would have said, for Mikkel Jensen to get by, and now he is disappearing up the road in fourth position in the GTE category. So, by the way, he's only five seconds off Miguel Molina in a podium position at this stage. So, not necessarily done for the podium just yet. It's going to depend on just where are they in terms of tyre life on those cars. Yeah, indeed. You can lose a big chunk of time. Well, Miguel Molina knows all the tricks of the trade around here. Mikkel Jensen has probably picked most of them up, in fairness, because he's a, a very smart guy indeed, knows how to race a, uh, a GT car and, indeed, prototype wherever he goes next. Alexander Pironi to Thomas Laurent. The gap is closing. So the Frenchman finds a bit more time on the Australian that time through. So this will be for second and third. No, it won't. It's for uh, third and fourth, in fact, or third in the Pro-Ams and a bit further down in the standard entry. So Mulner Motorsport, one of the uh, standard driver combos, eighth and ninth overall. And behind them and just going to be appearing there in the back of shots, that is the number 60 Iron Lynx car, Davide Regon. He sits at the moment sixth in GTE. And he's got his mirrors full of Enrique Chavez uh, in the 95 Omen racing with TF Sport Aston Martin. So that's a live battle as well, not for a podium position, but it will be hard fought. So through turn 13 goes the number 47 car of Pironi, still under pressure from Thomas Laurent, the former Toyota LMP1 test driver. And out of turn 16 to head across the line, they will go again. We're up to 122 laps now. Remember, 15 or so minutes taken away from us because of that early safety car. We haven't seen a judgment yet from them upstairs hmm. on the uh, reports to the stewards for track limits for the 13 car. That's the big one that's outstanding, Johnny. Yeah. And that will if it goes the wrong way for inter-Europol competition, have a major effect on a class-winning position. 
and the fact that we haven't had any further messages regarding number 65 in the pit stop that didn't include a 10 second penalty because it was in a, under a full course yellow would suggest to me that you were quite right they're not bothered about that they'll just add it to the race time at yes. the end and actually it's not going to change the positions it's anyway not, because not we're stage. talking almost 50 seconds uh, sorry 40 seconds between Jot von Outer for Panis and Yifei for Cool Racing it's a minute now it's a full minute uh, not from second to third. Yes, it is. Oh, it is. Beg pardon. No, you're right. It is. So, yeah, so 10 seconds is nothing, even when they add it to the Panis racing car. And I'm sure that will be dealt with post-race. There were certainly no underhand tactics. In fact, they were, bide they were well, abiding by the regulations. If they'd done it, they'd have been penalised for it. Exactly, yeah. So you want to try and avoid any more penalties. They've had enough of them today, let's face it. Race leader in LMP3, Guilherme Oliveira. Now, this is interesting. He's behind a fairly quick LMP3 car, but to lap him. So the gap is 11 seconds uh, for the lead. Oliveira from Alvarez, but that's one of the international cars. That is the car that's battling away with... That's the 11, isn't it? It's Max Cobalt. Yeah. Prima are going to overlap a P3 and a, a GT car at once. There's the ELMS in one fell swoop, there really. You go. That's P2, right. P3, GT, all lapping one another. And uh, they made space, in fairness. If you're in the quicker car and the driver's briefing, you're told to stay as far to the right as possible. Yep. Let the slower car take the racing line. Yep. Louis Delatraz with Malte Jakobsen, and that was a 60 car, and that is Davide Rigon. So three experienced drivers. Yep. Warning flags coming for abuse of track limits. There could still be dramas here, you know, for a number of cars. Car 6 being warned, car 47 being warned. Still 12 minutes to go, keep doing it. They're, they're not going to mess about. There's going to be a penalty coming your way. Indeed, and uh, most likely, well, the later it gets, the more likely it will be that it's added post-race. But Alcamel have become pretty good at that in the last few years uh, by addressing and adding the time penalties within a couple of minutes, really, of flag fall. Meantime, into turn number 10, the third-placed GT car, Miguel Molina, with those three illuminated amber lights on the side of the JMW Motorsport Ferrari. So Porsche leading a couple of the prancing horses. Championship leaders, uh, 77 Proton competition on course, therefore, to extend their championship lead with a couple of rounds to go. The gap from first to second in the point scoring is significant. Seven points that Christian Reed. Uh, Lorenzo Ferrari and Jan Maria Bruni are set to outscore everybody else by. I'm also just checking uh, results so far within GT for car 66 because I think this should comfortably be their best result of the season. Yeah, they finished fourth at Imola, uh, but JMW Motorsport on for a season's best, welcoming for the first time into their fold Miguel Molina this season. David Perel is a further nearly half minute up the road. Bruni to Perel, closer, looking closer on the timing screen than probably it is in reality, because Bruni's probably just measuring that gap and managing it back to the spirit of race car. I guess so at this stage. He seemed to have the legs, didn't he, on the Ferrari. He's pulled away from the Ferrari. Nico Molina, not under immediate pressure from Mikel Jansi, is closing that gap. The clock is clicking down quicker than he's closing. Still pretty tight here, though, between Mikkel Jensen and Martin Rump for fourth and fifth places. So Jensen in the Kessel Racing car guy car, and it is the absolute racing machine of uh, Martin Rump that was started by Andrew Harrianto. We had Alessio Picariello, a former champion himself in GT, uh, for the middle stint, and uh, Estonian Rump to finish things off. An absolute racing with car number 18. Uh, they got a third last time out at Monza, so this is a couple of places further down from that. At least one podium this year, and chances to go better yet in the closing two races. Warning flag still coming. This time it's for Thomas Laurent. It is a 10 seconds added to the end of the race for car 13. <laughs> And that's for the, cutting the corner at the chicane uh, that Turpino uh, had already been warned about. Now, the gap first to second. That, that's, that's the penalty. 
it's not a drive-through. It's an adipen. It's yeah. 13 and a half seconds. It's okay then. So, so they can live with that. Now, did Alvarez enough. did did DKR anticipate a drive-through? And has therefore eased off, thinking it's all right. They'll get pinged uh, before the end of the race. Well, well, Alv well Alvarez. Well can now react to that and I'm sure they're getting straight on the radio at DKR saying Sebastian we need you to close that gap by four seconds find four seconds and we've won this race the gap at the moment is 13 and a half Arr, eight minutes to do it it's possible but at the same time of course Oliveira can up his pace as well so there's a fair bit still to be decided there Jensen versus Rump no longer knows to tell because Jensen's actually managed to force an LMP3 car between them. Well, that's a P3 actually lapping those two cars, yeah. of course. We are getting a machine gunning of warnings for respecting track limits at the moment. They've been stacking up, you get the, you get the impression, car in the 11, in tray. Car 21, the latest two. There is confirmation there on the top of your screen of the 10 seconds to be added after we're done to the race leader in LMP3 nursing this 13 and a half second advantage. But 10 of those seconds will completely evaporate by the end of the race. That's so it's 3.4 in reality. Indeed. And uh, and therefore Oliveira has to increase the pace, but without chucking the car off the road, which he nearly did there coming out of 12. And the 13 can't afford an error. No, exactly. I'm going to have been told by the team, you've got to obey track limits here. Well, he was much cleaner through there. I wonder whether it was actually Pino mainly. The, uh... It was Pino that was picked. Yeah. Yes. But but I would say that after uh, after um, uh, got a very good in the car, there was a further warning. OK, so he's but been off... turn nine, not turn 15. Right. OK, well, they tend to accumulate at, at specific corners, in fairness, but uh, the T15 several times off the road was down to the 17-year-old Nico Pino of Chile. That gap is going out, not coming in at the moment for Inter Europol. So is the 13, one of the most successful winning numbers in LMS LMP3 history with a new look squad. Is it going to add another win to the Polish team's winning record it would be remember a second in a row as well after their yep. success at Monza two months ago so this car number 13 had a horrible start to the year a DNF and then a, a a point scoring finish but outside the top five then they went on to win and at the moment on course to do it again as you say they've opened up another seconds advantage so even with the 10 seconds taken away they would win it by four and a half seconds and there are six minutes to go for Louis Delatraz, along with teammates Lorenzo Colombo and Ferdinand Habsburg. Habsburg did the opening stint. And uh, this will be three from four, three wins from four races if it continues on. This great initiative between Prema and Iron Links. And this worth saying, by the way, this is a difference in approach between the two race directors we've had this season. That's not something we'd have seen, or we ever have seen, really, from Eduardo Freitas. That would have been a drive-through. Yeah, indeed so. So, um, well, the, the, there are there are real room in the re regulations, I suppose, for um, how you translate and read things. So there's a little bit of flexibility. Possibly not quite to the extent of what happened at Abu Dhabi in the Grand Prix last year. Don't, don't. I'm not going to rake that all up again. <laughs> but, but, oh, and there's oh. been enough drama now for the number two LMP3 car, which has been in the wars at certain points today. That's Finn Gersitz with presumably a mistake at the final chicane. As you mentioned Abu Dhabi. That's what it was. Yeah, sorry. I, I will shut uh, up about that again. Clatter the curve. But, but what I mean is. And slid oh, wide. and hit the curb. Yeah, so it was a mistake on his part, in fact. But there's, there's clearly room for interpretation yes. when it comes to ACO rules racing and, you know, governing a race in a slightly different way than Eduardo Freitas has done uh, historically. And there's no right or wrong way to do that, um, particularly when you're deciding, well, you know, how to issue a penalty. The 37 car now heading through turn number three. Very close indeed to the number 43 car, but this wouldn't be for position because Cool Racing's Yifei Ye is running third overall. 
the 37 car this season again has had a, an up and down affair really came here fifth in the championship best result was a third at Imola and they're looking like they'll repeat that here in Barcelona it's Giacomo Piccini the younger of the two Piccini brothers involved in the Arnlinks Prima project and Giacomo very much involved with the Prima side of things now in front of the overall race leader is Phil Hansen, so he's about to be lapped in fourth overall. And that this challenge again is the dominance of this car. Absolutely, that challenge, by the way, for third from the United car has tapered away. Gap uh, growing now 18 seconds and not going to be done on pace. Again, it's about where are the tyres at this point. Yeah. It's such a huge part, particularly in weather like this. It is baking hot out there. And we always knew that uh, this track and the weather conditions were going to be brutal on both Goodyear and Michelin tyres, I think particularly in the LMP3 scraps. So teams have had to always be mindful of how much uh, how much meat on the on the rubber has been uh, has been in the equation through the course of this event. And leaving your best set of tyres back maybe for the final stints as well. So Grins just starting to emerge on the faces of those that are on for a good result, including Proton, who lead GTE into Europol competition with now a 15-second advantage over DKR Engineering in P3. And Prema Racing, that's called the Prema Power Team, that's how they used to be known in the past in the uh, in F3 and F2 ranks, but Prema Racing stamping their authority on this season very early on, winning two from two. Had a, a, an up and down ride at Monza, but this is definitely them now back on the straight and narrow. Yeah, two more laps, I think, uh, for this race. And just looking for where the final battles might just be emerging. Just an outside chance that Mikkel Jensen might put Nico Molina under pressure for the final podium slot, but I think that gap is just too, too big. 190, nearly 200 overtakes for this car alone, car number nine. Most of that will have been the lapping that it has done. Absolutely. Now all the way up to fourth place overall. So we're only going to have three cars on the lead lap by the end of yep. this. Prema, Panis and Cool Racing. Bear in mind, Panis and Cool have both had uh, penalties, though, to serve. So that's taken them away from this race leading car. Louis Delatraz so far not putting a wheel wrong. He dies up the inside of the Rinaldi Racing Ferrari, driven by Nicholas Veroni in the closing stages. That being done at turn 11. And there is the class leader for Jean-Maria Bruni for Proton Competition. Porsche leading two, in fact, three Ferraris. And then another Porsche in fifth position in the hands of the Absolute Racing crew and Martin Rump in the closing stages. Nervous moment still. Yeah. You've got to get it done, haven't you? And it's uh, however easy this might look. From the team perspective, anything could happen at any point. Uh, well, final lap now. And uh, with every turn of the wheel, they are just a little bit closer. 4.6 kilometres, less than that, away from the chequered flag. Louis Delatraz, uh, he is... Uh, the man to put this car in the hands of because Delatraz uh, last year was also champion for a debut team when he joined Robert Kubica and Yifei Ye for WRT and they went on to win the European Le Mans series at their first attempt. So Delatraz more than a uh, trustworthy pair of hands and he keeps it off the sausage curb there coming out of turn number seven through the right-hander at nine clearing off from the now lapped Phil Hansen United Autosports car. And there's the two supporting members, Ferdinand Habsburg on the left and Lorenzo Colombo on the right, raring to go to run across the pit lane and towards the pit wall. They'll be climbing up over the fencing there to cheer the race winner, Louis Delatraz, home for Prima Racing. He's got uh, the corner at turn 12 to negotiate. And he'll to delicately thread his way through the chicane as well. And thankfully for him, there is a clear road in front. So he slots it through out of turn 16 and to win for the third time this year, the fourth race of the European Le Mans series will go to Prima Racing, to Lorenzo Colombo, Ferdinand Habsburg and Louis Delatraz.
perfectly executed this time after dramas for the team at Monza. Also coming home now, Jimmy Bruni brings home the number 77 Proton Competition Porsche to win a hotly contested GTE class today. Panis Racing will come home now to clinch second place with Cool Racing for the minute behind, behind to complete the overall podium. Also home second, great run from the 55 Ferrari Spirit of Race. Excellent stuff from Duncan Cameron, by the way, he played a full part there. LMP3, we're waiting for the 13 car. Here it is. It will be enough. They have got more than that 10 seconds to play with, and the 13 car will have a second consecutive win for the Racing Bakers. So it's Guilherme Oliveira who finishes the stint. Nicolas Pino, who did pick up one or two track limits, but uh, nevertheless, with that 10 second penalty added, they will still win the motor race ahead of DKR Engineering in the number four Duquesne. Cool Racing already home. That's the one, two, three into Europol from DKR from Cool Racing. Still waiting for the Cool Racing P2 car. Crosses the line now. Prima from Panis from Cool Racing. AF Corsa are home with their Orica, the 88 car, to take LMP2 Pro Am, as is the Nielsen Racing car that takes second place in LMP2 Pro Am. And we wait for Alex Peroni to cross the line in the 47 to complete the final podium. He's home and uh, therefore will complete Pro-Am, a win, as you say, for AF Corsa once again in the Pro-Am division in P2. There's the two uh, top place cars. Shouldn't forget, by the way, the one car I haven't mentioned on a podium to this point after an excellent run from them today. JMW Motorsport back on the podium in their 66 Ferrari. And Nico Pino receiving congratulations from his team, a mixture of uh, engineers, team members from Germany and some from Poland as well. But there's the LMP3 winners, Charles Cruz, who kicked things off in style and uh, actually had a good fight with Josh Cagill in the early stages. Josh got in front, CR Cruz paid him back. Then, unfortunately, Josh uh, had a spin when he was in second position and that really helped the 13 car onto a good pedestal. Ooh, 14 car reversing there in the pit lane as uh, more cars were pouring their way in, but I assume they missed one another. He's missed the entrance to Park Fermi. Yeah, that was uh, the 14 car driven by Matthias Kaprich, the sister into Europol competition machine. Here's the race winner, Prema Racing then. Tucked in behind is the 65 for Hjot van Aertert. Good run for them again. Yeah, indeed. It was, um, I mean, Yes, they were 20-odd seconds behind, and they'd already had a, uh, a five-second penalty, hadn't they? So that... Uh, and really, those penalties that kept being issued, it meant that the race spiralled out of their Remember control the, to an extent. There will be another 10 to add. There will be another 10 to add, yeah. So, but but uh, they were there and thereabouts. It would have definitely. just taken a little bit of luck on their part. But so, uh, no complaints. This was a dominant performance, a perfect performance again from Prima Racing. And that's what you've got to be in LMP2 in the European Le Mans series. The depth of ability here, it's, it, well, it's very deep. Yeah. Let's put it that way. It is, there, there are so many talented crews, talented drivers, talented teams here, and you're playing with the same toolkit. So Louis Delatraz winning again after being victorious at Le Castellet and Imola earlier in the year. Of course, uh, Ferdi Habsburg, his teammate Lorenzo Colombo, eager to have a quick conversation about how that final stint was. They'll also have uh, a lot of chance to chat during the press conference and the podium in a moment or two. So many cars pouring their way now down pit road. The uh, the pit lane hooter is going to be worn out by the end of this. But Jean-Marie Bruni in that queue is the winner. And thankfully, all three, it looks like, GT cars have got around to part Fermi with enough fuel in the belly. Remember what happened at Monza when uh, the, the, the on-the-road winner had to be pushed those final few metres by a sister car, and it was eventually disqualified. The and Lynx machine, but Proton Competition, Spirit of Race and JMW Motorsport have all got safely back to the parking area. Good stuff. Worthy winners uh, overall there. Uh, 
a return to form for the 88 AF Corsa car in LMP2 Am. We might finally get a little bit of relief from that uh, pit lane hooter now. Uh, the 13 car, well, edgy end to their race. And I think they'll be grateful that it was that, uh, that decision rather than a drive-through penalty. And then the 77 car bringing home the GTE win in a race that was led by, what was that, four, five different cars? Uh, yes. Yeah, it was intense, wasn't it, throughout, and uh, fabulous to witness. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the 10 second penalty for the winning LMP3 car has been added. What we haven't yet seen is a change for Panis Racing, because that'll be a bit later on. Yes. The officials haven't yet said which way they will go with that, but definitely the 65 owe us a 10, or owe the officials a, an extra 10 seconds at one of their pit stops that they then couldn't serve. So we expect that to be dropped back to 32 seconds deficit rather than 22 as it sits. But it's high time we hear from our winning trio for the third time this season now with Hayley Edmonds. Ferdinand, it was almost, I mean, a flawless drive from you three today. You, of course, uh, took over from Canal after uh, the restart of the safety car. And wow, what a race. Your third victory this year in the LMA. Yeah, I mean, I can't say too much because we all did it together. It was so cool. Uh, one of those weekends that didn't start off super easy was not so difficult. Uh, the sound is not making so easy either, but we had a great time. I'm super stoked. Also, after the last time in Monza, we didn't quite get that win. We were struggling. We came back to win the race and now establish our position in the championship. And yeah, we're going to have a couple of beers, have a good night and uh, be, celebrate that one. That felt good. Yeah, beer, a beer well merited. Thank you very much, guys. Cheers. Thanks. So, yes, and it, it's an extension in the championship. And remember that they were 13 points ahead of Edex Sport, who've had a bit of a nightmare, frankly, in 13th position. Um, what do you get for 13th? Half a point, if that. So it's a, you know, a big gap now has been built on those guys. Third position in the championship, Jot van Aute, Julian Canal and Nicolas Jamin. So they're keeping them a bit more honest for Panis Racing, who finish second. Just before midday, we got our fourth race of the season underway in the European Le Mans series. The two cars right front and centre were in the wrong position at the start. They were right in the centre of the track rather than over on the grid hatching. So eventually they would be pinged for effectively being out of position. But that didn't stop Sally Jolic from trying to get up the inside of Julian Canal and did gain one place. Look at Sarah Bovi's pink Ferrari here. Sideswiped by Freddie Hunt, who was looking for a way by Jim Maguire and Jean Ludovic. Fubert also spinning in the distance right in front of the American. He had nowhere to go in the number three United Autosports car. Jacobo Petrobelli and Michael Fassbender came to blows. The Ferrari judged to be at fault at turn 13, which pitched the Hollywood superstar around on the spot. Josh Cagill also had a spin from second place at the time in LMP3. Fuel going into what was a damaged 93 Porsche there at Proton. And this is spin for Paul Lafargue. He made a mistake in the braking area for two Turn one that slapped him into the barrier and it did a lot of damage to the nose of the Edex Sport 28. That was our first full course yellow as a result. We had about 15 minutes of safety car at the start of the race. Through the gravel would go the number two United LMP3 car again. So it was really in strife in the early, well, the first two hours, to be honest. And that's uh, meant that the number two car eventually finished a long way back in ninth position in P3. Plenty of carnage as usual at the chicane as Julian Canal tried to home in on the race leader. Side to side battling in GT with the spirit of race for I number 55 on the inside of the Rinaldi racing offering and a good overtake there from Matt Griffin. The 37 car needed its front uh, bodywork changed after some damage for Nicolas Lapierre. That gave track position to the 65 that pitted on the same lap from Panis Racing. Lights flashing for one of the cool racing LMP3 cars behind. But uh, this was the gap, first to second, halfway through the race as Nico Shama struggled to hang on to the eventual winning car. Race was paused again to retrieve some debris from the centre of the track and a chance to do a full sweep, in fact. Then Prema Racing making a fairly late pit stop. The number 17 car eventually finishing on the podium in the command of Malta Jakobsen in the closing stages, and Jakobsen leaving absolutely nothing on the table as he thrashed that cool racing car to a podium finish. 
Number four, Duquesne, finishing second in the hands of Sebastian Alvarez in the closing stages. They will be very, very happy with that. The little team from Luxembourg, who've had so much success over the years in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. But it's another win, two in a row now, for inter Europol competition. Guilherme Oliveira bringing the car to the finish. In GT, really good scrapping between Porsche and Ferrari. They've been at it for decades, and David Perel was unable to hold back Jan Maria Bruni in the braking area for turn 10, which gave road position to Proton competition. They were already championship leaders and therefore will extend the gap. Spirit of race coming home eventually to finish in second position. But for the third time this year, it's another victory for Prima Racing for Ferdinand Habsburg, who started the car, Lorenzo Colombo in the middle, and Louis Delatraz bringing it to the flag in the closing stages. Second place to Panis Racing, the 65 crew of Julian Canal, Nico Jama and Hjop van Aertert. And Cool Racing make the podium with the 37 Orica of Nicola Lapierre, Nicholas Cruton and Yi Fei Ye. Here was the moment as Lorenzo Colombo and Ferdi Habsburg climb the fencing to cheer Louis Delatraz across the line. Winning GT car is Jean-Maria Bruni in 77 with Christian Reed and Lorenzo Ferrari. And the win in LMP3 for the second time, as mentioned, going to Nico Pino, Charles Cruz and Guilherme Oliveira. Another classic served up as the fourth race of the year for the European Le Mans series. As we get the crews coming towards the podium, take justified applause for a race well run, but it's racing. A couple of errors in there, it's blunted their challenge. Don't think they'd have taken that though, Johnny, from Prima. It was just too good, it was just too faultless as a strutting Ferdy Habsburg uh, comes out onto the podium. There he Colombo. is, leaping into the air. High fives all around for the team from Cool Racing. So third position, it's Nico Lapierre, Nicholas Cruton, Yife, yay. Second place for Panis Racing, but it will be the national anthem of the winning team for Prima. Congratulations to Lorenzo Colombo, the silver-rated driver, and the two golds of Louis Delatraz and Ferdinand Habsburg, finishing ahead of Jop van Aerter, Julian Canal, and Nico Jama, the pole sitter from uh, this morning. He, of course, accomplished that late yesterday evening in the third of the three qualifying sessions. Plucked it out from nowhere, it would seem, but that car has proved to be quick all day. Just a shame that, um, you know, whether through strategy or other things, they, they got that five-second penalty which then, for whatever reason, we haven't quite got to the bottom of that, wasn't served correctly, so that, that's a 10-second penalty to be added to the end of the race. I think still, without the penalties, in fact, Prima had the edge, and that, for me, is a fair result for the fourth race of the year. Absolutely right, and uh, we wait and see when and where, and eventually what, is announced as their future in mm. this sport. The, there are more than heavy rumours about what that might be, and if that's comes to, the path, to, to pass, that will be deserved, because they've been stunning, stellar, since they started on this path, as others have been before them. So the P2 class, Johnny, has been what a great teaching ground, learning ground it's been for top-class international sports car racing. And that's one of the ideas behind Prema and Iron Lynx joining forces, is to try and get young single-seater drivers in as the silvers in the driving combination. Here's confirmation of the result after 132 laps. Then Prema take their third win of the year by 22.9 seconds at the moment. Expect that to extend to 32.9, though, remember. Cool Racing finish third ahead of United Order Sports, and AF Corsa win the Pro-Am category. They win from Nielsen Racing and Algarve Pro Racing. We'll do the podium for Pro-Am in a moment or two. LMP3 is won by Inter-Europol competition. 
delegation of Poland from DKR Engineering, who hail from Luxembourg, and the Swiss squad Cool Racing. So a double podium, in fact, for Cool. And GTE won again by Proton Competition. That driving combination of Christian Reed, Lorenzo Ferrari, and Jean Maria Bruni win from Spirit of Race and JMW Motorsport with the best result of the season for the British squad. So Porsche, Ferrari, Ferrari from a manufacturer perspective. And in LMP3, Ligier win from Duquesne and Ligier. So the podium being redressed now for the next gang of drivers to be welcomed. But this provides us a brief, a brief interval to head into the world of GT to get some reaction from the winning crew there. 77. After Monzo, you can finally get on top of that well-deserved top step and celebrate a second victory of the year in ELMS. Just take us through how it went for you today, Christian. I mean, you started off a fantastic first stint for you. I don't know if it was fantastic, but it was, I was really hard in the car and I always had the, the other cars in my mirror, so I was pushing as much as I can, but the car was super, super fast and super good. Um, so I was able to stay out of the trouble, turn one. Maybe we really have to think about the starting procedure because it's always a big mess here. But yeah, so we did manage well the first lap and then yeah, uh, I had a clean stint, give the car to uh, Lorenzo and then Lorenzo to Jimmy and they did both great and so happy to win the race. So as I said one last time, you'll be able to celebrate a well-deserved victory. It was unfortunate you didn't get to the top of the top step in Monza, so celebrate this. Yeah, for sure we celebrated, you know, but it's more important to celebrate the end of the season. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. Thank you very much, John. Sure. Yes, because, of course, after Monza, the result was changed. The uh, winners on the road disqualified, and it meant that Proton weren't able to experience the race win in the moment. But they did leave Italy eventually with 26 points. They will leave with a, another big points haul from here as well, 25 points, because, of course, they didn't get pole yesterday. That was, in fact, the 69 Aston Martin. But third position going the way, and the best result of the season, as I say, for JMW Motorsport, for Jacobo. Petrobelli who drove well apart from that mistake uh, and the error with Michael Fassbender otherwise a clean race Sean Hudspeth and Miguel Molina second place going to spirit of race but it's a win again for Proton competition let's hear their national anthem So it's Christian Reed, Lorenzo Ferrari, and uh, Jan Maria Bruni, who are the winning trio from 77 Proton competition. And to mention everyone's name in the 55 Ferrari, Duncan Cameron, who started, Matt Griffin, who did the middle stint, and David Perel at the end. And they stand to the right, uh, or to the left as we look at them, of our winners. And pick up, by the way, uh, with this result, the two gentleman drivers for the top two cars, because for me, Duncan Cameron, was the telling ingredient today for yep. the Spirit of Race team. And that opening stint from Christian Reed was, I think, one of the best I've seen from him in recent years. It's been quite the weekend for his team with their first entry ever into a Porsche Carrera Cup competition and uh, confirmation that uh, Proton Competition will be going to the Porsche Carrera Cup Deutschland next year with two cars. Mm. But Very interesting. And great, by the way, that uh, that uh, very first entry came with such an historic name for the team with the the, uh, the latest of the Felbermeyer clan here's uh, the look at the points then it is uh, a lot much larger gap than Proton arrived with so 69 plays 41 points for spirit of race now Christian Reed, Jamari Bruni, Lorenzo Ferrari, the three drivers ever present from David Perel, Duncan Cameron and Matt Griffin. And then it's Frederick Schandorf, Mike, uh, Mikkel Jensen and Takeshi Kimura. Very, very tight between second and third placed teams, therefore. Next come Nicola Veroni and Pierre Arret locked together on 38 points from the fifth placed drivers, Giacomo Petrobelli and Sean Hudspeth on 36. Yeah, um, 
We'll chat more about the, the connection between Felbermeyer and Proton, which I didn't know in truth, but uh, there's a really interesting backstory. Well, more reaction, though, from winning drivers. First, with Hayley. Right off the back of Monza, your second victory this far in ELMS. I mean, it was a tough race for everyone, but you seem to have the strategy. Everything was in place for you guys and a well-deserved victory. Yeah, I mean, we had the race really, really on, on our ends after the first hit of Charles, where he did a mega job. And uh, Nico just took the car and brought it home, and I just had to do the same. So we're uh, really happy. And uh, that's two in a row, so uh, we are back in the fight, and uh, hopefully we can grab the championship in Portimão. Thank you very much. Very happy indeed with that, the winners in LMP3. But yeah, the story behind Felbermeyer and Proton and how they started to get to know one another and race. Felbermeyer be build cranes, basically, yes. and they needed somebody to transport them. And Proton Competition can provide the road transport for these huge things. And um, I think it's Christian, Christian Reed's father, and Horst Felbermeyer Senior. Correct. In the well, uh, I mean, sadly we lost Horst Felbermeyer Senior indeed, yeah. recently. Well, welcome to the, the uh, to the podium, by the way, the number 17 crew racing squad. Here they come. Mo Paul Smith, position yesterday. Mikey Benham and Mercurial Milter Jakobsen. Second position going the way of DKR Engineering. Sebastian Alvarez, Alexander Bukansov and Tom Von Rumpai. And it will be the top step to Euro International, into Euro, uh, rather, uh, into Europol competition. Sorry, beg your pardon, completely wrong team there. Into Europol competition, stepping forward and to take the race victory for a second time in a row. Nico Pino, Charles Cruz and Guilherme Oliveira with a team representative from Inter Europol competition as well. Let's hear the national anthem of Poland. So it's the best result of the season for DKR Engineering. In fact, a first podium for 2022. And as far as the cool racing guys are concerned, they opened the season with a victory and finished third at Imola. But uh, after that sticky round at Monza, back on course again, potentially. But of course, into Europol competition, just easing up the points there. Another 25. It's going to be fascinating to view the points that we'll get to see in a moment, Graham. And because it's been such a topsy-turvy season, it's all beginning to come together now. And we've got two fascinating races to come. Yeah. Yeah, you've got two, uh, two or three squads here that have shown if they can get it together and have a fault-free race, which Cool Racing, by the way, did not have today, that this result could be so very, very different. We're not going to get into, um, had they not had the penalty, just how much closer this could have been. Champagne will spray. And uh, this is a welcome sight, I'm sure, for many. Very, very warm indeed this weekend in Barcelona. And the chance to cool down. I'm sure everybody on that podium is very much looking forward to getting the race suits off as well. Get out of that fireproof layers. But Bendham going crazy as well on the left of the podium for all of these Michelin shod cars. And some conversations being had post race with the crew that finished in second position, DKR Engineering. So here's the official, uh, the points rather, that remain provisional for the time being. The gap is only five points between Cool Racing and Inter Europol competition, slightly larger than back to RLRM Sport with their number five car. That's the Michael Jensen, Alex Capaldi, and Nick Adcock machine. And uh, tucked in behind there, well, here are the drivers, Jakobsen, Smith, Benham, to Cruz, Oliveira and Pino, just five, as mentioned. Then Capaldi, Jensen and Adcock. And then the 360 racing drivers, Mark Richards in fourth position, together with teammates on 40 points. But, but just like the points in the GTE standings, one no score from a yeah. dominant team, all over. 
Yeah, that's, uh, I suppose, the nature of the beast when you're dealing with a championship that only has six races. Often you can afford one duff result, but any more than that, no chance. More reaction from more winners elsewhere in the category. Well, Alessio, what a drive from you guys. Uh, you've got finished uh, first victory and pro-am this season. Yeah, finally we finished in the first uh, step of the podium after uh, three races of trying and uh, the car was uh, amazing, so we just had to push. Uh, Francois and uh, Niklas made an amazing job, job and I had just to carry the car to the finish line. You make it seem so easy, but there were some tough battles out there for you guys. Yeah, because uh, we started last year in November with uh, this new car and uh, the guys made an amazing job in uh, three months, basically. And now the car is super fast, we just have to drive and try to win. Oh, great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Alessio Rivera, thumbs up from uh, Francois Perodo as well. Nicholas Nielsen just standing off uh, shot there to the right, but they've done the business again. They and have. I have to say, the 88 car, particularly in the hands of Rivera, that overtake around the outside oh, yeah. was that it Richard was, Bradley. That was special. I mean, that was special. Bradley, I think, realised between them. I think he, Richard realised he probably pushed it as far as the edge as he could in a couple of laps and realised, okay, now it's time to go but that was pretty special this is the one two three or the three two one rather the apr crew in third position nielsen racing in second but it is going to be a of course uh, taking the lmp2 am win this afternoon so it's john Fowle, james allen alexander peroni on the third step of the podium nielsen racing are second with their 24 car rodrigo sales matt bell and ben hanley but it's another victory for AF Corsa. There are the three drivers we've just heard from Alessio Rivera. Let's hear the national anthem. Well done again to Francois Perodo, Nicholas Nielsen and Alessia Rivera who brought the car to the flag. The pro-am element of the LMP2 competition. Rather late on parade there, <laughs> the uh, chief engineer for car 88, I guess, and uh, punching the air to so many AF Corsa representatives beneath the podium. Four very smart trophies to take back to Italy with them. And we're going to see this very same crew in action a couple of weekends time when the FI World Endurance Championship gets back into action in Japan. And uh, again, a force to be reckoned with there as we wait to find official confirmation of what the future plans are for LMP2 in the emerging new era of sports car racing. I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever it's going to continue here in the European Le Mans series to be a very, very popular choice. So the champagne sprays again here in Barcelona. This is what the points look like in the Pro-Am Team's trophy. Racing Team Turkey lead by 10. 80 plays 70 back to Nielsen, who finished second today. 65, only five back for AF Corsa. It's probably one of those three that will take the title at this stage. Charlie Eastwood, Jack Aitken, who's driven really well today, and Sally Jolic, likewise, uh, are still leading with two rounds to spare from Ben Hanley, Matt Bell, Roger Gonzalez, and then it's Rivera, Perodo, and Nicholas Nielsen with Matthias Besch from TDS Racing along with his teammates uh, in fourth position. Uh, just the way that the points have worked out here closes again this all up. And despite the fact we feel like we're quite late in the year, Johnny, 54 points to be gained in the other three classes, 52, uh, 50, sorry, apologies, 52 points in the other classes, 50 points in the LMP2 Pro-Am classes means that it's not done yet. That's the LMP2 team's trophy standard. There's a long way to go before anybody can be crowned here as a 2022 champion. Yes, it's a 21-point lead for the teams and the drivers. Ferdinand Habsburg, Lorenzo Colombo, Louis Della Traz. But as you said, there are still 51 points uh, on... Well, 52 points are still on the table. So two uh, for your pole position still to go and a race win at Spa. And Portimao carries 25. And lest anybody be getting kind of resting on their laurels, look what happened to the Iron Dames at turn two. Yeah, that's how quickly your season can chop and change. 
sometimes for the worse, certainly. This is the paddock at the end of the day at Barcelona then, as we draw to a close our fourth race of the season. My thanks to Graham Goodwin of DailySportsCard.com and of course to Hayley Edmonds, who has been up and down the pit lane all morning and afternoon in red hot heat, also in fireproof overall. So she'll be taking, a, I'm sure, a deserved glass of water at the end of the day too. You can join us in four weeks' time for the fifth round of the season at Spa Francorchamps. We've got Spa and Portimao still to go and championships to be decided. Join us then at the end of next month. Bye for now.